Spring Fever by Tara Grace Erickson. Audio copyright 2022 Silver Fountain Press. Chapter 1. Don't just break all the crayons, Zachary. You are supposed to color with them. Mandy sighed to herself and quickly finished the diaper she was currently changing, and hurried across the room to usher a dancing toddler into the restroom, while giving an I'm watching you, look to four-year-old Zachary. It was times like these she wondered why she chose to run an in-home daycare by herself. Most of the time, she managed just fine. She had a system, the kids got to watch one show while she managed to prep lunch for them. The busy schedule of preschool, crafts, lunch, naps, snacks, songs, and free time kept the kids engaged and under control. Overall, the kids were amazingly well-behaved. But when one child needed something urgently, and someone else inevitably also needed something, she only had two hands. Story of her life. Even so, while Mandy waited for her little charge to be finished so she could help him wash his hands, she thought about how she really did love this job. She loved the little personality her toddlers showed. She watched it emerge more and more each day. They never ceased to amaze her, make her laugh, and give her an optimism about the future. Working with children was why she studied to be a teacher. But when she graduated and there were no jobs within the schools to be found, she decided to open her own small business and start a daycare in the small town of Minden, Indiana. She grew up in Minden with her parents and her brother. She loved it here. The town was quaint and inviting. Most people would simply drive past it without stopping, but there was something special about this quaint town. Mandy loved how close-knit the community was. A dozen people would offer a hand when needed. That's just how it was. It meant Mandy was also continuously stepping up to help someone in need. Mandy loved these toddlers with everything she had. She poured herself into them day after day, year after year. She created lesson plans about the alphabet. Mandy showed them different places and animals and the weather, teaching their little minds concepts and skills they would need as they grew older. But it was exhausting sometimes. She was one of the few daycare options in Minden and she carried the same sense of community of the small town into the daycare itself. She often held special events for the families of her children, including a Christmas party, Easter egg hunt, and family fun day. As she finished up with the three-year-old in the bathroom, she heard the four-month-old whose diaper she had been changing start to fuss. Luckily, the other kids were busy coloring pictures of monkeys to go along with their letter of the day, M. She picked up Miles, the baby, and put him back in the baby carrier she was wearing. Miles seemed especially needy this week and she resorted to wearing him throughout the day to keep him happy. Mandy helped the kids clean up their workspace and hung their pictures on the clothesline where they would be waiting for their parents to take home at the end of the day. She hopefully glanced out the window, dismayed when she saw it starting to snow. The winter had worn out its welcome. The kids were more than ready to go outside and play, and she would love to let them burn off the energy. It was mid-January, and everyone was itching for a warm day to come and interrupt the monotony of cold, dreary winter days. She made a mental reminder to check the weather forecast for the rest of the week. She had a mulch playground in her backyard, so she didn't even need to wait for it to dry out. She just needed it to be warm enough that the kids could go outside and burn off some energy. She liked for them to go out after lunch before nap. And if that didn't work, sometimes she had them playing outside at the end of the day while parents dribbled in to pick up their little ones. Getting her own daycare up and running was hard work. Getting it licensed with the state was a lot of paperwork, inspections, and hardest of all, finding a suitable property in the small town of Minden. While she had searched for a home with a walkout basement, she wasn't able to find one. She ended up converting the attached garage into the main room for the daycare. But it often exploded out into the rest of her house despite her best efforts. It was not unusual for her to have a baby swing and a pile of Legos or discarded baby doll in her personal living room, if a child woke up early from nap and needed to be away from the other kids while they rested. In those moments of quiet, 
She took the stubborn child into her personal living room where she spent nap time trying to recharge for the remainder of the day, while watching and listening to the main daycare room on the security camera. It was just a few steps away, around the corner from her living room, but the camera gave her some extra peace of mind. Mandy glanced at her phone and saw a text message from her mother. Her mom was asking questions about what Mandy would wear on her date tonight. Mandy finally surrendered to her family and friends' insistence she give online dating a try. She was nearly 31 and had yet to find a serious boyfriend let alone someone she could see marrying. It was disheartening, to say the least. But there wasn't a lot of opportunity to meet someone when you spent your days with toddlers and your evenings completing lesson plans. Free time was spent at church, with her women's Bible study group, or helping her friends with whatever they needed to do. She kept a detailed mental calendar and tried to pack as many things into each day as she could. It kept her from sitting at home alone, which was her least favorite reality. As it were, those mental entries into her calendar were never dates. It wasn't that she didn't want to date, but she was shy. Almost painfully so. Finding a chance to meet someone felt impossible. She had resisted this whole online dating fad for years, but tonight she was giving it another try. She'd already been on several failed dates and dozens of potential matches who never made it past exchanging messages. She rolled her eyes at her mother's excitement and turned her attention back to the kids. It was time for her to fix lunch, so she turned on Sesame Street and made her way to the kitchenette on the other side of the daycare to prepare lunch. Then would be nap time followed by snack and free time before pickup. Mandy's date tonight was someone she had been chatting with for a few days. She supposed he seemed like a nice guy from their conversations so far. Judging someone over the phone was tricky. He was a little younger than her, not much, though. When asked, she told him the truth, never married, no kids. She knew she would have to tell him about Rebecca later, but it wasn't exactly first date material. He had apparently been married once when he was in his early twenties, but was divorced with no kids as well. They hadn't discussed whether a family was in their long-term goals, but Mandy was trying to be optimistic. He was handsome in his profile picture, though. There was a point in his favor. Dot. She was a little frazzled because one of her parents was late to pick up their child, not for the first time, and instead of an hour to get ready for her date, she was left with twenty minutes. She took a quick shower and threw some products in her blonde, curly hair to help tame it. She was applying a swipe of mascara to make her boring gray eyes pop a bit when she heard the doorbell. She hurried downstairs, stepping over the stray plastic dinosaurs littering her front hallway and opened the door to a very handsome man. He smiled and they shook hands. She invited him in for a minute while she grabbed her shoes and coat. Dot. I'm so sorry to make you wait. Been a crazy day. It's no problem at all, I understand. Jason, her date, looked around the space and she saw his eyes land on the toys strewn about the space. He shifted his weight uncomfortably, as though the clutter made him anxious. Dot. It's usually much neater than this, I swear. Mandy laughed. Dot. Jason's friendly demeanor was gone, though. I thought you said you didn't have kids. Maybe I didn't make myself clear, I don't have any children. And I don't want any. His warm smile was replaced with firm resolve and a hint of frustration. Dot. Mandy recoiled. She considered how to respond to this. She briefly considered letting him assume the toys belonged to her own children, but that seemed dishonest. She hated confrontation and steeled herself to be straight with him. I don't have children, Jason. I can understand why you would be confused. I run an in-home daycare here. A couple kids left these out today. She held her coat and turned towards him. Jason's narrowed eyes widened, and he relaxed at her explanation of the toys. He exhaled and started to speak but she continued, but, I do need to be honest. I want to have children. And I want to do it soon. She studied his face and kept going despite the expression of disappointment she saw there. 
If that doesn't work for you, then maybe this date isn't such a good idea. Jason nodded. Yeah, I guess it's something we should have talked about. You seem really nice, Mandy, but it doesn't seem like it's a good fit. I guess we could try to be friends? He added the last part hesitantly, as though he didn't know what else to say. Mandy gave a small smile at the effort. She decided to let him off the hook. That's okay, Jason. I think we both probably have enough friends. Jason left and Mandy removed her black boots with the two-inch heel. She removed her earrings as she wandered into the kitchen and opened the refrigerator door, looking for something to eat that wasn't entirely depressing. It seemed like every man she met was divorced, wasn't interested in marriage at all, or wasn't interested in kids. Was she destined to be an old maid forever? Was she okay with that? Her mentor, Ruth, was a widow for 30 years and she came to grips with her singleness a long time ago. Mandy feared she would never get there. She hated being single. She hated that her friends were all finding love and she was stuck caring for their children, even as much as she loved every single child. Even Chrissy got engaged a few weeks ago on New Year's Eve. Ruth counseled Mandy to pursue God with everything she had and to know it was normal to feel lonely sometimes. That was good, because lonely seemed to dominate Mandy's feelings. Sometimes she could distract herself by keeping busy. Ruth kept saying that despite feeling lonely, Mandy was not alone. Some nights the reminder was harder to accept than others. Especially when a sudden opening in her calendar meant a night home alone. Mandy closed the refrigerator door and opened the freezer instead, retrieving a pint of the good stuff, from where it was hidden in the back of the freezer. Mocha chocolate chip. She grabbed the spoon and ate the ice cream straight from the container. She sighed into a bite and imagined a different ending to her date with the handsome man who graced her step tonight. In her fairy tale version, he swept her off her feet and their whirlwind romance ended in the perfect wedding, followed shortly by three perfect children. With that happily ever after in mind, Mandy carried her ice cream into the living room and pulled one of her favorite modern day fairy tale books off the shelf. If Amanda Elliot couldn't find Prince Charming, maybe she could be somebody else for a while. Chapter 2 Dr. Garrett Pike ran his fingers through his hair and reviewed the notes on the previous patient's chart. He added his observations and placed the order for prescription antibiotics into the computer system. The small town rural health clinic was nothing if not predictable. The majority of his time was spent on the management side but he saw several patients each day. He checked fevers in young children, performed well-child visits, and answered questions from nervous patients about the flu or cold. Sometimes about frequent headaches, usually from stress and lack of sleep. Most often, his diagnosis was one of three things. One, the patient had a cold. Two, the patient had the flu. Three, the patient was overweight and had high blood pressure from a poor diet compounded by the smoking habit of 30 years. It was discouraging. He didn't have very many health-conscious patients. Most ignored his recommendations for a healthier diet and increased exercise. He continued to see an increasingly overweight generation dealing with the ailments of getting older. He hadn't become a doctor to do this. But, five more years in this rural clinic and his student loans would be forgiven. Then he could take a job wherever he wanted. He would work at a cancer research institute or in internal medicine, helping to diagnose unexplained ailments. Now, he only referred patients to a specialist. It wasn't that he didn't like his job. It was rewarding to make a young child feel better or help an older woman improve her strength and flexibility with simple exercises. When he saw patients, it was chart after chart. There never seemed to be time to complete the paperwork required as director. But he didn't want to stop seeing patients altogether. He wanted to keep his skills sharp, just in case that patient did come in. The one with a mystery illness or unexplainable symptoms. He almost wished it some days. Then he felt guilty because it meant wishing someone was really sick. 
He hated receiving the calls from patients who were nervous about paying their bills despite their insurance. Garrett went to medical school to help people. He loved science, especially biology, and thought the human body was nothing short of miraculous. Its ability to heal itself, to perform and endure incredible limits, was amazing. He learned new things every day in school that surprised him. Studying the body brought him such wonder and awe at the Creator. By helping people heal and appreciate their body, the temple God had given them, he was honoring his Creator. Sometimes, he got so tired of seeing people disrespecting their body. Seeing them fill it with sugar and drugs and alcohol to the point of destruction was discouraging. Garrett had always been athletic. He loved to run and frequently took part in charity races and marathons. Despite the long hours of med school and residency, he stayed in great shape. He spent his infrequent days off at the gym or riding his bike. After he completed his residency and a several year fellowship in Texas, Garrett returned to Indiana although a fair distance away from his hometown near Fort Wayne. He was now in Greencastle. It was rural and most of his patients came from the even smaller communities surrounding it. He was running the small clinic, and most of the responsibility for patients landed on other doctors. The practice consisted of two other doctors and a nurse practitioner. He was new and ultimately the one in charge. As was often the case, Garrett was the last one to leave after the office closed. The others left as soon as the last patient was finished to return to their families for the night. One good thing about his current gig was the hours were predictable, unlike his rotations through the hospital in Texas. He did not miss the 24-hour shifts or sleeping in the call room when he had opportunity. For the clinic, he was on call one night per week to handle any calls the answering service deemed worth covering but not immediately qualifying as an emergency. While he sat at his desk, alone in a sterile office, he realized his birthday was next week. He would be 34. There was no girlfriend or family, not even a dog to celebrate with. He hadn't been in Greencastle long and didn't have a circle of friends established. Attending church only a handful of times since moving probably didn't help. Instead, he spent his Sunday mornings on the treadmill since the weather didn't allow him to run outside. Friends, he wanted. A wife and kids. Not so much. He couldn't imagine having a wife and kids at home and working at a large hospital like where he did his residency, which was his eventual plan. He would never see them. His younger brother, Michael, settled down early and had a four-year-old daughter, Adelaide. Garrett's niece was a firecracker. Every time he saw her, he was amazed at how much she was growing and how her little personality was coming out. He loved spending time with his brother and his family but couldn't picture himself in that role. I will just be fun Uncle Garrett, he thought. I can spoil little Addie to my heart's content, then hand her back to her parents. It was the perfect balance of work and family. Just enough family and plenty of work. Chapter 3 Mandy spent the next week fighting a cold and praying it would relent soon. Preventing germs from spreading in the small space filled with rambunctious toddlers was like trying to hold back a tidal wave. They left drool and snot all over everything and everyone. Mandy finally broke down and scheduled a doctor's appointment. Running on empty for days, she was absolutely exhausted. Her mom agreed to cover the daycare, something Mandy hated asking her to do, and headed to Greencastle for the latest appointment available. After a short stint in the waiting room, she followed the young nurse to the exam room. The nurse took her blood pressure, height, and weight. She seemed to have trouble getting her pulse and admitted to Mandy that she was new. The nurse left Mandy in the exam room to wait for the doctor. Mandy sat patiently for a while and decided to lay down on the exam table. She figured she could at least rest a little bit while waiting for the doctor. After only a moment, she opened her eyes and realized it was dark outside the small window of the exam room. She checked her phone and saw it was nearly 8 o'clock. Cautiously opening the door and peeking her head into the hallway, Mandy called quietly, Hello? She didn't hear anything, and the hallways were only dimly lit. 
Had they seriously forgotten her? She wasn't complaining about the nap. She grabbed her coat and stepped into the hallway. Hello? Is there anyone here? Suddenly, she heard a door close. There was someone here. A tall, lean man turned a corner and was in the hallway with her, about forty feet away. He looked startled to see her. He was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, she wasn't sure if he was a janitor or a thief. Excuse me. What are you doing here? You can't be here right now. We're closed. Mandy shrunk back at the confrontation in his voice. I, uh, had an appointment? Her voice was scratchy from the nap and her sore throat. Dot. At eight o'clock at night? The man spoke with obvious disbelief and a hint of sarcasm. Mandy considered her own potential sarcastic response but bit her tongue. Dot. She cleared her throat, attempting to gain a little volume. Actually, it was at 4.45. I think I was forgotten. Mandy tried to be brave as the man continued to make his way down the hallway toward her. She reminded herself this was not her fault. She explained further, I must have fallen asleep. The man was a few steps away. And he looked at her with skepticism in his eyes. Big, gorgeous, dark brown eyes Mandy couldn't help but notice. You are telling me you've been here for three hours and no one knew you were in that room. Well, the nurse admitted me and told me to wait for the doctor. I must have fallen asleep on the table. But no one ever checked on me. The man shook his head in disbelief. I'm going to need your name and which doctor you were supposedly seeing. If this story doesn't check out, you are in major trouble for trespassing. He spoke condescendingly, and Mandy tried not to let her temper flare. She was still sick and though the nap went a long way to making her feel human, her throat was still incredibly sore. Her head was pounding like the bass drum at the basement bar concerts she'd gone to in college. She spoke with slightly gritted teeth. I understand. My name is Amanda Elliott. My appointment was set for 4.45 with Dr. Pike. He raised an eyebrow in response. He led her to an area where a couple of computers and office chairs were set up. He logged into the computer and pulled up a calendar. I don't understand. You're on the calendar, but, I promise, I never knew you were here. So, I guess I should come back tomorrow? Mandy dreaded calling her mom again. Her mom was always willing to help, but Mandy hated to impose. With a sigh Mandy continued, Look, can you just tell Dr. Pike I really need to be seen as soon as possible? Maybe I can leave a note or something. The man straightened up. My, I'm so sorry I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dr. Pike. He extended his hand. Dot. You're kidding. What? No. I'm not. I'm Dr. Pike. You are wearing a shirt that says, Runners will survive the zombie apocalypse. She raised an eyebrow at him, and he flushed. Don't you think it's true? Zombies are pretty slow, you know. She laughed and he went on. I really am sorry. But trust me, I'm Dr. Pike, here's my ID badge. He pulled a lanyard from the desk and showed him his name and picture. I'll need to figure out what happened. There's a system so everyone knows which rooms are occupied and which stage of the appointment they are in. He rambled on, gesturing with his hands to the large metal flags attached to the wall outside a nearby exam door. Green while the nurse is inside, red when waiting for the doctor, and blue when the room needs cleaned before the next patient. Someone must have forgotten to flip the tab as they left your room. I can do the appointment right now. Mandy was mortified. Of course, it would be the doctor who finds her. Not to mention he was incredibly handsome. She, on the other hand, just woke up from a three-hour nap on a pillow with a tissue paper pillowcase. She had red eyes and a pounding head from whatever ailment was kicking her immune system in the butt. She probably sported red marks all over her face. But, if he could do the appointment now, at least she wouldn't have to close the daycare again. 
Yes, that would be amazing. I really can't afford to take off again tomorrow. What do you do? The question surprised Mandy. Why would he need to know that? She told him anyway, explaining she owned a daycare over in Minden. He led her to an exam room and the conversation transitioned to her symptoms and his prescribed treatment. Mandy felt ridiculous when he decided she had an ear infection in addition to strep throat. Adults can get ear infections? She saw them all the time at the daycare, but assumed they were isolated to the portion of the population who wore diapers and footy pajamas. Just her luck and nothing like an ear infection to make her feel young and juvenile beside this gorgeous doctor. Despite his ridiculous t-shirt, which was now covered with a professional-looking lab coat, he was completely competent, and she felt insecure next to such an obviously intelligent man. As they wrapped up, Dr. Pike looked down briefly before looking up at her with his coffee-colored eyes. I really do feel terrible this happened to you. Could I take you out to dinner to make up for it? You really don't need to. I probably needed the nap anyway. She laughed off the invitation, not wanting a pity date. She grabbed the paperwork he held out and picked up her purse. This situation was embarrassing enough. You don't need to make anything up to me. She shook her head and her bangs fell into her eyes. She'd been putting off a haircut for months. He looked up at her and smiled. His brown eyes locking on hers and her heart raced. He reached one hand up and brushed the blonde hair to the side. She stopped breathing entirely at his touch. Well, how about just because I want to, then? Feeling the heat rise up her chest and neck as she swooned at the line, Mandy fumbled through accepting his invitation and they walked out of the exam room and into over to the waiting room. She gave him her phone number and they parted ways. Mandy figured he would probably never call and was determined not to get her hopes up. She definitely couldn't tell her mother. A doctor asking for her number? She would never hear the end of it. Garrett picked up the phone to call Mandy nearly a dozen times. She was lovely, even in her exhausted state. He could see her eyes, though dull with pain and the remnants of sleep after her impromptu nap in the exam room, were an unexpected gray. At first, he wondered if they were blue, until he did his exam and looked at them under the light of his otoscope. There wasn't any blue, just a striking silver, with a ring of dark around the edge that gave them a warmth and drew him further in. It was more than her appearance, however beautiful it was. She didn't back down under his admittedly harsh interrogation, but she wasn't the typical upset customer, demanding free treatment or a call from the manager. She'd been understanding and full of grace. She'd made him laugh, poking fun at his very undoctor-like appearance and again when she cracked a joke about her unfortunate ear infection. He could tell she wasn't exactly outgoing, but she was witty and held her own against him when he'd accused her of trespassing. Whatever the reason, he felt comfortable with her, despite the odd nature of their meeting. He wondered if his reaction would have been the same if he saw her first in the exam room, in the routine of appointment, chart, appointment, chart, probably after the woman complaining of feeling lightheaded before admitting she was on the grapefruit diet. He rolled his eyes again at the memory. Apparently, the middle-aged woman thought the grapefruit diet actually meant eating only grapefruit. Not that the grapefruit before every meal version worked miracles, but at least it wouldn't land anyone in the clinic. Instead of calling Mandy, which he desperately wanted to do, he debated. He couldn't date a patient. Even though her primary care physician was another doctor in the office, it wasn't right. He was the director of the clinic, for crying out loud. Definitely an ethics concern, maybe even something that could jeopardize his career if it went south. There was nothing more important to him than his career. He'd worked too hard to risk it all on a woman, no matter how intriguing she was. He wouldn't be here in Greencastle too long anyway. Five years didn't seem like much, when he'd worked for so many years to get where he was. Four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, then a four-year residency that gave him a dual license in family practice and internal medicine. He followed it up with an internal medicine fellowship at the same hospital in Texas. 
14 long years since high school, all singularly focused on becoming a successful doctor. Five years as director here at a rural clinic to get his towering mountain of student loans forgiven was a small sacrifice before moving on to somewhere else, with more interesting cases and the prestige that followed. Dot. He looked at the numbers on the screen again. Amanda Elliott. His thumb hovered over the delete contact button. Instead of pushing it, he tapped the home button and locked his phone, sliding it in his pocket again, unable to let Amanda go quite yet. Maybe he would go on a date, just to be able to tell his brother he did. He was getting tired of being nagged about his lack of love life. Just because Michael found his true meaning and happily ever after didn't mean Garrett's life was missing some critical puzzle piece. Garrett took over as director of the small, not-for-profit rural health clinic in October. Mostly, they were considered a family practice. He saw a few patients each day, but mostly he spent his time making sure the clinic ran smoothly. That meant writing grant proposals, courting potential donors, and managing the team of eight employees who kept the place going. He had two doctors under him, both had been there for years with no interest in taking the director position when it came open. One, Dr. Miller was currently his landlord. It made for an interesting dynamic when both of the doctors he oversaw had years more experience. It was a challenge he was willing to take on, though. In addition to the two doctors, there was one nurse practitioner, who mostly functioned as a doctor, and three nurses, one assigned to the patients of each practitioner. Dot. Lastly, he oversaw one administrative clerk and one billing and insurance specialist. They contracted out the cleaning. Every single person had been there far longer than his five months, with the notable exception of one new nurse who already managed to leave a patient abandoned in the office for hours after closing. Dot. Trish, his office clerk was responsible for scheduling, front desk duties, and managed inventory and ordering for things like tongue depressors and vaccinations. She seemed to know everyone in Greencastle and was constantly distracted. She included a frustrating habit of getting into extended conversations with patients, checking in or calling to schedule. Her bleach blonde hair seemed to subscribe to the southern mantra he heard in Texas, the bigger the hair, the closer to God. She grated on him. She was loud and exuded a shrill laugh that carried through the office. Trish handled payment of invoices and credited copays to patient accounts, but then the insurance side of things was handled by Connie. Garrett definitely did not envy Connie, who spent much of her time on the phone with insurance companies making sure the correct discounts were applied for patient accounts or fighting with Medicare or Medicaid about coverage for different items. Connie did an amazing job making sure insurance was utilized the very best it could be for the patients. And for the uninsured, she was the one who determined real cost and billing to make it as affordable as possible. It was Connie who knocked on his office door now. Dr. Pike. Yeah, what's up? Connie didn't come to him often. I've got something I wanted to talk with you about. He motioned for her to sit down and she handed him a manila file. When he opened it, he knew enough to recognize it as the balance statement for a family. A pretty significant balance. Connie spoke quietly and wrung her hands. This is the Barber family. They've had a pretty rough year so far. Joe, the father, lost his job right after Christmas. They have four kids and have been in for the usual ailments, strep throat, influenza. She waved a hand in a you-get-the-drift motion. Their youngest is only six months and he came in a couple of times with a cold and then ended up admitted to the hospital with RSV. Garrett winced. RSV was a respiratory virus and could be really nasty for infants. They don't have insurance right now, and with the hospital bills on top of everything else. She trailed off and Garrett looked at the balance again. Is this the full balance? Or have you already worked your magic? Connie lifted one corner of her lips in a grim, half-smile. This is after I've done everything I know to do. It's still thousands of dollars they don't have. I don't know if you know, but there's this money. Garrett nodded and interrupted her. I'm aware. Thanks for bringing it up, Connie. I'll see what we have in the Family Blessing Fund and see what we can do. 
Garrett discovered his predecessor established the account with the help of local churches to cover the expenses of families in need. The former director had total discretion over the funds, but the churches wanted a bit of oversight until they trusted Garrett like they had Dr. Allen. This would be the first time he asked them to use the funds, but he felt like it was exactly what the money was intended for. Connie relaxed at his words and her face brightened. Awesome, thanks, Dr. Pike. She got up and headed for the door. Dot. He stopped her, puzzled at her reaction. Connie, can I ask you a question? She paused and turned back toward him, visibly tense again. Sure. What did you think I was going to say? What I mean is, were you nervous to ask me about this? Connie quickly shrugged. Well, yeah, kind of. You are kind of intense. All business, you know. I didn't know if you knew about the money and well, if you'd want to help. Ouch. That stung, but Garrett hid his dismay at the words and simply thanked her again. Was he really so serious and cold that she thought he wouldn't want to help this family in need? What did the rest of the staff think of him? He made it his mission to find out. He'd been meaning to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each member of the staff when he first started, but the timing never worked out. Now, though, it needed to be a priority dot. He couldn't be an effective leader if his staff was afraid of him, and worse, thought he didn't care about the patients. He shook his head. He cared. When he first started practicing, sometimes he cared too much. Just because he tried to keep it professional didn't mean he was apathetic. He would have to do better to show them. But how? Chapter 4 after four hours of sleep, Garrett crawled out of bed and did a few push-ups, sit-ups, and high knees to wake himself up. It was already seven in the morning, and he knew he would be getting to the office late, which he hated. Despite the fact that he was at the clinic until three last night, the rest of the staff would only see the relatively new director coming in late. What a great impression that would make Dot. Garrett was at his office so much, he debated sleeping on one of the beds in a patient room. Worry he might fall off the narrow exam table was his only deterrent and motivation to return to his bland apartment late in the evenings. The clinic was without a real director for nearly a year and he took over, and the amount of backlog created was astounding. The budget was beyond squeezed, since there was no influx of grant money or new donors since the previous director left. Expenses also seemed to be rising steadily, though he couldn't quite figure out why. Dot. He parked his Prius and entered through the main office door. He was determined not to sneak in, despite the temptation. He held a stainless steel travel mug in his hand, a prop he often used to seem more relatable. Since he didn't usually drink coffee, the mug held only water with a few of the flavor drops he liked. People understood coffee in the morning. He received only funny looks when he told friends in Texas that water would wake them up more than coffee did. And those were the doctors. Nearly all of them denied their body the sleep, exercise, and hydration their body needed and instead treated the lack of sleep with caffeine, the mild dehydration with over-the-counter pain medications, and the lack of exercise with food restrictions so they didn't gain weight. It was a vicious cycle people all over the country were stuck in but he didn't know how to help. Plus, he was in his own vicious sleep deprivation cycle right now. Trish heard him and turned from the front desk toward the door behind her. Her eyes grew wide and she moved slightly to her right. Dr. Pike. Good morning. Is everything okay? What? Oh, yes. Everything is fine. Just a late night here and running a bit behind this morning. How is everything tracking here this morning? Lately, they had a poor track record of appointments falling behind Dot. Trish turned and clicked a few buttons on her screen. Everything is good here, doctor. Everyone's appointments are running right on time. She rubbed one manicured, fake nail with another finger. Late night, you say? If you ever need any assistance on these late nights at the office, you just let me know. The innuendo was obvious. It wasn't the first time Trish made her interest known and Garrett knew eventually he would need to deal with it. 
preferably not on four hours of sleep, though. He let the comment pass without a response. Do I have any appointments today? She pulled up a calendar on the screen. You've got one at 11 and one at 11.30. But nothing until then. I'll be in my office if anyone needs me. And I'll be right here if you need me, doctor. Garrett held back the gag at the suggestive tone. This had to stop. Lord, help me. Trish? Yes. She batted her eyelashes and looked up at him from her seat. Dot. I really need you to be more professional. The comments. He panicked, unsure how to continue without humiliating her. He didn't want to be cruel. I've, uh, got a girlfriend. His thoughts went to Mandy again. It was a lie, a bold-faced one. But desperate times and all that dot. Trish stuck out her lower lip in an exaggerated pout and he barely avoided rolling his eyes. Oh, well, I didn't realize you were off the market. That's too bad. Ugh. The market? Even the terminology irritated him. Like he was some kind of commodity for sale. He imagined an auctioneer, we've got a great item here, ladies. He's successful, he's in good shape. He is a doctor, ladies, so get your wallets ready. We will start the bidding at 500. Can I get 500, how about a thousand? He might not actually have a girlfriend. But he definitely wasn't on the market. Dot. Trish continued, I guess I'll just have to wait my turn. She smiled and turned back to her computer. Dot. This time, Garrett couldn't hold back the gag that grabbed his throat. He did manage to finish his exit into the hallway before it choked him, though. Mandy pulled a feather from her sweater, a purple one this time, the feather, not the sweater. The kids decorated roosters with brightly colored craft feathers to go along with their story this morning. Unfortunately, she chose today to wear a fuzzy fleece sweater and the feathers seemed to stick to it much better than they did to the paper, despite the inches of glue stick each child seemed determined to use. She hurried to sweep up the rest of the feathers and paper scraps from the floor beneath the small table that acted as craft table, lunch table, and activity table. Her lesson plans this week were a little lacking, and they completed almost everything she planned, but lunch prep was still 45 minutes away. Mentally flipping through her options, she settled on Play-Doh. Okay, everyone come back and take a seat at the table. She yelled over the roar of small voices to be heard. We are going to do Play-Doh. That got their attention and the kids who heard her rush to get their preferred seat at the table with squeals of excitement. The others soon realized they missed something and made their way over as well. The babies were still happily parked in the exorciser and the bouncer. Mandy swept the feathers into the dustpan and dumped it into the trash can before retrieving the basket containing the Play-Doh and cookie cutters from the top shelf. It would keep the kids occupied until it was time to put the show on while she prepped lunch. She congratulated herself on the quick thinking. Unscheduled time was just asking for chaos when there were ten kids in a fairly confined space. Keeping them busy and engaged was the key to not losing her marbles. She knew free play was important for development, too, and free play was carefully scheduled into the day during drop-off and pick-up times. Some of her daycare moms laughed at her detailed schedule, broken into 15-minute segments of the day. She used a much looser schedule when she first started. It worked okay, with a couple of kids. But once you added a few more, Structure was a necessity. Which worked out, because Mandy loved structure. She was organized and methodical and liked for everything to have its place to. Some would think her system wouldn't do well with toddlers, but she wasn't inflexible. She could go with the flow, and if her plans didn't work out, she could improvise. But she would always come in with a plan. That was the default, organized and systemic. Calendars and lesson plans and file folders for each student. She even held parent-teacher conferences and gave report cards. It helped her set goals and identify specific needs for each child. 
Parents seemed to appreciate them, too, once they got over the novelty of their preschooler getting a report card. It was helpful for them to know Joey wasn't sharing well, and Nicole was struggling with her numbers bigger than 10. Doing it in a formalized way helped Mandy make sure she didn't forget to pass on the information. When you saw 10 parents for 2 minutes each every day, it would be easy to let things fall through the cracks. And Mandy hated to let things fall through the cracks. Things left unresolved nagged at her. That's why it was needling her that Dr. Pike hadn't called her. It had been a month since she'd fallen asleep at the doctor's office. He'd said he would and then didn't. Who did that? If you said you were going to do something, you did it. Maybe Dr. Pike was a flake. Or maybe he really was just feeling guilty and didn't actually want to take her on a date. That was more likely. Maybe she hallucinated the entire thing. She suffered a fever at the time. Eventually, she took some pretty good painkillers to go with her antibiotics. Maybe the entire encounter was a fever-induced dream and the actual appointment had been boring and predictable. What were the odds a sexy doctor would confront her in the hallway and then brush her hair back from her eyes and make her knees go weak? Much more believable that she imagined it and fantasized about the invitation. But she knew that wasn't the case. Dr. Garrett Pike confronted her in the hallway and then apologized profusely for her inconvenience. He did her exam himself and flirted with her. And he had asked for her number and promised to call. And then he hadn't. Jerk. Ah. Uh. But he wasn't a jerk. Well, at least not entirely. He'd been a bit of a jerk when he thought she was trespassing, but that was fair. Right? No, as much as she wanted to be upset and misremember how much she'd like the cute doctor with the chocolate eyes, she couldn't. She could only be disappointed he didn't call and disappointed with the frozen entree she would be having for dinner again tonight. Disappointed she'd gotten her hopes up which meant the loneliness would sting a little more for a while. She just hoped this time it would return to the dull ache she had grown accustomed to. Mandy always wanted a family. Like most young girls, she dreamed of her wedding day, her knight in shining armor. When Ryan came along, she thought she finally found it. True love. But true love wouldn't try to cut you off from your friends and family. True love wouldn't pressure you into a physical relationship before you were ready. True love would build you up, not tear you down. During her years in Minden after college, she looked for a life partner within her group of friends. For a long time after her friend Rachel died, she thought maybe Luke could be that person. They shared some experiences, a tragic loss in their past. She did desperate things to get his attention and cringed to remember her behavior when Charlotte first came to town. Luke, of course, the upstanding man he was, was never anything but honest with her and was never cruel, but any illusion of a relationship between them had been entirely fabricated by Mandy. Several people tried to encourage a relationship between her and Mark. He was a middle school teacher and they definitely shared a love of kids. They both volunteered with the junior high youth group and go along well. There was no spark, though. Mark was goofy and into video games and board games. She would much rather go for a hike or have a picnic. Friendship was the only relationship they would ever have, much to Chrissy's dismay. Everything she had done trying to land Luke, she was determined to avoid next time. If there ever was a next time. This online dating thing was a bust so far. Despite being on a Christian-focused dating site, she received countless solicitous messages and started conversations with several men who quickly professed their faith to be immaterial in their life. That was not the kind of man Mandy wanted even if it meant continuing to be alone. She had been with someone who professed to be a Christian and turned out to be anything but Christ-like. Mandy hated being alone. She questioned God nearly every night about why she had to go through life without a partner. She hated eating alone and despised the single-serve frozen dinners filling her freezer. She had amazing friends, but it wasn't the same as having a best friend and partner. Someone to unload the burdens of life on or to cuddle with on the couch. 
After 10 years, she still missed the intimacy of sharing a bed with someone. She would never do that again unless she was married. And she wouldn't get married unless it was to a good man. That was probably the only thing holding her back from considering some of those crazy modern-day mail-order bride scenarios. That and she could never see herself leaving Minden. Dreading another evening alone, Mandy shot the same text to three different friends. A. Plans tonight. She waited for Charlotte, Chrissy, and Daisy to respond. Charlotte just got married to Luke, and Chrissy and Todd finally got together after years of dancing around it. Daisy Bloom was still single though. Mandy was crossing her fingers at least one of her friends had time for her tonight. As expected Charlotte and Chrissy both quickly responded they were busy. Daisy didn't respond until later, but Mandy was relieved to see her text come through as she started putting the nap cots away while the kids ate their snack of graham crackers and apples at the table. DB, I'm free. It's been ages. Want to come out to the farm? A. I'll be there around 6.30. Dinner from Chrissy's restaurant? She just reopened last week. DB, yum. Mandy put her phone away, excited at the prospect of seeing her friend again and not spending the evening alone. By 5.30, all the kids were picked up and she called in an order to the bistro for two flatbread pizzas and an order of spinach artichoke dip. Bloom's farm was about 20 minutes west of Minden, toward Terre Haute. Mandy spent a lot of time there as a kid. Her parents were friends with the Blooms and Laura Bloom watched Mandy and Josh during the summers while her parents worked. Daisy had always been Mandy's closest friend of the group, but Daisy had five sisters and a brother, too. Mandy knew them all. She was closest to Daisy and Andy, Daisy's twin sister. Andy was in the military and on her third deployment in the Middle East. With only a year or two between each sibling, they all hung out together in various groups over the years. Mandy hadn't been out to the farm since before Thanksgiving. Daisy was opening a bed and breakfast on the property and her sister, Lily, was two years older and managed weddings and events in the large barn on the property. Chrissy and Todd were going to be married at Bloom's farm later in the summer. They just started talking about wedding plans after the cafe was finally reopened as B&J Bistro after the renovations. Chapter 5 Mandy picked up the food and spent the 20-minute drive convincing herself it would be a bad idea to try to sneak chips and dip while driving on the gravel roads. She pulled into the familiar drive and noticed a new sign over the entrance. It was rustic and elegant, declaring Bloom's Farm and Vineyard. Vineyard? That was new. Maybe Daisy's sisters had been busy as well. The white wooden fence led her up the driveway in the fading light of day. The days were getting longer, but daylight savings time hadn't happened yet, meaning it would be dark in another half hour or so. She passed the large event barn that sat on the front portion of the property and continued toward the main house. This was the house that had been on the property for a hundred years and Daisy was determined to turn into a bed and breakfast. Her parents built a gorgeous house on the far side of the property years ago, something more modern and taking advantage of the view from a hilltop. Lily lived there, as did their younger sister, Lavender. This old farmhouse was Daisy's pet project, though, and she lived there with her brother, Hawthorne. He was Mr. Fix-It, so it was probably a good thing he agreed to live there with his sister. Things were breaking down constantly, as was not unexpected with a 100-year-old house. Mandy parked in front of the house, admiring the newly replaced front porch and grabbed the food to take inside. Daisy was sitting in an Adirondack chair on the porch, wrapped in a big sweatshirt. Good. I'm starving, she said as she untucked her legs from under her and stood up gracefully. Daisy was a dancer through high school and still maintained a slim figure and a natural balance Mandy tried not to be envious of Du. They got comfortable at the small table tucked into the corner of the kitchen, which was in a state of major disarray. Mandy chose not to comment. Sometimes Daisy was a little defensive about her projects, as though commenting on them in progress was a sign you didn't have faith she would complete them. 
Instead, Mandy opened the styrofoam containers and handed one to Daisy. Porch looks good. Daisy smiled. It does, doesn't it? It's my new favorite place on the farm. Hawthorne helped me finish it during that warm spell last week. How is your brother? Where is he tonight? He's good. Not sure where he is. He probably went over to Terre Haute. Thinks he'll find his soulmate in a bar. Mandy rolled her eyes. Sounds like a great plan. Although, at least it's a plan. My online dating solution doesn't seem to be doing me much good. You? Online dating? I just can't see it. I know. Mandy hung her head and pretended to cover her eyes in shame. I'm ashamed. But seriously, she looked up, it's been awful. The guys out there are just. Gross. They aren't gross. Just, looking for something different than me, I guess. I swear, half of them start with a request for naked pictures. And that's on the Christian site. It's ridiculous. Okay, so it probably wasn't quite that bad. It's like all the decent men in the world are already taken. Or there is no spark. Or they don't want kids. You'll find someone. Maybe not on a dating app, but you will. Mandy said what she was scared to. What if I don't, Daze? What if I'm destined to be an old spinster who takes care of other people's kids? Then so what? You have great friends, a great job, and most importantly, a relationship with the God who loves you unconditionally. Your life isn't terrible and I'm not going to let you throw a pity party for yourself tonight. You're only 31. There was something about being with someone who knew you. Who'd known you more than half your life and wasn't afraid to call you out on your nonsense. I'm only 30, thank you very much. I won't be 31 until June. Ugh. Fine. Tonight, we will eat pizza and drink wine and I promise to not feel sorry for myself. Mandy paused and looked over at the scrap lumber and saw dust on the kitchen counter. Do you at least have any chocolate in this wreck of a kitchen? After a few hours laughing and reminiscing with Daisy, Mandy felt much better. Daisy never pulled punches and was happy to let Mandy know when she was being melodramatic. Daisy was the first to vocalize her disapproval of he who shall not be named, as she liked to call Ryan. Ryan the repulsive was also occasionally thrown about. Mandy wondered what she would call Dr. Pike if ever given the chance to meet him. McDreamy was too obvious. Well, it didn't matter anyway, because he wasn't going to call her, and she was, for tonight, okay, with it. She drove home in the moonlight and listened to the Christian radio station, singing along with the songs and feeling slightly guilty she hadn't spent much time with God lately. She'd gotten out of the habit of reading her Bible before the first kid arrived at daycare while she'd been sick and running on fumes, but that was no excuse. She'd pick up her Bible tonight and see what God needed to tell her. Even though she was pretty sure he'd already spoken through Daisy on this particular instance. Halfway home, she decided to call her brother. When he answered with a distracted, Yeah, she smiled. He always made her smile. There was no one else in the world quite like her big brother. Just driving home from the Bloom's farm, figured I would see if you had a minute to chat. He paused and then asked, how's Daisy? Not a bad guess Mandy would be there to visit the sister she was closest with. She's good. Living in a permanent construction zone. Probably doesn't even notice. She was always like a tornado, leaving a path of Dr. Pepper cans and discarded shoes in her wake. She heard the smile in his voice. Daisy was as much a little sister to Josh as Mandy was true. She hasn't changed. Although, I think it's diet Dr. Pepper these days, she added absently. And how are you? Eh, better now after a bit of girl time. Nothing exciting here, same as always. What about you? Any big news? Got my new website up and running and booked a couple of weddings. 
actually booked one in June out at the Blooms. I didn't realize they had a wedding venue out there. Yeah, Lily put all of it together a few years ago. Chrissy and Todd are getting married there. No kidding. Did you say Lily put it together? Yeah, she runs the event center and helps with all the wedding planning stuff. Josh didn't say anything. Josh. What? Yeah, good for her. Guess I better get used to working with her. Don't sound so excited about it. The sarcasm dripped from her voice. What's to get used to? It'll be just like old times. Mandy wasn't sure why, but there was something Josh wasn't telling her. It'll be good to get back out to the farm a bit. Miss that place. Mandy couldn't agree more. Chapter 6 It was the last week of February, and Garrett was out for a run after work. The weather finally warmed up a bit and although he was still forced to wear long sleeves and a lightweight knit stocking cap, he was thrilled that it was finally warm enough to run outside comfortably. Everything was still brown and dirty. Mounds of snow still lingered in parking lots, piled high by the snowplows. Garrett was more than ready for spring to show up and the trees to start budding. It had been too many years since he witnessed the unparalleled greenness of an Indiana spring. Texas tended to be drier and less vivid. It wasn't even March, and Garrett had been in Greencastle for five months. Most of it a cold and dreary winter season. When he talked to his brother the night before, they discussed getting together for an Easter dinner at the end of March, reminiscent of the ones they shared growing up with their parents and cousins. In previous years, Garrett always used the excuse of work and being all the way in Texas to avoid an obligation like this. But now, he was closer and he could choose whether to work on Sundays. At Christmas, his brother was busy with his in-laws and hadn't pushed too hard when Garrett declined an invitation to join them. It didn't seem like his brother was going to give up this time. Garrett tried to text him earlier today but didn't receive a response. That was unlike his brother, he was practically attached to his phone due to his role as a salesman. By the next day, Garrett still hadn't heard from his brother. He was starting to worry. When his phone rang with an unknown number in the middle of the day, he anxiously answered it, grateful he was not in the middle of a patient visit. This is Garrett. Hello, is this Dr. Garrett Pike? This is he. Do you have a brother named Michael Pike? His eyes narrowed and his lips pursed. Yes. Is everything okay? Who's this? Dr. Pike, this is Officer Janet Mueller from the Fort Wayne Police Department. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but your brother and his wife were in an accident. Their car was hit by a tractor trailer. She paused, and he heard her exhale. There was nothing the paramedics could do. Garrett felt the breath freeze in his lungs. His mouth hung open. He staggered across the length of his small office to his chair and slowly sank into its familiar embrace. I. I can't believe this. His brain struggled to catch up to the information. What did this mean? What about Adelaide? Is she okay? Adelaide was not in the car. She was with a babysitter, it appears. Right now, Child Services is taking care of her. But we need you to come as soon as you can. We need you to identify the bodies, and, if possible, take temporary custody of Adelaide. At least until we can determine their wishes and your brother's estate can be settled. The officer's tone was crisp and professional and it made him want to punch something, but the urge was countered by an overwhelming emptiness. She's mine, Garrett stated the fact numbly, almost unwilling to internalize the impact of those words. But it was true, Michael and Elizabeth asked him several years ago if he would be Adelaide's guardian if something were to happen to them. Elizabeth didn't have any siblings, and her parents were too old to take on a young child. Of course, Garrett readily agreed and then promptly forgotten all about it. He wasn't sure he'd even thought about the scenario since the short ten-minute conversation. A ten-minute conversation that would now change his entire world. I'm listed as her guardian in their will. 
I'm glad to hear that, Dr. Pike. When can you get here? I can't believe this is happening. Trying to hold himself together enough to finish the call, he focused on what needed to be done. Just let me check a few things. Where do I go when I get there? Garrett knew he had an afternoon full of appointments. Actually, he had a week full of appointments. But there was nothing to be done. He sucked in a big breath and fought the stinging behind his eyes. Adelaide needed him. Dot. Garrett cleared his calendar by handing off his appointments to the other doctors at the clinic. When he was asked, he explained the situation briefly, but did not go into much detail. He made the more than four hour drive to Fort Wayne that evening. He spent most of the trip replaying past conversations with his brother. Dot. You've got to loosen up, man. There is more to life than work. If you're not careful, you're going to wake up and be 60 years old with nothing but a fat bank account and a fancy office and a lab coat with your name embroidered on it. Look, I'm not saying you have to get married or have to have kids, but you need a life. You need friends. We are your family, and we are important, too. I know you are important. So are my patients, and I have a responsibility to them. I need to be here that weekend. I can't just drop everything and come to see you. You have a niece now, Garrett. Do you realize that? You are Uncle Garrett. Or at least you will be if she ever gets to meet you. In the four years since that conversation, Garrett managed to meet his only niece, but only a handful of times. It didn't really matter, it wasn't like she remembered him. Even so, she always warmed up to him eventually and never wanted to see Uncle Garrett leave. He loved seeing how much she changed from visit to visit. It seemed like she went from barely walking to saying words and then talking in sentences overnight. What was she going to do when she realized he was the only family she had left? What would she say when he told her he was going to take her home with him? He groaned. He was going to take her home with him. How was that going to work? He didn't have anything for kids at his apartment. And it was tiny. He lived above the garage of another physician and was essentially a studio apartment. He loved Addie, but he barely knew her. It had been six months since he'd seen her. But for whatever reason, his brother and Elizabeth chose him to care for her. He was going to do his best. For Michael. He could do it all, right? People had kids and careers all the time. He would just have to figure it out. Dot. Of course, Garrett didn't know anything about kids beyond the medical side of things. What did she eat? Was she already in school? Would she take showers? He didn't even have a bathtub. What sort of things did a four-year-old girl like to do? God, I'm going to need some major help here. I'm so far out of my league. He imagined tea parties and dress up in his future and let out a heavy sigh. Yeah, he definitely needed help. But who could he call? The only person he knew with kids was his brother. And just like that, a stab of pain at the realization he would never talk to his brother again. He was on his own. Garrett made it to Fort Wayne and got in touch with the coroner's office. The first thing he did was find Adelaide and determine what needed to happen so he could take care of her. He met Adelaide's caseworker at the department offices. After he checked in with the receptionist, they led him to a small room filled with toys for all ages. Adelaide sat quietly at a table, clutching her stuffed cat. There was paper and crayons in front of her, but they appeared untouched. It had only been two days. Did she understand what was going on? How much could a four-year-old truly comprehend the fact that she would never see her mommy and daddy again? Yet, the sadness around the small child was palpable. He had never seen her like this. In fact, Garrett's brother often joked, every day is the best day of Adelaide's life. She always got excited over the smallest things, a trip to the neighborhood playground, a chance to eat at a real restaurant, or even reading a favorite book. Her typical reaction to the small joys in life was over the top. Dot. Garrett hurried into the room, eager to hold his niece and reassure her he was there for her. 
She turned and a small flicker of recognition lit her brown eyes. A breath he didn't know he was holding escaped and his shoulders sagged. Despite being told Adelaide was unharmed, something inside him didn't believe it until she was sitting mere steps away. Unka Garrett? Yeah, Addie. I'm here. He enveloped his niece in a hug. Her admittedly small frame felt fragile, as though a stiff Indiana breeze could blow her away in the moment. Before he was allowed to see her, the caseworker cautioned him he needed to move slowly. Adelaide had been through forty-eight hours of uncertainty and upheaval. Life as she knew it was changed forever. Are we going to see Daddy now? The innocence in the question broke his heart and he was stabbed with a lance of grief once again. I'm so sorry, Addy. But your mommy and daddy are gone. They are in heaven now. Well, can we go see them in heaven? He thought the stinging sensation behind his eyes and pressed his lips together. He couldn't answer. He just shook his head and held her tighter. Dot. The process of taking guardianship of Adelaide was relatively easy, but it was still nearly a week before the two of them returned to Greencastle. The court quickly approved his claim of guardianship and Adelaide came home from the emergency foster care she was in. There was still so much to be done. He met with his brother's pastor and scheduled the funeral for Monday. In the meantime, he stayed at his brother's house with Addie. She continued to be a shell of her normal self. Garrett was a statue as he studied her, aimlessly pushing her french fries round the plate with a dull expression. The same vacant look he had been studying for three minutes. He opened his mouth to speak, then stopped himself before trying again. Addy? He broke the silence and Adelaide jolted out of her daze. His voice deepened and he walked carefully across the room toward her. Are you okay, Ladybug? The lump in his throat grew as he called her the nickname he and Michael shared for her. He swallowed painfully. I want mommy. Her sweet little voice was barely a whisper. Dot. I know you do. It's okay to miss them. I miss them, too, he admitted. He was trying hard to be strong for her, and he'd been distracted from his grief by the laundry list of things he needed to do. But there it was. The icy, unforgiving truth, he missed his brother. It was impossible not to think Michael would come around the corner into the kitchen any moment, laughing at something Elizabeth said just like a hundred other times. Dot. He laid a hand on Adelaide's shoulder, trying to reassure her. We're going to be okay, Addie. All right? And he glanced heavenward with an unspoken prayer. It was going to be okay, wasn't it? All his reassurances to his niece couldn't assuage the uncertainty in his heart. He needed to find some help. He couldn't do this alone. But who could he turn to? Dr. Miller, his landlord? He was hardly father of the year material. He was on wife number four and his son wasn't talking to him. Then, someone else flashed into his mind. The woman from the doctor's office. The one who he found wandering the hall so late in the evening. He'd never called her, despite his best intentions when asking her out. He decided it would be too dangerous for his career. Didn't she have kids or was a teacher? Something like that. A daycare. That was it, she owned a daycare. All his pent-up tension evaporated at the realization. Maybe he had someone he could call after all. Garrett puffed out his cheeks and released the breath. He was beyond frustrated. He had been home with Adelaide for two days. Without Elizabeth's mother around to do her hair, Adelaide looked like a mess. Ragamuffin was the word that came to mind. Garrett found himself struggling to restrain a very upset four-year-old, holding her hair in one hand, and trying not to yank her back when she wanted to run away, and a brush in the other hand. Dot. Ow! It was probably the fiftieth time he said those words in the last two minutes. And her hair was no closer to being untangled than it was before. Dot. I'm sorry, Addie. But we need to get this brushed out. It will only get worse the longer we wait. There was no way Garrett could do this. 
Despite his attempts to get Addie to eat, she staunchly refused everything he served her for the past two days. Chicken nuggets. Gross. Hot dogs. Absolutely not. Even pizza, which Garrett knew for a fact to be her favorite. She wouldn't eat any of it. There was little more frustrating in this life than preparing a meal for a child who then refuses to eat it. Just ask any mother around the world. He was trying, didn't that count for something? But if he didn't get back to work soon, he thought he would have to check himself into the psych ward. It was too soon, he knew that. Adelaide needed him. He was all she had, and his heart broke for her on a regular basis. He kept hoping to see a glimpse of the cheerful little girl he knew. But she wasn't there. Not yet, anyway. Chapter 7 It had been six weeks since her appointment and Mandy couldn't stop herself from thinking about the doctor with the striking eyes and gentle hands. She tried to tell herself she wasn't disappointed when he didn't call. She actually wasn't surprised, but disappointed. Yeah, she was. He felt like the first man she made a connection with since Ryan. In college, she fell fast and hard for Ryan, who said all the right things to capture her desperate for attention heart. It turned out to be one of the worst decisions Mandy ever made. Her whirlwind relationship with Ryan landed her pregnant, alone, and not even 20 years old. When they first discovered the pregnancy, Ryan continued to say the right things. They would get married, she would finish school, and they would have a beautiful life together. When he was gone and she was alone, she was filled with doubts. He wiped them away with kisses and promises. In the same conversation, he would remind her she was lucky to have him. When news of the baby came, Mandy's family and friends quickly pointed out to her his controlling tendencies and manipulative behavior. Once those warnings were given, she couldn't help but see them in every interaction. But she still wasn't strong enough to walk away. It was her family's ultimatum of choose us or choose him that made her reevaluate. Her mother assured her she would have all the support in the world to raise that baby, even as a single mother. Ryan had been furious with her and tried every trick in the book to make her change her mind. The one part about being a single mother she had dreaded was knowing she would have to let Ryan be a part of her daughter's life. That meant he would be part of hers, no matter how small. In the end, it hadn't mattered. She hadn't seen Ryan in nearly ten years. When she was five months along, the ultrasound revealed her beloved, although unintended, little baby would not survive. Remembering the tiny little features of the baby girl on the ultrasound brought Mandy to tears. Those memories were eventually joined by the feeling of impossibly small fingers and toes in her hands deep. Rebecca was born with severe brain abnormalities associated with trisomy 13. At the ultrasound where it was detected, the doctors said those three dreaded words for any expectant mother, incompatible with life. The doctor explained that not only was it unlikely her baby would carry to term, it was nearly unheard of for a baby with the condition to live longer than a few hours after birth. They offered to terminate the pregnancy, trying to convince her that since her baby wouldn't live, she could spare herself the emotional and physical trauma of the third trimester and delivery. Despite Mandy's recent distance from God and poor decision-making, she loved the Lord and believed with all her heart he had a plan to redeem her life. She could not bring herself to end the beating heart of the tiny person she saw in the ultrasound pictures. If God wanted her baby in heaven so soon, he would have to take her himself. Rebecca was stillborn, delivered at 38 weeks. It was the hardest thing Mandy had ever done. Knowing the contractions would not lead to a baby she could take home with her was excruciating, perhaps even more so than the labor pains, mostly dulled with an epidural. She was able to spend time with Rebecca, holding her, tracing her tiny hands and nose and ears with her own hands. Rebecca's only bath was in Mandy's tears as she sang softly to Rebecca, Jesus loves you. After the diagnosis, Ryan was mostly absent. A text message here or there, but as much as he wanted the baby, he couldn't deal with the loss. He and his parents came to the hospital while Mandy was in labor. 
Mandy had no desire to see Ryan, but she allowed him and his family to spend some time with Rebecca alone and mourn her death as well. Duh. For seven years after that experience, Mandy refused to go on a single date. She poured herself into school and after that, into work. She filled her schedule to the brim outside of work, too. She volunteered for nearly everything at church. Dedicating her free time to something's good made it seem less pathetic that there was nothing waiting for her at home. There were other distractions as well. Chrissy frequently needed an extra set of hands to wait tables, and with the new bistro set up, she learned to make coffee drinks with the fancy new espresso machine. The weeks the restaurant was under renovation created an unwelcome void in her calendar. Her first several years running the daycare were the hardest. Knowing her daughter would have been the same age as some of the children she cared for was excruciating. She spent nap times crying and arguing with God. When she saw a child in her care take their first steps, she mourned the fact that her daughter never would. She never got to see her daughter smile, talk, or do any other things babies do. Dot. She still desperately wanted a family though. She was afraid it was becoming almost too late, especially since there was no relationship even hinting at something more serious. Even though she reminded herself again and again it didn't matter that Dr. Pike had not called her after their unexpected meeting. After hours at the clinic, it bothered her. He seemed so genuine and charming when getting her phone number. Why would he have done that if he didn't intend to call? Instead of dwelling on the thought, Mandy portioned goldfish crackers and fruit onto plates for afternoon snack. Nap time was almost over, and the kids would keep her distracted for a couple more hours deep. At least tonight would not be spent wallowing alone at her house. She was helping reorganize the local food pantry. She was asked to do a lot of things. People in the community knew Mandy was willing to help. She never said no, much to her mother's chagrin. Miss Ruth counseled her similarly. I understand the need to fill your time, Mandy. But the way you are avoiding solitude is not healthy. You have to learn to put yourself first some time. It's okay to say no, especially when you need to do something else. I've heard the stories about you grocery shopping at 10 p.m. because you spent the day helping someone else instead of taking care of what you needed to do for yourself and the daycare. No wonder you were sick. It was true, Mandy often put off taking care of herself and avoided spending any time alone. It wasn't that Mandy didn't enjoy helping, exactly. She did. She liked volunteering and filling a need. She liked being needed. But she found herself unable to say no to anything. It often led to excessively late nights or early mornings trying to complete her own responsibilities after giving away her time to others. But at least when she was busy, it was harder to be lonely. Mandy's phone rang, and just like she had for the last six weeks, she secretly hoped it would be Dr. Pike on the other end of the line. So far, it had been parents seeing if she had openings at the daycare, friends calling to make plans, or, most commonly, telemarketers and scam artists. Despite having hopes it would be the handsome doctor, they weren't high hopes. She let the call go to voicemail as she usually did during daycare hours. When she listened to the message a few hours later during nap time, with a cheerful Miles on her lap, very much not napping, she was shocked to hear the message the caller left. Hi Amanda. This is Garrett Pike, I don't know if you remember me? We met during your appointment a few weeks ago. Or at least long after your appointment should have happened. I am sorry, I didn't call sooner. I really meant to, but time. You know how it is, work and all. Anyway, I'd really like to talk to you if you have time. Please give me a call back. Garrett left his phone number and the message ended. Dot. Mandy sat stunned. Miles started to fuss at the quiet and the lack of attention. She started to talk to the only one there to listen. I wonder why he called now. Yes, I do. Doesn't six weeks seem like a long time? Doesn't it, Miles? It sure seemed like a long time to me. 
The sing-song rhythm of her voice as she spoke in a falsely cheerful tone made Miles giggle and grin up at her with a toothless smile. Would she call Dr. Pike back? She had mostly convinced herself she was upset with him for not calling since, but if she was being honest, she was thrilled to hear his voice despite how long it had been since their encounter. Trying not to seem too eager, Mandy waited until the next evening to return his call. When he answered, he sounded gravelly and drawn out. Dot. Hello? Um, hi, this is Mandy. Mandy was exasperated. Was he kidding her right now? Amanda Elliot? You called me yesterday. She heard a female voice in the background. Dot. Right. Amanda, I'm so glad to hear from you. He sounded genuinely relieved at her call. At those simple words, Mandy's frustration vanished. He was glad to hear from her. I want to apologize again for not calling sooner. I'm sure it seems odd for me to call now. No, not at all. Mandy lied. She waited for him to continue. Dot. So? Maybe we could get together sometime? Coffee. Mandy wiggled her but in a silent happy dance. Composed, spoke calmly. When were you thinking? How about tomorrow? That sounds great. How about it B and J Bistro in Minden? There was a slight pause, and Mandy continued to hear music and voices in the background. It was Friday night, where was he? Sounds good, I will see you there around one. Tomorrow was Saturday and Mandy was scheduled at the food pantry in the morning from 8 to 10. She was helping Miles' mom get some things ready for a garage sale and was scheduled to help Chrissy at the bistro over lunch. But she should be done by one. And if she told Chrissy it was a date? She'd make sure of it. It's a date. Chapter 8 It's a date. The words echoed in Garrett's mind as he hung up the phone. He ran his fingers through his messy hair for the thousandth time today. He realized it would seem like a date, wouldn't it? He hadn't told Mandy why he was really calling, about Adelaide. When they talked at the clinic, Garrett mentioned he didn't have children. Oh, how much had changed. Adelaide was sitting on the couch, listening to a song from a show he had never heard of that she insisted on watching almost daily. He knew it was nearly time for bed, based on the number of meltdowns since dinner, but Garrett wasn't quite ready to wage that battle yet. In the end, Garrett couldn't find anyone to watch her, and Adelaide ended up coming with him to Minden. He had never been to the small town before. It wasn't far from Greencastle, only about 15 minutes. He looked up B&J Bistro on his phone and was surprised to see a nearly five-star rating from the reviewers of the popular site. He drove down Main Street toward the bistro and took in the small town. Dot. It was well kept, with charming storefronts and well-maintained houses lining the wide street. Spring flowers were beginning to bloom in large planters along the sidewalk. He found a parking spot about a block away from the bistro and circled the car to remove Adelaide from her car seat. They walked past a small craft store, and a bakery, with the most wonderful smell wafting from the open door, and finally reached what a hand-carved sign proclaimed to be B&J Bistro. Through the large windows on either side of the door, Garrett could see the seating area with inviting couches and small dining tables. It was not what he expected in such a small town. Greencastle didn't have anything similar, as far as he knew. He opened the door and let Adelaide walk in ahead of him. His eyes scanned the small space looking for Mandy. When he didn't find her at any of the tables or couches, he decided to grab a seat himself. Just then, the espresso machine in the back of the room behind the counter kicked on and drew his attention. There, he spotted Mandy donning a maroon apron with the B and J logo across the front. She worked here. He could have sworn she said something about a daycare. Well, this was going to be a bust. She caught his eye and gestured for him to come up to the counter. He grabbed Adelaide's hand and ushered her to the counter. He supposed they both had things the other didn't know. 
Mandy's smile was warm and inviting as she placed the mug on the counter in front of another guest and made her way to them. And who is this beautiful princess? He marveled at the way Mandy immediately treated Adelaide with such kindness. Adelaide tucked her chin to her chest shyly, but grinned. Garrett spoke up, this is my niece, Adelaide. Adelaide, this is Miss Amanda. It's very nice to meet you, Princess Adelaide. You can call me Mandy. Adelaide giggled at the title dot. Garrett looked around the space and then returned his gaze to Mandy. I didn't know you worked here. Oh, I don't actually. My friend owns the place and sometimes I fill in if she is shorthanded. She laughed lightly at the small misunderstanding. But, the lunch rush is mostly over, and I am free to go. Or stay, as it were. Before she was officially off duty, however, she took their drink orders and prepared the hot chocolate for Adelaide, tea for Garrett, and a caramel latte for herself. Shall we? She gestured them to an empty table along the wall. Dot. Garrett handed Adelaide his phone, open to one of the games he had downloaded for her. He quickly discovered his phone was the easiest way to keep Adelaide quiet and distracted for any length of time. He thought he saw a small glimpse of disapproval flash across Mandy's face but chose to ignore it. He was trying his best. So how have you been? She blew across the top of her drink and waved a hand. Oh, you know how it is. Just the normal day today. How about you? She looked up at him expectantly. Garrett knew he needed to tell her everything. But he didn't want to. He wanted this to be just another date, uncomplicated, exciting, and pressure-free. Or at least filled with the good kind of pressure, trying to impress the person across the table and wondering if it would be inappropriate to go in for a goodbye kiss. But his life was none of those things any longer. Especially uncomplicated. He took a deep breath and began. He told her about receiving the call about his brother's death. He looked pointedly at Adelaide. Mandy's face was an open book, filled with shock and sorrow as he told the story. She murmured the usual comment, and even reached across the table to grasp his hand. Dot. That touch brought back all the connection he felt when he first met Mandy. There was something here, something he wasn't sure he had ever experienced. But another glance at Adelaide reminded him of all the reasons this needed to stay platonic. He removed his hand from hers to take a drink of coffee. He then broached the subject that was the catalyst for this meeting altogether. To be honest, I don't know anything about kids. I am utterly out of my league here. I don't really know anyone in the area yet, and I just really need some help. I haven't been to work in ten days, since I got the call about my brother. I've got to figure something out. Mandy shifted away from where she was leaning across the table toward him. The warm smile on her face now replaced with a cool, business-like expression. It wasn't unkind, but there was definitely a wall where there had previously been only openness. What do you need? Garrett sighed and ran his fingers through his hair. That's the problem. I don't even know what I need. I guess I need someone to watch Adelaide so I can work. I need someone to teach me how to do her hair. I just feel like I'm floundering here. I'm going crazy just being with her all day. And that's not her fault. It's mine. I'm not daddy material. Mandy hesitated and looked to the ceiling in thought. Actually, I might be able to help. I just had someone leave the daycare and could give Adelaide that spot. Garrett's eyes widened and he smiled broadly. Seriously? That would be great. I sort of just thought I would get a recommendation or the names of the few places. But if I could send her to someone I trust, I wouldn't feel so bad. You trust me? She spoke softly and with obvious surprise. Dot. Garrett considered her question. It was true he barely knew her. But there was something about Mandy that seemed genuine and refreshing. He knew she was trustworthy. I know we just met, but yes, I trust you. This time, he reached across the table to grab her hand. Thank you, Amanda. 
Mandy squirmed uncomfortably and removed her hands from his. The remainder of their non-date, Mandy spent focused on Adelaide. By the time it was time to leave, Adelaide was sitting in Mandy's lap, chattering away excitedly. The phone was a forgotten prop discarded on the table. Garrett had not seen Adelaide talk this much, ever. He sipped his now lukewarm tea and watched them. This was going to be great. Having a daycare meant he could go back to work. It was a win-win for him and Addie. Mandy left the bistro after her date with mixed emotions. On one hand, it seemed a relationship with Garrett would not be happening after all. Which totally sucked because she really liked him. The smallest touch from him lit a spark in her and he was funny, charming, and of so handsome. If he wasn't interested, she didn't want to torture herself by seeing him ever again. On the other hand, she wanted to help him. He looked exhausted when she saw him and seemed almost desperate as he asked her for help. Adelaide was adorable, as most four-year-old little girls are, and Mandy's heart broke for the way her little world turned upside down deal. Wanting to help Garrett, however, didn't make it hurt any less. He hadn't called her after they met because he wasn't interested. He only called out of desperation. What was it about her that made her everyone's go-to person when they had nowhere else to turn? And why did she always say yes? She tried to tell herself she was just being a good Christian. Taking care of the widows and orphans. Whatever happened or hadn't happened with Garrett, Adelaide deserved someone to nurture her. Someone to do more than hand her their phone to keep her quiet. There was a quiet little sadness about the little girl. She barely said a word until Mandy coaxed some smiles out of her towards the end. It was understandable, of course, having just lost her parents, but it didn't make it any easier to watch. Garrett admitted he was out of his league. The little girl's tangled hair and mismatched outfit testified as much. Dot. As hard as it was when a child from the daycare went elsewhere, Mandy was grateful she had an opening to offer Dr. Pike for Adelaide. Usually, she had a waiting list three to four months long. She just let Dr. Pike skip to the top of the list. Her motives for doing so were ones she didn't want to examine too closely. When she said Adelaide could come to her daycare, his smile lit up his entire face and gave her the most satisfying warmth in her chest. She tried to tell herself she would have done the same for anyone in his situation. Surely it wasn't just his rich, chocolate brown eyes and tousled brown hair or his athletic frame clouding her judgment. Dot. Whatever the reason, Adelaide would start on Monday. Mandy prayed the little girl would find refuge with her and make friends easily with the other children. It was always hard for kids on their first day, but these were extenuating circumstances. Mandy was determined to help Adelaide, and therefore Garrett, but not get involved beyond that. She could not let herself fall for Dr. Pike. Chapter 9 Mandy hung the sign on the door that said Little Steps Daycare at 7, signaling she was open. Garrett was already waiting in the driveway with Adelaide. He pulled the sleepy girl out of the car and walked her to the door as Mandy held it open. He was dressed in slacks and a button-down, a look Mandy had never seen him in before. She was trying not to stare, but there was just something about a well-dressed man. Wasn't that how the song went? Mandy greeted Adelaide and although the girl clung to her uncle's leg, she looked around the playroom with interest. Mandy tried to guess what she would be interested in and settled on offering the barn and set of farm animals. When Adelaide was sufficiently distracted, Mandy turned to Garrett again. I will send you a couple of updates throughout the day. But I think she's going to do great. Thanks again for doing this. What time do you close? Garrett looked at his watch for what seemed like the tenth time. Deep. Mandy tried not to let her irritation show. I close at six. But I, Mandy started to add her opinion that it would be better for Adelaide to be picked up around the time most of the other kids were. It would be hard for her to see everyone else going home and be stuck waiting. Garrett, however, didn't give her a chance to finish. Dot. Sounds good. I will see you then. And just like that, he was out the door.
Mandy blankly watched him back out of the driveway as another parent pulled in. Here we go. Dot. For her first day, Adelaide did awesome. Judging by her social skills and her knowledge of letters, numbers, and days of the week, Mandy thought she must have attended a daycare or preschool before moving here. That made her transition so much easier. Mandy sent Garrett several pictures of Adelaide throughout the day, playing, doing her craft, even napping. She received no response from Dr. Pike. At 3.30 parents began showing up for their children. By 5, it was down to only 3. And by 20 to 6, Adelaide was the only one left. Is Unca Garrett coming back? Adelaide asked sadly. Of course he is, sweetie. He will be here very soon. Mandy hated to see the doubt in Adelaide's little eyes. When will he be here? Mandy checked her phone. It was 5.58. She was growing more and more upset. At 6 on the dot, she texted Garrett. Hey, where are you? She saw ellipses appear to signal that Garrett was typing. GP, just left, be there in 20 minutes. Dot. Mandy fumed. She wanted to let Dr. Pike have a piece of her mind when he got here. But she knew she wouldn't. She hated confrontation, and even if she did work up the nerve, she didn't want to call him out in front of Adelaide. Instead, when Garrett and Adelaide were nearly out the door Mandy came up behind them and started to retrieve her daycare sign, signaling she was closed. Dot. Garrett? I close at six. She spoke softly and attempted to sound firm, but kind. Dot. He gave a curt nod and took Adelaide to the car. Dot. If only that solved the problem. Garrett continued to push the boundaries. Mornings were easier because she simply did not unlock the door until it was time to open. But the evenings were more difficult. For a day or two, he managed to arrive a minute or two before six. Then, on Thursday, he was late again. Dot. I'm so sorry, Amanda. I really don't mean to do this to you. It's just that I'm so behind at work after taking two weeks off, and I need to catch up. I even tried taking Adelaide to the office with me after I picked her up last night, but it didn't work so well. She was running through the halls and trying to open all the file cabinets. He laughed. Mandy smiled, unable to help herself. She imagined Garrett trying to corral the young girl while trying to do paperwork. It's okay. Garrett flashed a grateful grin at her response and gathered Adelaide in his arms. We will see you tomorrow. Mandy just nodded and closed the door behind them with a sigh. She wanted to help, truly she did. She thought of Adelaide and remembered the way the little girl spoke up during their lesson on transportation that morning. The kids were learning all about buses and trains and airplanes and cars. Adelaide got very excited and explained to everyone about how helicopters have a propeller to help them fly. She spun her fingers around and made whoosh-whoosh noises to emphasize her point. Mandy smiled at the memory and decided to change her mindset. She would be grateful for every minute she got to spend with Adelaide and was determined to use it to show the little girl how much Jesus loved her dot. That was Mandy's goal for her daycare. She had the privilege of shaping little hearts. Teaching them to pray before lunch, talking about Jesus in the manger at Christmas, and soon, Jesus rising from the grave at Easter. There were families in her daycare who went to church and families who didn't. Which was another reason she ran the daycare the way she did. She used her role as daycare provider to bring families together and build relationships with them. Pretty soon it would be time for the annual Easter egg hunt. The events where the families attended with their kids were her favorite. She made a mental reminder to tell Garrett about the Easter party. It would be good for him to come and meet the parents of Adelaide's new friends. She just hoped he would make the time to do it. Garrett felt like he was on the verge of drowning, just barely keeping his head above water. After one week at the daycare, he was no closer to being caught up on work than when he left. You would think not seeing patients would mean less paperwork while when he was gone. That just didn't seem to be the case. 
and Adelaide? He was out of his depth with her. He saw flashes of the happy, carefree girl he knew. Mostly, though, she was quiet with him, reserved, and constantly seeking assurance he wasn't going anywhere. She seemed to take to Mandy extremely well, which was great. It didn't exactly give Garrett a huge boost of confidence heading into the weekend, where he would have two full day with Adelaide. She still showed up to daycare with her curls a tangled mess. It surprised Garrett the first day and he picked Adelaide up in two neatly braided pigtails. Since then, it became routine. One day it was pigtails, the next a perky ponytail held with a colorful bracelet thing Adelaide informed him was called a scrunchie. He was tempted to leave Friday afternoon's hairstyle in place until Monday morning. It would be much easier. When he tried to brush Adelaide's hair, it only ended in tears of frustration, for at least one of them. Sometimes on the verge of both dot. Not a day went by Garrett didn't think about his brother. They competed in everything. Sports, school, or even in who had broken the most bones, Michael won that one, with his three broken arms and a broken collarbone during his school years. There had been nothing more important to Michael than family, especially Adelaide. Garrett often wondered if Michael was looking down on him from heaven, shaking his head in disappointment. Sometimes, Garrett was positive he would be looking down with laughter, especially when Garrett was attempting to do what should be simple things, like installing the car seat or picking out an outfit for Adelaide. And the negotiating. Adelaide had an opinion on everything and was constantly trying to negotiate with her uncle. Why don't you go read a book, Addie? He would suggest dot. No, I play on your phone and you read a book. And then there was the constant, just one more show, or at dinner, can I have ice cream if I eat all my nuggets? Frankly, it was just exhausting to repeat the same thing ten times. He didn't know how Mandy did it all day. It was nowhere near as hard, though, as explaining to Adelaide that her parents were gone and were never coming back. She experienced enough overnight visits with her grandparents to initially assume their absence was no different than another weekend getaway. It wasn't until they carefully packed her clothes, toys, and books into boxes and then unpacked them at Garrett's tiny apartment above the garage that she realized something was very wrong. In fact, much of her stuff was still in boxes. There just wasn't room for it in the small space. Night after night, he could hear Adelaide crying after he put her to bed. Often, she woke up and instinctively called out for mommy. Her small bed was close to his, and the small, scared voice in the middle of the night nearly broke his heart. He just didn't know how to help. Should he take her to a counselor? Probably. But when? He couldn't take off work. His days were already shortened trying to drop her off and pick her up at daycare. And since she went to bed before nine, they barely had time to heat up whatever prepackaged convenience food from the freezer section he had on hand, take a shower, and read a few books before going to bed. Their apartment was only one room plus a bathroom. Once Adelaide was in bed, Garrett was pretty much forced to be in bed as well. He hadn't been for a run since the day he got the phone call. He was going stir-crazy. The weather this weekend was supposed to be nice, though, and he planned to go for a run with Adelaide in her stroller. He hoped she wasn't too old for it. He grabbed the stroller from his brother's garage, not knowing. When he mentioned the idea to Adelaide, she shrugged. Apathy. How could someone be both apathetic and entirely opinionated at the same time? He wasn't sure, but apparently four-year-olds had that innate ability. He was packing a couple of sandwiches with chips and fruit in a makeshift picnic basket and Adelaide wandered over to him. Uncle Garrett? She inquired softly. Can Miss Mandy come to the park with us? Oh, Addie, I'm sure Miss Mandy has something else to do today. Are you sure? Well, no. But it is really last minute. He tried to reason with the small girl. When he looked at her, though, her wide eyes looked at him accusingly. Okay, I'll tell you what I will text her. But don't be surprised if she says no. Addie cheered. Garrett sighed and pulled out his cell phone. GP, 
If you don't have plans today, Adelaide and I would love you to join us for a picnic in the park. Garrett sent the text message and was surprised to see the indication that Mandy was typing a reply almost immediately. A.E., I would love that. When and where? Garrett supplied the name of a nearby park in Greencastle and gave Adelaide the good news. The little girl was thrilled, and Garrett couldn't help but be a little excited as well. There was something about Mandy. She was pretty, that fact had struck him the night they met at the doctor's office. But there was more than that. Each day when he dropped Adelaide off or picked her up, he saw the warmth and kindness Mandy showered upon his niece. He wished she would greet him with the same warm smile, but she hadn't since the meeting at the coffee shop. She was cordial, polite. But reserved. She welcomed Adelaide each morning with open arms, and he wondered briefly what it would be like to fall into that same embrace each night after work. Garrett dismissed the fantasy with a shake of his head and began to prepare a third sandwich for their picnic. His dream for a jog was replaced with an outing at the park to let Adelaide play on the slides and swing. Hopefully, there would be some other children for her to interact with. That would give him a chance to talk with Mandy, one on one. Maybe he could break down the wall she put up between them. He didn't take the time to evaluate whether removing that wall was a good idea. Chapter 10 Adelaide played tag on the large playground with several other children, their laughter complimenting the bright, cheery day perfectly. Garrett and Mandy sat on a blanket in the sun. Garrett, naturally, never gave a thought to bringing about blanket with him, but Mandy, always prepared, had one in the trunk of her car. The simple lunch he prepared was long gone, as were the homemade cookies Mandy contributed. Lunch was nice, but most of the conversation was supplied by Adelaide, chattering away in her excitement to be with both of them and outside. Since Adelaide ran off to play, conversation was stilted. Garrett struggled to bridge the connection. He asked Mandy the usual questions, how did she like her job? Did she have any siblings? Mandy's answers were friendly, but short. Nothing too deep. She asked the same questions in return. He grew frustrated with the coolness of Mandy's demeanor. He remembered the genuine, warm, and slightly flirtatious woman he confronted at the doctor's office and seen briefly behind the counter at the bistro in Minden. He tried to figure out what happened to change that. Finally, he had to ask Dot. Seriously, have I done something wrong? I feel like you are holding me at a distance. He tried to convey his disappointment with his eyes as they locked on Mandy's dot. Mandy looked away. What? No, of course, not. What makes you say that? Nothing in particular, I guess. Garrett began to doubt himself. Maybe he was imagining it. Maybe this was how Mandy was with her friends. That was all they could be anyway, friends. Look. I really am sorry about being late all those nights. I really am trying. I know, Mandy nodded, it's not that. Garrett could see in her eyes that even though it wasn't that he had been late, there was something dot. If not that, then what is it? I really want us to be friends. You are clearly important to Adelaide, even after such a short time. It's just, Mandy started and then paused. She started again. I guess at first I thought there was, maybe something more between us. But then, you didn't call. And then you did call, and I was really excited. But you just needed a daycare. And I understand. She shook her head lightly and straightened a wrinkle on the blanket. I am having a hard time taking you out of one box and putting you into another. We should definitely be friends. It might take me a little while to get there when I was originally hoping for something more. Mandy looked up at him briefly, having given her monologue mostly to her hands as they now picked crumbs from the blanket. Dot. Garrett grimaced and closed his eyes for a moment. Of course. He hurried to reassure her. I really did mean to call, after we met. I felt like there was something more, too. But then everything with Michael happened, and now there's Adelaide. And I can't date anyone. I have to focus on my work and on Adelaide. 
that's all I have room for. He saw Mandy nodding and reached to grab her hand, I really did want to call. Mandy took a deep breath and looked up at him again. It's okay, truly. We can be friends. I don't date fathers from the daycare, anyway. Then, Mandy stood up and went to help Adelaide across the monkey bars, leaving Garrett to his thoughts. She didn't date fathers from the daycare. Did that mean other dads had tried to date her? Was he a dad? He supposed he was, although he couldn't see ever referring to himself as such, or Adelaide coming to see him that way. He wasn't her dad, and he couldn't let her forget his brother. He didn't like the idea of Mandy's dating someone else. But they were friends, now, right? He could look out for her. He could make sure whoever she dated was good enough. Since it wouldn't be him. He tried not to focus on how much that bothered him. Mandy escaped the imaginary confines of the picnic blanket, where the proximity to Garrett was far too close for comfort. She celebrated her restraint during her confession, no tears. Her eyes were stinging as she explained the difficulty with which she was trying to accept her seemingly eternal role as friend, not girlfriend. She hadn't dated anyone since Ryan, but whenever she was interested, it seemed she was constantly relegated to her little box. A box she imagined plainly labeled a friend in worn-out Sharpie. It should have helped to hear that Garrett initially thought of her as someone to date. It didn't, though. It almost made it worse. Was he just saying that to reassure her? Wouldn't that be humiliating, she mused. She threw out the excuse that she didn't date fathers from the daycare. As though that was a long-standing rule. The truth was, it had never come up. She had some divorced families at the daycare, but none of the dads ever even crossed her mind as potential dates, and apparently, the feeling was mutual. She had never been hit on by a daycare dad. Yet, she'd stated her a rule of firmly before seizing the moment to retreat to a less uncomfortable place. For her, that meant surrounding herself with kids. They were open and rambunctious and didn't hide their feelings. And they lived entirely in the moment. They swirled around her on the playground, a mass of movement and color, with no worry about tomorrow. She helped Adelaide across the monkey bars and accepted an exuberant high five of celebration. Mandy watched her run fearlessly across the park and up the ladder toward the slide tower. It was better this way. He needed to make Adelaide his priority. It irked her that he listed work before the little girl in his list of commitments, but she prayed it was simply a poor word choice. Obviously, Garrett loved his work, he was a doctor. It was important work. She just hoped he realized how much Adelaide needed him. There were other doctors for his patients. He was all the family Adelaide had left. Mandy promised herself she would do everything she could to help Garrett be successful in his role as guardian. He asked for her help, nearly begged for it. And Lord knows she couldn't say no. To anyone, as a matter of fact. That thought reminded her she needed to be heading out soon. The children's director at church asked Mandy to help prepare all the supplies for the Sunday school rooms this week, in addition to her normal weekly role of teaching the class of four- and five-year-olds. Mandy hadn't wanted to say yes, but didn't have an excuse at the time. It was becoming worse and worse. It started with teaching once a month. Then filling in last minute as the other teachers were gone. Finally, Jessica asked her to be the teacher every week. Now, she was roped into carefully preparing craft supplies and activities for all the classrooms. She needed to tell Jessica this was a one-time thing. But she knew she wouldn't. All the commitments helped fill her schedule. And they were all important things that needed done. She could do them. God wanted her to do them, right? Chapter 11 Easter was two weeks after their day at the park. Mandy remembered to tell Garrett about the party for the daycare, happening the weekend before Easter, on Saturday. She was always excited about the events where the entire family of her daycare kids were involved. She hid eggs all around her yard, different colors for different age groups. 
Most of the older kids would understand the yellow eggs they saw in very easy-to-find places were for the one- and two-year-olds to find. She filled the eggs with some candy, but mostly other surprises, bouncy balls, sticky hands, and lots of stickers. Some of them contained pieces of paper representing larger prizes, bubbles, coloring books, and bracelets. Before the egg hunt, the parents helped their child plant seeds in a pot they could take home to watch it grow. She planted one for the daycare as well, so they could talk about it as a group. There were a couple of other activities as well and lots of treats. The kids had been practicing a couple of songs to perform for their parents. They yelled more than they sang, and Mandy stood in front to do the actions along with them, but the parents looked on with laughter and adoration as their kids proudly performed for the small audience. Next, Mandy had everyone participate in a bunny version of the Hokey Pokey, which had the kids rolling with laughter as their parents put pride aside and put their bunny tails in and out. Finally, it was time for the egg hunt and then snacks. All the official activities would be complete, and Mandy could relax from her role as master of ceremonies. She lined the kids up on the edge of the patio as they impatiently waited with baskets to fill with plastic eggs. On your marks. Get set. Go, she yelled. The parents cheered. Parents of the smallest children gently nudged them toward the victory of the yellow eggs, responding enthusiastically when their child picked it up with amazement at their own accomplishment. The older kids yelled at their parents from across the yard. I found one right here. Mommy, I found a purple one. It was behind the rock, but I found it. I want to open it. I found a green one, Daddy. Green is my favorite. I got a Mickey Mouse sticker. Mandy watched Adelaide run up to Garrett. He looked away from his phone and, Mandy was pleased to see, engaged with the young girl in her excitement about the eggs she found. But, the moment Adelaide ran off again, Garrett's face returned to his phone. He didn't see Adelaide trip and fall, spilling her basket of eggs across the grass. Adelaide started to cry. Mandy rushed to the young girl and began to comfort her. A glance back toward Garrett revealed he had yet to notice the scene unfolding before him. Mandy rolled her eyes. Here sweetie, let's get all your eggs picked up and back in your basket. How is your knee? Adelaide sniffed. Sake. They picked up the eggs together and placed them back in Adelaide's basket. Mandy? I don't want to find any more eggs. That's really good. I was going to say something anyway, Mandy replied with forced cheerfulness. You already found so many eggs, you better leave some for your friends. Yeah, I better leave some for my friends. Adelaide replied softly, clinging to the excuse offered by Mandy. They walked over to Garrett together, who looked up as they approached. He immediately noticed the red eyes and tear-stained cheeks of his niece. His eyes shifted to Mandy, full of questions. She fell. But she's fine, aren't you, sweetie? Adelaide nodded. Mandy returned her gaze to Garrett's and gave him a wink. Plus, she already found so many eggs, we decided she needed to leave some for her friends to find, too. Just to keep it fair. Garrett knelt down in front of Adelaide and pulled her in for a hug. Well, then. Let's go get some juice and then open these eggs up to see what you got. He shot a grateful glance back at Mandy. She flexed her fist where it had been clenched by her side. Garrett reacted in exactly the right way, once she and Adelaide got his attention, anyway. But he was so absorbed in his phone he didn't even notice his niece falling and crying. How hard was it to take two hours off to spend time with such a sweet girl? They were talking about Easter at the daycare. Infusing Christian principles into the activities and lessons excited Mandy. Addie melted her heart with her interpretation of Easter. Baby Jesus came alive again. Mandy patiently explained how Easter celebrated something that happened after baby Jesus was all grown up, but yes, he came alive again and that was the most amazing thing. When she relayed the story to Garrett, he shook his head and smiled. 
When I was little, I thought we were talking about the Easter Bunny when we said the whole, he is risen, he is risen, indeed, thing. I just figured he slept the rest of the year and only woke up on Easter. My mother about fainted when I asked our pastor about it. My brother put me up to it. He grew quiet and his eyes shifted to Adelaide, waiting in her light pink jacket and rainbow leggings for him to lead her to the car. Hesitantly, Mandy extended an invitation for them to join her at church for Easter. Mandy woke up early this morning for sunrise service. It was one of her favorite traditions from when she was a girl. Church started early, outside if the Indiana weather allowed it, and was followed by breakfast for the entire congregation. For whatever reason, even though church was much more casual these days on a normal Sunday, and Mandy didn't think anything of wearing jeans and a nice shirt, Easter Sunday remained special. The little girls dressed in fluffy pastel dresses and the little boys in little suits with clip-on ties were running around the fellowship hall, their faces sticky with cinnamon roll icing. The deaconesses served those cinnamon rolls alongside egg casseroles and refilled the large coffee servers as the rest of the church family enjoyed the celebration. Garrett seemed open to the idea, but she hadn't seen them this morning. Probably working, the thought came with a sarcastic bite uncharacteristic of her. Shaking her head to rid herself of the negativity, she pulled herself back into the moment. It wasn't her business whether Garrett took his niece to church on Easter. Garrett pulled a ruffled purple dress from the curtain rod acting as Adelaide's closet. Do you know what today is? When his niece shook her head, he added, it's Easter. Adelaide gasped dramatically. She bounced up and down in excitement, Easter. Where did he leave it? Where did who leave what? The Easter bunny comes on Easter, silly. He brings a basket full of candy and stickers and eggs and toys and candy. In excitement, her list repeated. Garrett felt his heart sink into the pit of his stomach. The Easter Bunny? Oh, no. This was bad. He forgot about the Easter basket. Where did he leave it? He knows I'm here, right? Oh no, what if he left it at my old house? His mind raced for an answer. I, um. Maybe the Easter Bunny is just a little late. Maybe your Easter basket will be here after church. Oh, okay. Adelaide's shoulders slumped slightly. You don't think he forgot about me, do you? Of course not. You are absolutely unforgettable, Addie. I'm sure he is just taking his time to make it extra special for you. Addie nodded in agreement and grabbed the dress from his hands to go get dressed. Garrett sighed. His head tipped back, his eyes focusing on the ceiling. He'd bought himself an hour, maybe two. But how would he sneak away to get things for her basket? They were headed to church, and then. Church. The realization came to him. There was Sunday school or something, right? He could drop Adelaide off, then he could run to get Easter basket supplies and be back to pick her up before she even knew he was gone. He initially planned to join Mandy at church as invited, but instead, they could go to a church in Greencastle. He was sure they had childcare and he would be close enough to track down a store. He didn't know what would be open on Easter morning, but there had to be something. A gas station at the very least. He filled out the guest registration at the desk for the children's programs at the church, carefully writing down his phone number and indicating he'd like a text message notification if he was needed. He glanced down at Adelaide, holding his left hand and tucked close to his leg. She rubbed her cheek with her shoulder and fingered her skirt. Her eyes jumped between various groups of rambunctious kids obviously familiar with the space. He bent his knees and squatted to bring himself eye to eye with his niece. He spoke in a quiet voice, close enough to hear despite the chaos around them. You are going to have a great time, Addie. There are lots of other kids and fun activities for you to do. And I can't wait for you to tell me all about it, okay? She bit her lip and rubbed her cheek against her shoulder again. She nodded slowly. When he opened his arms for a hug, she went into his arms and laid her head on his shoulder. 
he kissed the crown of her head. The volunteer who checked them in came around the table. I love your dress, Adelaide. I bet it is a good twirling dress. Can you show me a twirl? Adelaide hesitated and then untangled herself from Garrett's embrace. She twirled slowly and the volunteer clapped. So pretty. I can take you to your class, I bet your teacher would love to see you twirl, too. The enthusiasm of the volunteer was exactly what Adelaide needed. Garrett was reminded of Mandy. She had that same way, with kids, a natural connection. She was able to make Addie feel at home at the bistro, just as this woman made her comfortable here. He watched Addie walk away, the soft pink ribbon of her dress tied haphazardly into a bow at her waist. Her hair was already beginning to tangle after he'd painstakingly brushed it out this morning. Her little hand was tucked into the volunteer's hand and she glanced back at him. She waved over her shoulder and he held up a hand in return. Easter basket. Now, he had a mission to complete. His niece deserved the best Easter basket ever. He had no idea how he was going to make that happen with such short notice, but he was sure going to try. Garrett walked in the door of the truck stop with low expectations. The grocery store didn't open until 6 p.m. tonight and he was forced to drive the few miles to the interstate interchange to the 24-hour truck stop. Hallelujah. Garrett couldn't contain his relief. There, next to the wire rack with $5 DVDs and a selection of bumper stickers was an entire display of Easter-themed merchandise. Apparently, he wasn't the only father doing their Easter shopping at a truck stop. Of course, the others were probably actual truckers, he mused. He found a small pink basket, already filled with the annoying fake grass he remembered from his own Easter baskets. He grabbed a small stuffed rabbit and a package of plastic eggs. On the other side of the display, he found Easter-themed candy. He grabbed chocolate eggs, chocolate bunnies, and gummy flowers. He grabbed some sort of fruit-flavored chewy candy as well. Debating whether it would be enough, he gauged the size of the basket to the selection of sweets he grabbed. What else could he put in the basket? He looked around the store. What had Addie said? Candy in eggs and stickers. Stickers. He looked back at the bumper stickers. After debating, he decided it couldn't hurt to take a look. The odds were slim he would find anything remotely suitable, but Addie did love stickers. He shook his head as he flipped through the stacks of patriotic, humorous, or offensive stickers and found one that simply said, Jesus loves you. It wasn't exactly the Easter Bunny, but it would have to do. The cashier raised an eyebrow as the pile of Easter stuff waterfalled from his arms onto the counter. Feeling as though he needed to explain, he admitted to the older woman, the Easter Bunny is running a little late today. Hmm, was all she said until giving him his total and bagging his purchase. He drove back to the church, fingers tapping on the steering wheel while he was forced to wait at a red light or two. When he returned to church, he scanned the parking lot and relaxed and he saw it remained full and the doors to the building were closed. He quickly arranged the Easter basket while sitting in the parking lot and placed the basket in Addie's car seat where she would be sure to see it when she opened the door. Then, he strolled back into the church as though he showed up 25 minutes late to church all the time. Chapter 12 Adelaide raved about church and her Easter basket on Monday morning. Mandy was glad the little girl had such a good holiday but couldn't help but wonder why Garrett hadn't attended her church. Maybe he already had a good church home. Of course, if he did, wouldn't he have had other people to help with Adelaide when she came to live with him? It didn't make sense. Monday afternoon, Garrett told her the story of the Easter Bunny's last-minute trip to the truck stop. He was an excellent storyteller, exaggerating all the right parts and reenacting Adelaide's dramatic reactions to both finding out the Easter Bunny hadn't come in the morning and her delight that he sneaked the basket into the car during church. He even apologized, admitting he intended them to join her at Minden Baptist, but the impromptu shopping trip necessitated a church closer to home. Each evening, Mandy relished in the few minutes he was in her home picking up Adelaide. In the mornings, when he was rushed and focused on dropping off so he could get to work. 
In the evenings, however, he lingered. He walked in, often several minutes after Little Steps was officially closed. He asked Adelaide about her day and looked to Mandy to fill in the details he couldn't quite interpret from Addie's excited tales. He asked Mandy how her day was, as well. Sometimes he told her a funny story about a patient, the overcautious parents of a newborn, calling about green poop or the woman who thought her headaches were being caused by her cell phone next to her bed. Before he left, he would always turn back to Mandy as she watched them leave and give her a genuine, thank you for watching Addie today, Amanda. His insistence on calling her Amanda made her heart dance. It felt intimate, though in fact it was more formal. Only her mom called her Amanda. Mandy even asked her to call her Mandy once, but her mother insisted. I named you Amanda, not Mandy. On Wednesday, he walked in the daycare entrance to her house at 5.15, well before she closed. Addie was still the only child remaining and Mandy looked at him, her eyes and mouth wide with pretend horror. Oh no. Is everything okay? Are you sick? She couldn't hold the facade and cracked the fake expression replaced with a genuine smile. Ha! 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 He said dryly. Very funny. I'm always late, I know, I know. He rolled his eyes. Dot. Well, it's not funny if you explain the joke, she pointed out with a raised eyebrow. Seriously, though, what are you doing here so early? It was a nice change, but she was suspicious. Actually, I wanted to talk to you. He stepped closer. Then, looked down when Addie crashed into his leg stop. Unka Garrett. Hey, Ladybug. Did you have a great day? Mandy's heart melted at the nickname and watching him interact. Curiosity got the better of her and when Addie trailed off during her explanation of the day's events, she spoke up. What did you want to talk to me about? Garrett watched Adelaide attempting to get her shoes on by herself. What? Oh. I was just wondering if you'd like to come over on Friday night. Mandy inhaled sharply. A date? She'd imagined this moment a dozen times in the last three weeks. In her daydreams, she wasn't in sweatpants and a t-shirt sporting a very obvious spit-up stain courtesy of Miles' last bottle. Garrett continued, I've got a benefit dinner I need to attend on behalf of the clinic. Lots of big-time donors and all. I don't know who else Addie would be comfortable with, you know? I'll pay you for your time of course. Mandy turned away, busying her hands by picking up some stray blocks and placing them in the appropriate bin. Babysitting. Of course. He didn't want a date. He wanted a babysitter. Her eyes stung and she bit her lip. Her voice was choked when she spoke up, still leaning over the toys. Of course. What time should I be there? She was determined not to look at him until she had control. Garrett gave her the details as he removed Adelaide's jacket from its place in her cubby and put it on. Mandy finished putting away toys and stood, composed enough to see them out the door. She nodded, placed a hand on the open door and held it for them. Sounds like a plan, she forced out in a high voice. See you tomorrow. Bye, Addie. When she closed the door, she leaned against it and the hot blast of air building in her chest exploded out in a rush, almost a sob. She felt so stupid. Once again, she'd gotten her hopes up, thinking Garrett might want something more from her. But no, like everyone else, he just needed her help and her friendship. On Friday night, she followed Garrett and Addie from the daycare to their house in Greencastle. Garrett stopped to pick up pizza on the way and he carried it up the stairs into the apartment above the garage as Mandy and Addie followed behind. Mandy studied the small space. Her cheeks reddened slightly, seeing Garrett's unmade bed on one wall. The rumpled navy blue sheets made her imagine a sleep-rumpled Garrett looking at her as the sun streamed through the windows. She coughed away the thought and focused on Addie's pink blanket, curled up next to his pillow, as though she crawled up with him in the night. It's not much, but it will do for now. 
I'm working on finding a place for Addie and I that is more suitable. I didn't plan on. He trailed off, his meaning evident. He never planned on taking care of Addie. It's great, Garrett. You are doing a great job, you know that right? She doesn't need a big house. She just needs someone who loves her. Mandy watched him closely, trying to read something in those big, brown eyes. Garrett cleared his throat. Yeah, well. This is it for now. Here's the pizza, I'm going to change and get ready to head out. He grabbed a couple of hangers from the closet and took them into the bathroom. When he emerged, he was wearing a new button-down shirt and tie with a well-fitted suit jacket and slacks. Mandy's throat went dry and her hands went still where they were in the process of cutting grapes for Addie. She watched Garrett cross the room and kiss Addie on the head as she sat at the table with pizza sauce already smeared on her cheeks. Mandy could smell the woodsy sandalwood of his cologne. That was new. And boy, was that nice. She wanted to curl up on his shoulder like a tabby cat and do nothing but breathe in the scent of it on his skin. All right, I'm out of here. You be good, Addie. He walked directly toward Mandy. She simply watched him, unable to do anything else. Her mind was a complete dead zone, like the spot out at the Bloom's farm by the swimming hole where cell signal just ceased to exist, and the entire world could end without you knowing. Nothing. He was close, only a foot away. Saying something. What was he saying? She stared at his mouth and tried to catch up. Dot. Amanda? Are you okay? He looked concerned. Probably because she looked like someone having a seizure. What? I'm fine. I said, let me know if you need anything. I'm just over in Terre Haute and I can be back in an hour if anything happens. Got it. He was still close. Why was he so close? Her heart raced as he reached an arm toward her hip. She realized he wanted a hug and moved quickly, covering the last bit of space between them and wrapping her arms around him. She pressed her face to his shoulder and stole one last deep breath of his cologne. He stiffened slightly and patted her back with his left hand. Then, she felt him relax and return her embrace. See you later, Amanda. She heard something scrape against the counter behind her and opened one eye toward the noise. His keys. He was reaching for his keys behind her. Mortified, she pulled away and tried her best to act casual, continuing to slice grapes. A tingle spread up the back of her neck and across her face. She cleared her throat and choked out, have a great time. We'll be fine, won't we Addie? Mandy shifted her focus to Adelaide, as she often did when she was uncomfortable. He just wanted his keys, and she hugged him. She refused to look at him and busied herself serving the grapes and getting milk out of the fridge for Adelaide. Finally, Garrett was out the door and she took a deep breath, her shoulders dropping and her eyes drifting to the ceiling. She couldn't remember ever being so embarrassed. What was she thinking? But, she remembered that one glorious moment, when Garrett returned her hug and before she heard him reach for her keys. His arm around her and her head against his chest felt like heaven. This entire situation, being in his home, taking care of his child, hugging him, goodbye, it was everything she ever wanted. Everything she prayed for since college, and what she wanted so badly to be true with Ryan. Then again, Garrett didn't give her any indication he felt more for her than friendship and gratitude. A hug wasn't anything to get worked up over, she reminded herself. She forced herself to return her attention to Adelaide, enjoying her dinner at the bar across from her. She smiled at the sweet girl. Addie needed her. So did Garrett. She just needed to show him. She could be everything he needed, and she could have the family she always wanted. Chapter 13 Mandy was reading on her phone and heard the door open softly. It was after eleven, and Garrett put a finger to his lips as he sneaked in quietly so as not to wake up Adelaide. He kicked off his shoes and she started to gather her things. 
She already picked up toys with Addie and washed the dishes after dinner, the dishwasher still hummed quietly in the background. He came close, whispering a greeting in the darkness, the dim light above the stove providing the only light in the apartment. He smelled just as good as before he left for the dinner, but his tie now hung loosely around his neck, and his suit jacket was discarded next to door. How was it tonight? The quiet rasp of his voice made her nearly vibrate in response. She swallowed, tried to keep her voice from squeaking. It was great. You have a great girl, there. The corners of his mouth lifted in response. She is pretty great. She shifted her weight and looked around the small space, searching for something else to say. How was your dinner? There, that was a safe topic. She silently congratulated herself. It was good. I'm glad I was able to get away. She nodded her head. Well, it's late. I better get home. She started to move toward the door, but he stepped into her path and held out his arms. She melted into them. Dot. Thank you, Amanda. I don't deserve how much you've helped us these last few weeks. Then, he pulled back and kissed her cheek lightly. Her eyes drifted shut at the contact. Just as quickly as it had begun, it was over. He placed his hands on her shoulders and gently shifted her beside him and toward the door. Mandy drove home in silence, her usual Christian radio station turned off. She had a great time with Adelaide tonight. It was different than spending time with kids at the daycare. This was homier, more intimate. Serving dinner, reading bedtime stories, helping Adelaide into her pajamas, all of it exactly how Mandy imagined life could have been with Rebecca. And Garrett. Before he got back, she kept trying to tell herself to let it go. She kept repeating that reminder in the form of the ridiculously catchy song from the Disney movie Adelaide insisting on watching, after dinner tonight. Let it go, let him go. She mentally dissected every move she made since meeting Garrett, telling herself he would be an idiot to like someone like her. Then he came home, and she stood mere inches away from him in the dark silence and hugged him again. He hadn't actually said anything earth-shattering, but it felt like something shifted tonight. She lightly touched her cheek where his lips had pressed against it. Later that night, Garrett laid in bed listening to Adelaide breathe, wide awake himself. The benefit dinner had been fine, good even. He met several prominent doctors from Indianapolis and Chicago who traveled in for the event as well as several important donors. His mind had been at home, though. Before he left for the dinner, Mandy hugged him. It was unexpected, to say the least. It was also really nice. For a moment, he lost himself in the embrace and just relished the feeling of holding her in his arms, Addie across from them at the bar. Later, he had hugged her. This time, there was no audience. It was only Amanda, standing close enough for him to smell her jasmine and honey perfume. Their whispers faded, nothing left to say. It felt like the air was alive around him and he was tempted to kiss her as he watched her nervously bite the bottom one. Instead, he hugged her and kissed her cheek and thanked her for coming. It was a mistake, getting attached to Mandy like this. She was his daycare provider, maybe even his friend. He couldn't rely on her any more than that. But oh, how he wanted to. He wanted to rely on her, he wanted to wrap his arms around her and let her tell him he had everything under control. It was selfish, he knew that. He should let her go so she could be happy with someone else. She belonged with someone who deserved her and didn't come with an adopted daughter and an unhealthy addiction to work. Being selfless was never something he had been accused of. She would be a wonderful mother. He wondered if she had ever been close to it all, a husband, kids, the whole package. Why wasn't she happily married with two or three of her own kids taking spots in daycare? There was so much he still didn't know about the lovely Amanda Elliott. Laying there in bed, he officially made it his mission to find out. Chapter 14 on Sunday, Garrett and Adelaide met Mandy at church. Adelaide was safely ensconced at Children's Church and Garrett sat beside Mandy in the pew, 
having flashbacks to church as a kid. This small town church was worlds different from the megachurch he attended in Texas. There, it was easy to be anonymous. Here, everyone in the building seemed to notice him walking in beside Mandy and eyed him with suspicion. Mandy was approached and greeted by no less than 15 different people before service, all unashamedly hinting at their curiosity and wanting an introduction to him. This is Garrett. His niece is new at my daycare and they decided to join me for church today. He must have heard her introduce him with those exact words a dozen times. That was all. His niece attends her daycare. Not boyfriend. Not friend. Just the guardian of one of her charges. As though they hadn't been exchanging text messages all day on Saturday. Messages that grew increasingly flirtatious. GP, thanks again for last night. Addie had a blast. Dot. AE, no problem. But you didn't ask my rates for the evening, and now you owe me $2,000. GP, hmm. I don't have the money. Maybe I can work off my debt. GP, have any heavy lifting you need? AE, I'll think about it. I can always use someone to mow my lawn. GP, I always mow with my shirt off. Is that okay? Tongue sticking out AE, as long as you pretend not to notice me watching through the kitchen window. LOL. Dot. It drove him crazy that she was introducing him as though he was nothing more than another father at the daycare. He was beginning to fall for the sweet, caring, beautiful woman beside him. Was she completely unaffected? He couldn't be sure, but he thought she was as caught in the moment as him when he got home Friday night. Now, he was sitting in a church pew in what he assumed to be the smallest church in Indiana, next to a woman he desperately wanted to throw his arm around like his dad always did with his mom at church. But if his niece goes to my daycare was how Mandy saw him. He imagined it would stir a frenzy of comments in the small church if they saw her snuggled up with him in the pew. Then again, her hand was lying on her leg. Only a few inches from where his rested on his own thigh. He casually moved his program to the other hand and let his right hand reach for hers, giving it a small squeeze and it finally crossed the canyon between them. Garrett was holding her hand. In church. Mandy's brain short-circuited and she immediately forgot what Pastor Justin was saying. This was nice. She returned the squeeze of his hand on hers and pressed her lips together, trying to hide a smile threatening to grow far too large. What would people say? Could Mr. and Mrs. Johnson down the row see Garrett's hand wrapped around her own and resting on her leg? This was a small town and she knew the minute someone suspected there was more to her relationship, it would be whispered through the pews and discussed in the women's restroom after service. There were very few secrets in Minden. Even Mandy's secret wasn't exactly a mystery. She gave birth to a baby during college. She wasn't living in Minden at the time, so some people didn't know, but it wasn't something her family kept hidden. There was a difference between hiding something and simply not talking about it. Tragedy like that didn't come up in casual conversation. It was always hard for Mandy when it did. One of the hardest parts of Mandy's role as a caregiver for toddlers was knowing her own daughter would never achieve some of the same milestones as the children she cared for every day. She cared for other children as they took their first steps, said their first words, eaten their first solid foods, and many of them accidentally called her mommy, out of habit. It became easier over the years, but she still thought of little Rebecca constantly. She dreamt of the life they would have had together. It definitely wouldn't have been perfect. Being a single mother was never Mandy's first choice. As the baby grew inside her, she prepared to be superwoman. She would finish school and get a job and be the best mom to her little girl. But God had other plans. Holding Garrett's hand in church took things a step further and she knew she would need to tell him about Rebecca soon. He made her laugh out loud with his text messages yesterday while she was preparing the Sunday school supplies with Jessica. Jessica gave her a couple of questioning looks, but she lied and said it was her brother, Josh, and then quickly asked God to forgive the small deceit. 
she wasn't ready to admit there might be something more going on with Garrett. It was too tenuous. She felt a bit juvenile admitting she got jittery and excited when she thought about him or when she reread the text messages last night, in bed. She agonized over every word she sent back to him, grateful the playful exchanges were taking place over texts, where she could take her time crafting the perfect response stop. Then, after she finally hit the send button, she stressed out, thinking she crossed a line or said something wrong. As she laid in bed last night, the familiar voice of Ryan told her Garrett would never love her. It echoed the frequent refrain that she didn't deserve to be loved and that it was her fault she didn't have a family, yet. It even told her the lie that Rebecca would have been completely healthy if she stayed with Ryan. Hesitating when introducing Garrett this morning was a remnant of those old doubts and insecurities. She wanted to call him her friend, at the very least. Her boyfriend, if she was being honest. Instead, she copped out and simply introduced him as Addie's uncle. None of that mattered right now, because they were sitting together holding hands and not paying attention to the sermon. There was nowhere she would rather be. Mandy wasn't entirely sure how it happened, but she officially had a boyfriend. It felt weird to say at her age. She spent almost every evening with Garrett and Adelaide for the next week. The only times they didn't spend the evening together were when Mandy had women's Bible study or when she was volunteering, or helping Chrissy at the bistro. Now that she had an alternative to staying home alone, the volunteer commitments and her inability to say no were an inconvenience to Helping at the bistro didn't save her from a night alone, it only took her away from Garrett and Addie. Her commitment to helping the children's ministry director wasn't service done with a cheerful heart, but resignation. Still, she said yes, when Chrissy asked. She said yes, when Ruth needed someone to fill in at the food pantry. She said yes, and then secretly wished she hadn't. The latest in a string of unwanted commitments was her agreement to act as a leader for the junior high retreat. It was coming up soon, though she couldn't remember the exact weekend, an all-day Saturday and overnight into Sunday morning. She would be responsible for 12 junior high girls. Honestly, remembering what she could about her own junior high experience, she would have rather been alone. Right now, she had everything she ever wanted. Garrett and Adelaide brought her so much happiness. Adelaide's sweet little heart called to Mandy's. And Garrett. Her mom was over the moon. Her daughter was dating a doctor for crying out loud. It was every mother's dream. He was handsome and decent. When he allowed himself to forget about work for a while, he was a great parent. And a great boyfriend. Admittedly, she didn't have much to compare to. But he made her feel beautiful and her pulse race. When he asked her to help plan Addie's birthday party on short notice, she readily agreed and started making invitations and planning a menu. It was this coming weekend and there wasn't much time. Chapter 15 Determined to make it special and lessen the feeling of loss of her parents, Garrett insisted on throwing Adelaide a birthday party with Mandy's help. He asked Mandy to send invitations with the kids at the daycare, kids he barely knew but whom Addie talked of constantly. The party wasn't going to be anything extravagant. They were in Minden, after all. Garrett found himself spending less and less time in Greencastle. Between church and evenings with Mandy, it felt like only sleeping took place at his apartment, and the clinic was the only other thing tying him to Greencastle. Mandy suggested a princess-themed party. She had several princess costumes, and Adelaide had a few at home as well. They would have decorated cupcakes and prince and princess-themed games to play, courtesy of Mandy. Really, he admitted, his only contribution to the party was to pay for it. But that just meant he and Mandy made a good team, didn't it? Garrett felt like he was getting better at balancing his commitment to the clinic and his commitment to Adelaide. And the time he spent with Mandy was like icing on the cake. He had no idea what he was getting into when he agreed to manage the rural health clinic. It was so much more administrative than he assumed it would be. But he was finding he enjoyed it. He was getting pretty good at applying for grants, managing budgets, and managing a staff. 
it only confirmed to him what he always thought, he could make a huge difference at a large hospital. Devoting the time needed to run the clinic was proving more challenging than he anticipated. Today, though, he needed to focus on Adelaide. Just as soon as he finished at work. Mandy picked up Adelaide this morning to take her shopping to get a few last-minute things for the party. He pushed the party out of his mind and focused on the insurance contracts he needed to review. As he often did, Garrett became lost in his work. He had an innate ability to block everything else and focus on the task at hand. That skill certainly served him well in medical school and in residency. Garrett looked at his watch, expecting it to be around 11. His eyes bulged when he saw it was after 12. Adelaide's party was scheduled to start at 11.30. He glanced from the paperwork to his keys to his watch again. Without clearing the papers from his usually tidy desk, Garrett grabbed his keys and jogged toward the exit. How was he trying to explain this to Adelaide? And to Mandy? He loved the way she looked at him when he was playing with Adelaide. She looked at him with soft, approving eyes, full of respect and interest. On the other hand, he was far too used to seeing a different look on Mandy's face. When he lay picking Adelaide up for the day, he cancelled plans last minute to work, or when she caught him skimming emails from his phone while three of them were watching a movie. He knew which look he would see today, and that killed him. He felt like a jerk. Adelaide deserved better than a guardian who dropped her off for nearly twelve hours a day and forgot about her birthday party. What was he thinking? The entire drive from Greencastle to Minden, about fifteen minutes, Garrett kicked himself for his own stupidity. He was trying to be everything, doctor, boss, boyfriend, parent. Something had to give. Garrett thought about the promise he made to his brother, to take care of Adelaide. He felt a tightness in his chest at the guilt. Once again, he'd failed Addy. And his brother. Mandy watched the party unfolding before her with little interest, instead focused on the driveway of her yard she could see in her periphery. Where was Garrett? He promised he wouldn't miss this. Yet, here she was, with seven preschoolers, a plastic tiara with purple plastic gemstones on her head, and one very concerned birthday princess. Where is Anka Garrett? I'm sure he is on his way, sweetheart. But he is going to miss the cake. We will save him a piece, okay? Okay. Ten seconds later? Repeat conversation. Where is he? I don't know, Addy. Why don't you go play with your friends? It looks like Prince Jonathan needs rescued. Mandy's eyes followed the little girl in a pink princess costume as she bounced away to rescue her friend, Jonathan, from the dragon, a part currently played by a little boy named Zachary, who was always a bit of a troublemaker, but he definitely kept things interesting. All the kids here were friends Adelaide met at Mandy's daycare. She loved that she often got birthday invitations and saw the friendships inside the daycare were fostered outside of business hours as well. Several sets of parents forged solid friendships over the years due to Mandy's family-centered events. This was the first birthday party she actually hosted at her house, though. She was afraid the kids would be bored since her yard had the same toys as every other day. But she decorated the playhouse with castle decorations and banners and created some games for the kids to play. They did a Cinderella race, where two teams put their shoes in a big pile and then did a relay where they had to find their own shoes before returning to tag a teammate. They completed a magic carpet obstacle course which involved them scooting around the grass on a sled. Her favorite was Toss the Tiara, a modified ring toss using plastic tiaras one of which was now placed firmly atop Mandy's mass of curls. Everyone was having a great time. Except Mandy. She couldn't help but wonder where Garrett was and silently planned the lecture she knew she wouldn't give him when and if he finally arrived. She knew despite all the things she wanted to say to Garrett, about how he let Adelaide down and how work shouldn't be more important, she would instead give him the cold shoulder and pretend like nothing was wrong when he asked. Mandy's phone rang. It was Jessica, the children's director. Mandy ignored the call, as she had the last three times she called this morning. 
There had been too much to do in preparation for the party and Mandy really didn't want to be asked to volunteer for something else. The phone vibrated several times in quick succession against her palm and she glanced at the text messages. J.A., where are you? J.A., is everything okay? J.A., junior high retreat started two hours ago. Though. Mandy gasped. Crap on a cracker. The retreat was this weekend? How could she have missed that? Flipping fantastic. She agreed to be a leader for the retreat weeks ago, long before Garrett had his brilliant idea for them to throw Adelaide a birthday party. Correction, for her to throw Adelaide a birthday party. That's what it had turned into, she had literally done everything for this party. When she tried asking him his opinion, he deferred to her. Which, at the time, felt nice, she felt validated that he trusted her and her opinion. Of course, not even showing up for the freaking party he committed them to? Validated was the opposite of what she was feeling. Now, as the cherry on top of this hot mess Sunday, she dropped the ball and let a dozen junior high girls down. Mandy started mentally doing the math. After everyone left the party, she could put away the leftover food and leave the rest of the cleanup and make it to the church by 3.30. It was going to have to do. She began texting Jessica. Unka Garrett. You're here. Addie's excited voice rang out from the upper level of the wooden playset. In one smooth motion, she held her hands on the bar above the slide and swung herself, legs first down the yellow plastic chute. Without so much as a pause at the base of the slide, she was up and running across the mulch and then, the grass toward her uncle. Hey, uh, ladybug. Excuse me. I mean, Princess Ladybug. Garrett gave an exaggerated bow and Adelaide giggled. I saved Jonathan from the dragon. She held up the plastic sword in triumph. Mandy, having supplied enough plastic swords for princes and princess alike, celebrated the small win for the cause of girl power. Mandy quickly switched to her camera app and snapped a picture of Princess Adelaide celebrating her victory. She turned back toward the yard and finished letting Jessica know she would be there as soon as possible and apologized as profusely, as a text message would allow. Still lecturing herself for her scheduling snafu, she felt Garrett come up behind her. She turned and couldn't help but smile at him, despite her irritation at his tardiness. Hey, you. Hey. I'm so sorry, I'm late. I got caught up in these insurance contracts and she placed a hand on his chest to silence him. It's okay. I'm just glad you are here now. And that I was able to help. She loved feeling needed, and clearly Garrett needed her. He nodded and pulled her into his arms. Kissing her hair, he held her tightly. He was beyond lucky, he had Mandy. But it didn't stop him from feeling like a failure. He failed Adelaide today. And the little girl might not be old enough yet to hold it against him, but in a few years, she would. She wouldn't be excited he was finally showing up an hour late, she would resent that he hadn't made her a priority. She wouldn't appreciate the extra time with Mandy, she would be upset he was foisting her off on someone that wasn't family. He wasn't her father, but at least he was family. He had to do better. For Mandy and for Adelaide. He was just going to accept that his work would need to be done late at night or early in the morning. It was hard to be too melancholy and watching the carefree joy spilling out of the kids in Mandy's backyard. He watched Addie sword fight with another young girl in a princess dress, shrieking with laughter. He held one arm around Mandy, loving the closeness and intimacy of the moment, even in its public nature. Garrett was sure some of the other parents were whispering, it wasn't every day Mandy hosted a party for one of the kids, but this public display of affection would only confirm the rumors. For now, despite knowing he wasn't being the best doctor, parent, or boyfriend, he was determined to do them all. He wasn't sure he could be a parent without Mandy there to help. And he couldn't be the best doctor he could be without sacrificing something. Mandy seemed happy with him as things were, despite his failings. Thanking God once again for her ear infection from a few months ago which led to their initial meeting, 
he unwound his arm from Mandy and let her know he was going to grab lunch from the table of food. The spread was impressive, and he filled his plate with creatively themed snacks, each with a small placard. Fruit skewers were labeled Fairy Godmother Wands, and small sandwiches were called Cinderella Sliders. He shook his head and marveled at Mandy's attention to detail. He might not have it all together, but she certainly did. After the party, though, he noticed Mandy ushering parents and kids out quickly. She rushed around, tossing paper plates into a large trash bag and packing leftovers into Tupperware containers. Take a break, Amanda. You don't have to get this cleaned up right this second. Mandy's shoulders slumped, but her hands continued working. Actually, I do. I've got somewhere to be. About five hours ago. Garrett felt his brow furrow. What do you mean? She just shook her head and continued clearing the food table. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Talk to me. What's going on? I committed to be a leader at the junior high retreat this weekend, but then I totally forgot about it. I'm just trying to get there as soon as I possibly can to salvage what I can. Her voice became choked at the end and she pressed the backs of her hands against her eyes, still holding crumpled napkins in each. Garrett crossed the few feet between them and grabbed her arms, then removed the napkins from her hands. Go. She shook her head, her eyes lowered. He lowered his voice and ducked slightly so he could look up at her. Go. Addie and I got this. It's the least I can do. She hesitated, clearly deciding whether she could trust him to get it all taken care of. He spoke again, even softer now, but firm. Go. Finally, she nodded and began to move toward the house. I'll see you at church in the morning, okay? See you there. Have a good time. At his holler, Addie came running from where she played on the fort and gave Mandy a hug goodbye. After his reminder, she said a sweet, thank you, to Mandy, even saying how it was the best birthday party ever. He had Addie take a nap inside while he cleaned up the mess from the party. Once he was done, he entertained himself by looking through Mandy's bookshelves in her living room. She seemed to have a large collection of modern-day fairy tales. Stories of fictitious royalty or old stories like Beauty and the Beast retold with a modern twist. It was clear she had a thing for happily ever afters. He should have realized from the movies she always wanted to watch on streaming flicks. Every one of them a romantic comedy or romantic drama. He didn't have much of an opinion, his only requirement was absolutely no medical dramas. There was too much made-up nonsense far from the reality of practicing medicine. He basically rolled his eyes the entire show and a roommate forced him to watch one of the primetime medical shows. It felt strange to be in Mandy's house without her. Compared to his, which admittedly felt more like an extended stay hotel, hers felt like a home. There were pictures on the walls of her parents and her friends. His eyes landed on a framed picture on the shelf and then widened. A gasp broke the silence. It was Mandy holding a newborn. She was wearing a hospital gown and was sweaty with exhaustion. There was no smile on her face, just a look of intense love as she gazed at the baby, wrapped in blankets and turned away from the camera to where Garrett couldn't see its features. What in the world? Mandy doesn't have a kid. Possibilities raced through his mind. Had she been married before? She'd never even hinted at a previous marriage. And where was the baby now? With the father, he presumed. He couldn't believe this was how he discovered something so huge. The questions would rattle around in his head until tomorrow. Then, he would have a chance to confront Mandy about her secrets. Chapter 16 Mandy enjoyed the junior high retreat as much as she dreaded it. Despite her absence for the first five hours of the event, the girls in her group welcomed her and actually opened up to her later in the evening, during some of the small group sharing time. It helped that she shared with them her story about the relationship with Ryan and how God redeemed her story. Sharing the work God did in her life was a great reminder for her of his providence. 
It also reminded her, once again, that she desperately needed to share about Rebecca with Garrett. She alluded to the relationship with Ryan when they discussed both of their previous relationships, limited in number as they were for both of them. But she hadn't opened up about Rebecca. She wasn't even quite sure why. Partly, she was afraid of what he would say. He was a doctor and she felt pressured by the doctors to end her pregnancy. She was terrified he might judge her decision to carry little Rebecca as long as she could. Would he be as cold and indifferent as the doctor who discussed the options with her only days after the ultrasound revealed the chromosomal abnormalities? Mandy didn't want to know, for now, she wanted Garrett without the potential differences such a polarizing topic could bring. The retreat lasted all night, with the girls finally falling asleep in the basement of the church at around 4 a.m. The boys slept upstairs, and someone else was thankfully in charge of keeping watch to make sure none of the teenagers exercised poor judgment and tried to spend late night hours with their crush. Mandy attempted to sleep starting around midnight, but with the girls up and giggling most of the night, she undoubtedly resembled a zombie this morning. She didn't often drink coffee, but after returning home for a quick shower, she returned to the church and made a beeline for the free coffee and donuts always available before service. It was in that blissful moment between inhaling the scent of coffee and the first taste of the steaming hot brew she heard Garrett's accusing tone. It brought her screeching out of the momentary reverie in which she lost herself. Mind telling me about your first marriage and the child you've been keeping from me? Mandy jolted at the intrusion and coffee spilled over the brim of her styrofoam cup, scalding her hand, stinging as she tried to shake off the hot liquid. He made no attempt to speak quietly and she looked around nervously to see how many people were now watching this spectacle unfold. She didn't know whether to immediately come to her own defense and dispute his misconceptions, or to shush him before he could turn an overdue conversation into the talk of the town. She settled on grabbing his arm and steering him toward the edge of the foyer, into a small nook between wood-wrapped beams. She spoke in a harsh whisper. What in the world has gotten into you? Me? You've been keeping something huge from me this entire time. You said you want a family that you could see yourself as Addie's mother figure. But you are already a mother. He shook his head and spread his arms out. What am I supposed to think? People were starting to file into the sanctuary for service, and Mandy heard the music begin. Can we talk about this later? It's going to be kind of a long conversation. Garrett took a deep breath and released it. His shoulders slumped. Whatever. Yeah, he turned away from the sanctuary and toward the exit. Where are you going? I'll be at your house after church so we can talk. Mandy nodded, watching him leave. She squared her shoulders and straightened up before walking into the sanctuary with her head high. She had nothing to be ashamed of. There were mistakes in her past and she hadn't been completely open with Garrett about it, but he jumped to some major conclusions so far off base he wasn't even on the baseball field. She felt the eyes watching her find her pew and tried to ignore them. She reminded herself again of a verse she memorized after coming back to Minden. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. She was redeemed. Despite the mistakes of her past, God loved her without reservation. She kept praying she could find a man to do the same thing. She kept praying Garrett would still be that man after finding out what happened in her past. Garrett was pacing in the preschool room at Mandy's house while Addie drew a picture at the small table. He'd been stewing all night about what he'd found and only succeeded in getting more worked up with every passing hour. He even considered going to the office and pulling Mandy's medical records, which was admittedly insane. He might have given in to the very unethical hunt for information in the middle of the night if it wouldn't mean leaving Addie unsupervised at the apartment. He was probably lucky he no longer lived alone. Abusing his access to medical records for personal reasons would be even more risk to his medical license than dating one of his patients. Instead, he'd driven himself crazy with potential scenarios. Mandy had a secret husband and baby in another town. Mandy had a baby out of wedlock and lost custody because she had been a drug addict. 
Her ex-husband was a billionaire who threatened to destroy her, she didn't give him custody. Every situation was more ridiculous than the last, and none of them jived with the Amanda Elliot he knew and loved. So, he waited and ran his fingers through his short hair and rubbed a hand against the stubble on his cheek. It seemed like hours before he finally heard the side door open and Mandy ducked through the opening into the hallway, though it was only just over an hour since he arrived and let himself in with the key he knew was hidden in the planter beside the door. As worked up as he was, a part of him still relaxed simply because he was now in Mandy's presence, as though pieces of him were never quite at peace unless he could see her and hear her voice. It was that piece of him speaking now. I'm sorry. Mandy raised an eyebrow at him as she removed her jacket and slung her purse over the banister. 4. I shouldn't have jumped all over you. Especially in public. She nodded in agreement. But I do need an explanation. He was holding the picture frame and turned it around so she could see it. She reached for it slowly and traced a finger along the edge of the frame. She walked over to Addie and kissed her on the head as she said hello. Then, she turned on a show for the young girl, something Garrett knew to be a rare treat at Mandy's house but it would keep her occupied while they talked, which he appreciated. They sat next to each other on the couch, her knees angled towards him. Then, Mandy began to tell him a story. Once upon a time, there was a young girl in college. She grew up in a loving, if somewhat stifling, home. She was always striving for approval, she never felt good enough. She found herself away from home and free from scrutiny for the first time. She floundered, searching for friends and purpose, until she met a boy. She lost herself in him, desperate to be loved and accepted. He was exactly what she thought she wanted. He showered her with attention and kind words, slowly making her more and more addicted to his presence and his love. She gave him everything, including her very self. Mandy glanced up then, as though to make sure he understood the meaning. He nodded. She wound up pregnant. She took the test in the bathroom at Walmart and sobbed at the result. She was terrified, but at the same time, she hoped this would only draw her closer to the man she professed to love. She told the boy and he said all the right things. He went and bought a ring and proposed to her. They began talking of their life together. It wasn't until she worked up the nerve to tell her parents that they and her old friends came out of the woodwork to make her wake up and see the writing on the wall. He was controlling and angry. He tore her down and made her think she wasn't worthy of love, in order to make her more reliant on him. He made her feel lucky to have him. She spoke this with a hint of bitterness. But she was stronger than he thought. With her family and friends beside her, she gave him back the engagement ring and prepared to become a single mother. She planned to finish school, to give her child a good life, even though she had to do it alone. At her anatomy scan, the ultrasound technician went from friendly and talkative to increasingly close-lipped as she finished taking pictures. When the doctor followed up, the young girl, all of 20 years old, was told her baby had a chromosome disorder. Trisomy 13, the doctor said. Garrett's heart sank. He was familiar with the disorder, had witnessed the deformities that resulted from the extra chromosome. Organ defects, undeveloped brains, and spinal columns. While he processed the diagnosis, Mandy continued. Incompatible with life. Mandy spat out the words. Those words. I can still hear them, as though they will echo into eternity. They seemed so cold and unfeeling, and so heartbreaking for a young mother who had come to desperately want the baby growing inside her. The doctor offered to terminate the pregnancy, she choked out with a harsh laugh. He said, it's not really a baby right now anyway. It would be a mercy to end it now. There were tears running down her face now. All the doctors tried to convince me it would be easier not to carry the baby to term or wait for a natural miscarriage, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I named her Rebecca. She was born, sleeping, at 38 weeks. It was 16 extra weeks I got to hold her inside me and feel her kick and respond to my voice. When she was born, I held her for hours and stroked her cheek. 
She was beautiful, even though she. Mandy trailed off, but Garrett knew what she meant. The baby was deformed from the disorder. I desperately want to be a mother, Garrett, but God seems to have other plans for me. She wiped her face and took a shuddering breath. Garrett pulled her into his arms. I'm so sorry, love. I'm so, so sorry you had to go through that. You will always be Rebecca's mother. You know that, right? He rubbed her arm and kissed her hairline. My Amanda. You are stronger than I imagined. And I, he continued, am an idiot. I never should have jumped to the conclusions, I did. I knew that, when I was doing it. And I'm sorry, for that, too. Mandy, sniffed and spoke again. I should have told you. I kept meaning to, but it's not exactly a topic that comes up in casual conversation, you know. No, no. It's okay. You have nothing to feel guilty for. Can I ask you a question, Garrett? Anything, love. Did I do the right thing? Carrying Rebecca to the end? Her voice was small and unsure. Garrett knew the medical implications of trisomy 13. How the odds of the baby surviving past birth were low, and to live beyond a few hours. Extremely rare. If, by some miracle, Rebecca survived, it would have been a hard life, for Mandy and for Rebecca. But in every one of these situations, the only thing he had ever been able to think was the verse he had memorized years ago. You created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He could barely choke out the words. Rebecca was wonderfully made, Amanda. I firmly believe the end of her life was not yours, or the doctor's, to choose. At those words, Mandy melted fully into his embrace and sobbed. There was nothing he could do but hold her and let her fall apart. It was something he'd never seen her do, but he was glad he could be the one to hold her together as she did. Chapter 17 Adelaide had long since fallen asleep on the love seat, and Mandy found herself snuggled against Garrett's shoulder, his arm around her, slowly teasing her hair with his fingers. They half watched a cooking show, one of those competitions where the ingredients are ridiculous things no one has heard of and the judges look on with high noses, in their superiority. The only light came from the television across the room, casting a bluish hue across Garrett's face as she turned to look up at him. D what are you thinking about? He held his gaze at the screen for a moment before recognizing she had spoken. He looked down at her and raised an eyebrow. Seriously? Sure. Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? How could someone be thinking about nothing? For Mandy, that concept was completely foreign. From six in the morning until she fell asleep, there was something on her mind. Usually it was thoughts of lesson plans or craft ideas, or a constant attempt to remember all the commitments on her calendar. Sometimes, it was thoughts of Rebecca. She tried not to dwell on it these days, though. I don't know. Sometimes it's nice to just think about nothing. She lifted one side of her lips and raised an eyebrow back at him. How does that even work? He paused. I don't really know. I just shut my brain off sometimes. Wow. That must be nice. I feel like my mind never rests. I could see that. You have a lot going on. She nodded. Yeah, but so do you. I mean, you're a doctor and you've got Addie. That's probably why I have to turn it off sometimes. Sit in my nothing box. A nothing box. I need one of those. He shifted so she was forced move away from him. Let's try it. Close your eyes. What? Just do it, okay? She closed her eyes and he took her hands in his. They were warm and smooth. No rough calluses on these hands, just strength and confidence. She tried not to think about her own hands, with the stubby fingernails left over from her bad habit of biting them while reading. 
There was probably blue paint left in her nail beds from the process art project this morning. She took a deep breath and tried to push those thoughts from her mind. What are you thinking about? Nothing. She was lying. But only because she didn't want to admit what was really on her mind. You're lying. Dang it. How did he know? Maybe. First, just try to focus on breathing. Don't think about anything but the in and out of air. She tried, but he was absently rubbing circles on the tops of her hands with his thumbs and she could hear the show in the background, the host counting down the seconds to the end of the round. She shook her head and tried to pull her hands away. This is stupid. He laughed gently and grabbed her hands back. I bet you can do it. You bet? What do I win if you are wrong? Nope. You could throw the game. If you can't do it, I get what I want. If you can, you get to choose. She paused, considering. Deal. If I do it, I want you and Addie to come to dinner at my parents' house. Okay, he said, with no hesitation. She realized she probably just wasted her bet on something he would have done anyway. Why wouldn't he come to dinner? He was her boyfriend, right? She refocused and realized she missed what he was saying. No. Sorry, what? I'll tell you what I want, but only if you can't manage to think about nothing for just a minute. That's not fair. But whatever. I can do this. She was competitive. Growing up with an older brother would do that to you. Okay. Let's try this again. Take a deep breath. If a thought enters your mind, simply acknowledge it and let it go. Don't respond or take it deeper. He removed his left hand from her right and moments later, the television was blessedly silent. Just breathe. Don't think about anything. Let the day go. Remove your tongue from the roof of your mouth and try to relax. What the heck? How did he know her tongue was pressed against the roof of her mouth? She hadn't even realized it until he said something. Crap, she was doing it again. Think about nothing. Think about nothing. He fell silent and just held her hands. The air conditioner kicked on. She acknowledged the noise mentally and then dismissed it like he said. For a moment, there was nothing. Ten seconds, maybe fifteen. And then her thoughts rushed in. She opened her eyes and found Garrett studying her with a smile. You did it, didn't you? How did he know? She was determined not to let him be right. Nope. Didn't work. He shook his head slightly. You're lying. But that's okay just means I get to choose my prize. His gaze fell to her lips and she swallowed. Her voice was shaky. What do you want? He leaned in and said, this. And then he kissed her. It was light, barely there, like the thoughts during her nothing box experience. He removed one hand from hers and then it rested below her ear, trapping her hair against her neck and chin as he held her face there. He pulled back, and she opened her hooded eyes. He whispered, what are you thinking about? Her lips lifted into the faintest smile and she teased him. Nothing. Hmm. Somehow I doubt that. She took her free hand and reached around to the back of his neck. You're right. I'm not going to stop thinking about this for a very long time. And then she kissed him. Firmer this time, more confident. As much fun as they'd been having and as much as she felt like Garrett liked and needed her, she needed this. The physical reassurance he was attracted to her, like she was him. She'd been drawn to him since their first encounter at the office and thought about what it would be like to kiss him a thousand times since then. But this was better than she imagined. It was like getting into a car warmed by the sun on a cool spring day. The kiss completely enveloping her senses until there was nothing else outside of the two of them. Garrett got over his initial shock and returned Mandy's kiss, enjoying the feel of her in his arms and her lips under his own. 
He deepened the kiss and shifted closer. He hadn't expected her to initiate a kiss so soon after the first. She was so reserved most of the time. Of course, he saw her competitive streak peeking out earlier, and the playful spirit he figured she showed mostly to the children. With everyone else, she was more pulled together. Like she was carefully keeping the more attention-grabbing things about herself hidden behind a skillfully composed veneer of boring and predictable. He, however, was finding that she was anything but. Adelaide shifted on the couch, catching his attention and forcing him to end the kiss before it went further than it should. Equally grateful for and irritated by their little chaperone, he glanced over at his sleeping niece and was relieved to see she was still snoozing. He looked back at Mandy and admitted, we should probably be going. Mandy agreed and helped him pack up their things. He held Adelaide in his arms, her head resting on his shoulder and bent down slightly to kiss Mandy without disrupting her. When is dinner with your family? Mandy's eyes widened, just barely, and he chuckled. I still want to go, even if you supposedly couldn't think about nothing. Sunday night? Sounds good. I can't wait. And it was true. He wanted to meet Mandy's family. He was curious about the people that raised such a generous and kind woman. Would they welcome him and Adelaide into the fold? He briefly wondered how Addie would have reacted if she caught them practically making out on the couch. They hadn't really discussed their relationship with her. It just become routine for them to spend the evenings at Mandy's house and the weekends with her, too. He never enjoyed someone's company like he did Mandy's. They kept the same rhythm, it seemed. Sometimes, they talked. Other times, she read and he worked. While Adelaide was awake, they did puzzles or watched her draw pictures with sidewalk chalk. Usually it was Mandy drawing with her, while Garrett tried to answer a few quick emails on his phone, but Mandy never minded. They had fallen into a comfortable routine, and though Garrett knew he needed to be spending more time working in the evenings, he couldn't bring himself to forego the evenings with Mandy. He was getting farther and farther behind on the things he wanted to do at the office, but he admitted to himself that he would rather be watching another home remodeling show with Mandy snuggled next to him. He was just going to have to find time. Somewhere. Chapter 18 Garrett finished prescribing an allergy shot for the patient with six feline friends at home despite her allergy to cat dander. People amazed him. He handed the chart to the nurse, Kathy, and laughed with her about the crazy cat lady before she went to administer the shot. He only saw a few patients a day, enough to keep things interesting and get him away from his desk for a bit. He grabbed the next chart for review and looked it over for a moment before he knocked on the patient room. Good morning, Gladys. I'm Dr. Pike. Nice to meet you, doctor. What brings you in today? I think it's time to stop taking my diabetes medicine. He glanced up sharply and studied the older woman sitting before him. She had white hair and a slim figure. He could see sunspots on her hands ere they lay loosely clasped in her lap. He looked back at the chart looking for the answer to the question he was going to ask. What medicine are you on and how long have you been taking it? She explained she'd been taking the medication for three years since she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And why do you think you should stop? Well, I've lost about 60 pounds and I'm not having any problems with my blood sugar at all. You lost how much? 60 pounds. She smiled proudly. On purpose? She laughed joyfully. Yes, on purpose. He laughed too. Well, way to go Gladys. This almost never happened. Especially not here in the land of the fried pork tenderloin. I have to ask, because big weight loss like this is really uncommon and can mean someone is actually really sick. So, spill your secrets. Tell me how you did it. Well, nothing too crazy. I started walking every day and I stopped eating sugar and bread and started eating a lot more vegetables. So, basically what every doctor has told me to do for 20 years and I never listened. He was blown away. Wow, that's fantastic. I'm so proud of you, Gladys. 
it is absolutely possible to reverse type 2 diabetes with weight loss. Instead of pulling you off your medicine entirely, though, let's lower your dose and see where we go. Track your blood sugars for me in a journal and come back in a couple of months and we will see how you are. They wrapped up the visit and Garrett gave the woman a high five as he left. He felt like hugging someone, but he would have to celebrate with Mandy instead. He hadn't had a visit with a patient like at the entire time he'd been here. If only he could figure out what made Gladys finally wake up and make the necessary changes. He entered her appointment notes and updated her prescription dosage. The victory had him floating for a while, but he was quickly brought back to earth when he returned to his desk and saw the phone message light still blinking from the call he received yesterday. It was a call from the director of a hospital in Indianapolis. He met the man at the benefit gala he attended two weeks ago. Apparently, Garrett made an impression. Dr. Timberlake left a message on his machine yesterday alluding to a job offer. Garrett was eager to return the call and hear the details. Now, for some reason, he wasn't as excited. He spent the next 30 minutes exchanging small talk with Dr. Timberlake and hearing the man's offer. He wanted Garrett to come work as the assistant director of medicine. An assistant director position at a hospital as prominent as this was exactly what Garrett was working toward. He would be more than a doctor. He would oversee dozens of doctors and, indirectly, the care of every patient in the hospital. Obviously, the number of patients coming through the hospital was magnitudes greater than what he saw in his small Greencastle clinic. Plus, they were much more interesting cases. Instead of runny noses and high blood pressure, he would be involved in cases of tumors, autoimmune disorders, and cancer. Cases where medicine could literally save someone's life. But it would mean moving. It would mean leaving Mandy behind. He spent some time in his office that afternoon trying to pray about the decision, but no answers came. Frustrated, he took a walk around the clinic parking lot, trying to clear his head. His phone rang and he saw an unfamiliar number. Flashbacks to the call about his brother almost prevented him from answering, but he swallowed painfully and lifted the phone to his ear. This is Garrett. Hello, Dr. Pike. This is Pastor Steve from Central Community Church. We are one of the churches involved in the Family Blessing Fund. Ah, uh, yes. What can I do for you, Pastor? I just wanted to let you know the committee met yesterday and approved your recommendation of using the fund for the Barber family's expenses. In addition, several of the churches are contributing out of their own funds toward the hospital bills still due. Wow. That's really great news. Thank you for letting me know. Garrett immediately thought about what would come next. How does this work? Do I let the family know? Do you? In the past, we let the clinic notify the patient. I'm sure Connie has an idea for the best way to do so. Garrett lightly tapped his forehead with the palm of his hand. Of course. I'll let her know right away. Excellent. And doctor? Yes. Thanks for letting us be a part of the good work you are doing at the clinic. You are a blessing to this community. Garrett closed his eyes and his shoulders drooped. He didn't know how to respond. Was he really considering leaving? Thank you for your generosity. Have a good day, Pastor. You too, Doctor. I look forward to meeting you sometime soon. Garrett pushed the red button to end the call and then stuffed it in his pocket to avoid the desire to throw it in the wooded area behind the clinic. He took a deep breath. This was good. The Barber family would be blessed by the balance being paid. It didn't have any impact on whether he was going to leave or not. The job in Indianapolis was perfect for him. It was exactly what he was working toward. So why did he feel like he would be missing out on something here at the smallest medical clinic he'd ever seen? Chapter 19 Amanda I'm so glad you made it. The high-pitched exclamation rang through the screen door and hit her in the face like the wind whipping around a corner. After the initial flinch at the volume, Mandy rolled her eyes and opened the screen door. 
she hadn't missed a family dinner in five years, but her mother always made it sound like it was the most amazing miracle she was home for the evening. Dot. Yes, mom. What a surprise, I would be here, like I have been for every family dinner since they started being a thing. She said dryly. Family dinner at her parents' house was always a production. It only happened about once a month since her brother was too busy most weekends. He was a photographer and weddings, tied up most of his Saturdays and family sessions most Sundays and evenings. But Josh cleared one Sunday evening a month to spend with their parents and his little sister. Mandy wasn't sure what Garrett would think of her family. Honestly, sometimes she wasn't sure what she thought of them. Her mom, Sharon, was the exact opposite of Mandy. Her dad was a goofball intellectual and her brother? He was an odd cross between the artsy photographer and a rough biker type. It was a combination her friends could never resist. She'd lost more than one would-be friend when they realized being friends with her wouldn't get them a date with her big brother. Her mother rushed toward them in the final stage of removing her apron and wrapped her arms around Garrett, who stepped inside and was standing next to Mandy. And you must be the doctor. My, I've heard so much about you and we are just thrilled you are here. Amanda has never brought a man to dinner before, you know. Her mother leaned in as though telling Garrett a secret. A very loud and rambunctious secret. Mandy looked skyward and took a deep breath. She loved her mother, but the woman talked too much. Trying her best not to be disrespectful, she gestured to Garrett. Mom, this is Garrett. Garrett, meet my mother. And this is Addie. She gestured to Adelaide, hiding behind her and clinging to her leg. Maybe we could bring it down a notch or two so you don't traumatize the five-year-old? She should have warned her mom ahead of time that Adelaide would be shy and quiet and not to pressure her too much. Dot. She put her apron back over her head and tied it quickly. Pish. Well aren't you the most adorable thing I've ever seen. You come on in here and help me taste test these cookies I made for dessert. Her mom grabbed Adelaide's hand, and much to Mandy's surprise, Addie let go of her leg and followed her mom into the kitchen. Garrett looked at her with a raised eyebrow. Yep. I know. She's so. Loud. Mandy supplied. Domineering. In your face. I was going to say friendly. Sure you were. She rolled her eyes at him this time. Let's go. Might as well let you meet Dad. Maybe Josh is here, too. She doubted it. She hadn't noticed his bike outside. Dot. Her dad was one of her favorite people in the whole world. How he put up with her mother nonstop, she had no idea. He wasn't shy, but he felt no need to be the center of attention. When she talked with him, she felt like there was nothing more important in the entire world. They found him on the deck, checking the coals on the grill and sipping a beer. She laughed at his tube socks and house slippers and went to give him a hug. Hey, there, daughter. Good to see you. He gave her a big squeeze and her heart swelled. Dot. Hey, Dad. This is Garrett, my boyfriend. She stuttered briefly over the word and her dad's eyes moved back to her for a split second before returning to study Garrett. He grinned and shook his hand. Nice to meet you, Garrett. Call me James. Come on over here and grab a beer while I season these steaks. Garrett shot her a helpless look and she just laughed. She wasn't worried her dad would terrorize him too much. No, that would be Josh whenever he showed up. Garrett watched powerlessly as Mandy abandoned him on the deck with her father. What did he say? Grab a beer. He looked around and saw a small cooler on the ground next to the grill. Garrett didn't really drink much, a glass of wine here and there, but he grabbed a beer anyway. Something to do with his hands, at least, instead of rub the sweaty palms on his shorts repeatedly. He was nervous. Why am I so nervous? So, my wife tells me you are a doctor. Garrett swallowed. Yes, sir. 
Garrett watched Mandy's dad shake some sort of seasoning blend on the steaks. Hmm. Why'd you become a doctor? Well, I wanted to help people. That was his standard answer, the one most people expected to hear. It made him sound selfless and noble, when that definitely wasn't the case, but he rarely got any pushback on it. Dot. Sure, sure. But there's a lot of ways to help people not involving 11 years of school or dealing with stool samples or rectal exams on a regular basis. James chuckled at his own conclusion. Dot. Garrett relaxed a bit and laughed. Very true. He tried to explain his motivations. I guess I was always fascinated by the human body. God created an incredible system capable of so many amazing things. The more I learned about it, the more confident I was being a doctor was the right decision. I wanted to do something important. James scratched his chin, where the weekend scruff was growing. Something important, huh? What exactly would be unimportant work? Garrett sensed a trap and tried to backpedal. I just mean I wanted to do something I felt like used my particular gifts and interests. To leave my mark on the world in a positive way. There, that sounded good, right? That's very noble of you. James was turned away from him, putting the steaks on the hot grill with a sizzle, so Garrett couldn't get a read on him. He smiled anyway and gave a nonchalant, nah, before trying to find a different subject. What do you do, James? I'm a doctor. You're kidding. Garrett's brightened at the potential connection. Dot. Yeah, of course I'm kidding, document. Her dad laughed, cracking himself up. Too easy. Nah, I'm a professor over in Terre Haute at the university. Oh. What do you teach? James gestured with the tongs. Chemistry, organic chemistry, that sort of thing. Oh man, old chem was so hard. Garrett shuddered in exaggeration. Dot. James laughed. It's definitely a struggle for most students. That's probably why I like teaching it. He studied Garrett for a moment and then continued. Many of my students have never had to work as hard for a grade in anything as they do in my class. Some of them give up. Some of them call their parents to complain on their behalf. But the others? They learn some things about chemistry. And a lot about themselves. Garrett nodded. Makes sense. Probably true for a couple of my classes as well. Where'd you go to school? Pre med at Notre Dame and then med school at Northwestern. Good schools. I thought so. Garrett was proud of the schools he attended. Northwestern had one of the top med schools in the country. He stayed relatively close to home until residency and he was paired with the program in Houston. The matching process for residents was a bit unpredictable and he limited his options by giving a large preference to programs with the dual residency in internal medicine and family practice. You've got a daughter, I understand. Garrett hung his head a bit. Actually, Adelaide is my niece. My brother and his wife died about three months ago and Addie came to live me. Wow. I'm so sorry for your loss. That's a pretty big adjustment. It really has been. I'm not sure what I would have done if I never met Mandy. She's been a godsend. It was the truth. He didn't think he could have made it this far without Mandy. The thought of leaving her for the job in Indianapolis streaked through his mind. What was he even doing here? Dinner with the family was a big step and he was thinking about leaving? She's a good person to have on your side, that's for sure. A loud, booming voice interrupted the serious conversation, all right, where is he? Garrett turned away from the yard and the grill and toward the sliding doors. An imposing figure filled the door frame. Big, muscular arms scattered with tattoos were connected to shoulders that nearly didn't fit through the opening. There was no way this was, Josh. Garrett heard Mandy's voice through the screen, uncharacteristically loud. Be nice. What could only be described as an ornery grin spread on the large man's face as Garrett stared. Sure, sis. Mandy's dad spoke up and walked toward his son, hey Josh. 
Have you met Garrett yet? Isn't it great your sister brought someone home? Her dad nudged Josh gently and Josh exhaled the breath he was using to puff out his chest. Oh good, he looked a little more normal now. Slightly, dot. Hey man, I'm Josh. He held out his meaty hand for Garrett to shake, and Garrett grabbed it with his much smaller, smoother one. Nice to meet you. Your sister. Garrett trailed off, not sure how to finish his sentence. Mandy hadn't told him anything about her brother beyond his existence. She spoke with obvious warmth and affection when she mentioned him, but definitely hadn't prepared Garrett for the apparent biker gang member standing before her. Josh barked a laugh and James cracked up. Let me guess. She didn't tell you about me. Garrett shifted his weight. Well, nothing specific. No. Josh clapped a hand on Garrett's shoulder and Garrett felt it to his toes. That's okay. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Mandy tried desperately to eavesdrop out the kitchen window, but between her mother's unrivaled volume, the sound of the dryer in the closet and trying to keep an eye on Addie and make sure she was having a good time, Mandy couldn't hear a word. Josh had his arm around Garrett and was leaning down talking in his ear. She could see Josh's big, goofy grin for a moment before he leaned up and patted Garrett's shoulder roughly. She couldn't see Garrett's face, but he looked to be standing abnormally still as he listened to her brother. Ever since the fiasco with Ryan, Josh swore he would do a better job protecting her. Whatever that meant. He blamed himself for not paying closer attention. In reality, she'd been at college in Bloomington and he'd been at college in Illinois. It wasn't like he could have done anything to prevent it. They were only two years apart in age, and she adored her big brother. Despite the number of times she told him it wasn't his fault, he still insisted and threatened to interrogate any future boyfriends. After ten years, he was finally getting his chance to do so. She just hoped he wouldn't scare Garrett off. Garrett had been through medical school and survived emergency room trauma shifts. Certainly, he could withstand a slightly overprotective big brother. Trying not to overanalyze every movement of the men on the deck, she turned her attention to the kitchen. Her mother had pulled a chair over to the counter and was having Adelaide help her mash the potatoes. Smash. 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 Adelaide giggled excitedly and rammed the utensil down as hard as she could, still only reaching about halfway through the soft potatoes. Her mother's laugh carried over the roar of the dryer and the little girl's yells. Great job, Miss Adelaide. Mandy smiled at the sight. Her mom would be an excellent grandmother, someday. If either of her children ever got their act together and gave her some grandbabies, dot. At times, Mandy thought her mom felt the loss of Rebecca nearly as strongly as she had. Despite the circumstances, her mom steeled herself and looked for the silver lining. Which was, of course, that she would have a grandchild to love and spoil. She started planning on reduced hours at the elementary school, where she worked as the nurse, so she could care for Rebecca while Mandy finished college. Instead, she held her first grandchild for a few moments of rare silence and then retreated from the room in tears. Rarely had Mandy seen such weakness from her mother, always so strong and unafraid. Mandy, your turn. Your turn. Adelaide held out the potato masher toward her, a glob of the white mixture falling from the metal onto the floor. You smash. Mandy grinned at her and tried to bring everyone down a level by speaking softly. Okay, okay. I'd love to smash. Did you say yes? Recently, Adelaide was confirming every answer she was given to make sure she heard it correctly. Yes, I said yes. Is it so much fun to smash? Addie nodded excitedly, bouncing from head to toes. She pointed at the pot emphatically when Mandy took too long to follow directions. Did you taste them yet? Mandy asked. Addie shook her head and Mandy instructed her to swipe a taste from the masher with her finger dot. Yummy. Garrett came in the sliding door, followed closely by Josh. Want a beer, sis? 
Mandy was surprised to see the half-finished bottle in Garrett's hand. As far as she knew, he rarely drank. Um, sure. I'll take one. Josh turned around and headed back on the deck, while Garrett made his way to the kitchen island where Adelaide had taken over the mashing process once again. He gave a properly exaggerated expression of wonder when Adelaide regaled him with her smashing powers. Wow. You mashed all those potatoes by yourself? I can't wait to eat them. They are going to be so delicious. Yep. They are going to be so delicious, Adelaide mimicked proudly. Mandy made eye contact with him over the island. Everything okay, out there? Yep. Just getting to know your dad. And your brother. I hope he didn't scare you. I probably should have warned you or something. Garrett gave a slight shrug. It's fine. He just loves you. There is nothing wrong with that. Good. Mandy's mom was busy pulling garlic bread out of the oven. Looks like everything is just about ready in here. Can you go let the boys know, Amanda? I got it. Garrett went back to the sliding door and stepped outside. It always amazed Mandy how the three of them could generate so much conversation. Technically, she supposed there were four of them when she was included, but she only contributed a small fraction of the noise at family dinners. She had always been the quietest in the family, the least likely to make a splash. She loved her family and mostly sat and soaked in their energy and passion, like someone standing on the front porch watching a thunderstorm. You were likely to end up wet, but the show was usually worth it. Tonight was no different. Despite the added company of Garrett and Adelaide, her family was their same old selves. Josh and her father were in the middle of a spirited debate about the solution for the rising student loan debt in the country. To her surprise, Garrett spoke up on the topic. There are so many issues and we can argue cause and effect with the government involvement and the tuition rates skyrocketing. The fact of the matter is, no one is hiding the sticker price of school. It's pretty easy to find on any college website. Students are signing up for this. I signed up for it. I've easily got six figures of debt from school. That's why I'm here. There is an Indiana program for medical professionals to have their student loans forgiven if they work in a rural clinic for five years. That. That's a good idea. This whole unconditional loan forgiveness is the thing that bothers me, her dad added. Josh defended his viewpoint. Not everyone goes into medicine new though. And with a doctor income, you could pay off those student loans without the forgiveness. It's the artists and musicians and social sciences graduates that will pay a fortune and make pennies. Then their loans have huge interest rates and the balance continues to grow even though they are making all the payments. Her mom stepped in, I'm glad that program brought you to our little corner of Indiana, Garrett. Will you stay after the time the program requires? Garrett shifted in his chair and took a drink of water. I'm not sure yet. I'd actually like to return to a bigger hospital and use my internal medicine specialty a little more. Family practice is great, it's just not my dream. Mandy tried not to let her surprise show. Her family would notice and never let it drop that she and Garrett hadn't broached this conversation yet. He still has four and a half years on his commitment if he wants his loans paid off, so let's try not to make him decide right this second. That's so true, Amanda. Her mother said with a reassuring tone. Then, it brightened, it might turn out there is more for him to stick around Minden for than he thought there would be. She was not so subtly hinting at a future for Mandy, and Mandy groaned. M-O-M, the word stretched into two syllables in a plea for her mother to drop it. Amanda. I'm just saying a family has a way of changing things. For years is a long time. Garrett nodded and agreed. Very true. Mandy relaxed. Garrett wasn't going to leave. She had four and a half years to make sure of it. Adelaide, who was quiet during the adult conversation, spoke up, I want some more potatoes. Mandy instinctively spoke up, 
how do you ask, and heard Garrett at the same time say, okay, ladybug. They made eye contact over her head and Mandy gave a sheepish smile. Sorry, reflex from daycare. Garrett shook his head. No, you're right. Addie, what do you say? Please. Garrett grabbed the potatoes and added another spoonful to her plate. She started to take a bite and then Garrett reminded her, Addie, what did you forget? Gravy. The roar of laughter filled the table again. Her dad jumped in, excitedly. That reminds me. Check this out, Garrett. You're a doctor, you'll like it. He took a dramatic pause to make sure everyone was listening. I heard a joke about amnesia once, but I forgot it. He delivered the punchline with gusto and then busted out laughing. Josh and Mandy groaned and Garrett chuckled. Addie laughed loudly, even though Mandy was sure she was too young to understand the joke. From there, the conversation was off and running, her mom beginning a story of Josh and Mandy as kids, with Josh and her dad adding commentary to dispute the grossly exaggerated details. Never happened, mom. Josh would cut in. That's how I remember it. We were four and six, not a practically teenagers. Mandy watched the conversational volley and then looked at Garrett to see his reaction. He was observing, too. He caught her stare and smiled. He spoke softly. She could hear him over the other conversation, but no one else would. They're great, Amanda. A tension she hadn't realized she was holding left her shoulders and she relaxed. He liked her family. She still felt like she was on pins and needles, afraid she would say or do something to send Garrett running for the hills. In quiet moments, Ryan's voice still echoed her inadequacies. His voice mocked the stupid joke she made that fell flat or chastised her dinner for not being good enough. Not Garrett, though. He liked her. And he liked her family. Hopefully, they liked him just as well. No doubt she would be getting a call from her mother tomorrow during nap time, and her brother sometime soon. Her dad, on the other hand, would wait for her to come to him. He rarely gave unsolicited advice. Therefore, she tended to listen to his the most. It was after her mom, brother, and friends warned her off Ryan that she finally turned to her father. She showed up at his office at the university and distinctly remembered crying in his office. Everyone else was harsh and direct with their opinion that she was better off without Ryan. He, on the other hand, was gentle and took her on a curvy path of conversation until she came to the conclusion herself. My baby girl is going to be a mama, he'd said. And she'd cried harder. How come I haven't met him, yet? They'd been busy. But actually, it was because she knew they wouldn't like him. Do you love him? With everything she had. Does he love you? She thought so. He kept at it, waiting for her response or continuing with the next question when it seemed she couldn't, or wouldn't, answer. Would he give up everything for you? Can you picture him changing diapers at two in the morning? Does he make you feel good about yourself? He sat across from her, patiently letting her process the questions. Letting her come to the same conclusion everyone else had already drawn. No. He wouldn't, she couldn't, he didn't. Life with him would be draining. It would suck the joy from her already bruised heart and she didn't want to feel alone when she was with her husband. Even after all these years of desperate loneliness and desire for a family, Mandy recognized there could be no worse loneliness than marrying the wrong person and feeling alone despite being with her partner. The consequence of choosing the wrong person was too great. If conversations were halting, or the only compatibility was in the bedroom, or the marriage was based on children instead of children being the result of a happy marriage. Eventually, everything else was gone and it was just you and your partner. Dot. Alone. Dot. Together. And God forbid you don't actually like each other. That would have been Ryan. As much as she loved him, depended on him, found her identity in his opinion of her, she didn't really like him much. Not like she did Garrett. Dot. 
Adelaide might have brought them together, but she liked Garrett without her. When it was just the two of them, holding hands and trying to find her nothing box, she liked him. And if he were around, she would never be lonely. Chapter 20 April 26 was always a hard day for Mandy. It was her daughter's birthday. No matter what she had going on, she always made time to visit the small gravesite where her remains rested. In years past, Mandy did everything from curl up in a ball on the grass next to the gravestone, pace angrily while asking God unanswerable questions, or even brought a small picnic to eat while she spent time with her daughter. Today, after an exceedingly long day at Little Steps, she brought flowers daffodils from Ruth's garden and told her baby girl about Garrett and Adelaide. I think you would like him, baby girl. And he has a daughter, too. Well, she's his niece, but he is all she has. He's a good man, and he treats me well. You know, I never thought I would find someone after your father. Like, maybe there was something wrong with me. Sweet girl, I miss you every day. Hard to believe you would be eleven now. Probably counting down the days until school was out and summer vacation was here. Mandy tried to imagine what her daughter would be like now. Of course, when she imagined life with Rebecca, she was a perfectly healthy child. She didn't know what heaven was like, but she often prayed she would see Rebecca there, unblemished by the condition that ended her little life. She wanted that more than anything. She continued chatting telling Rebecca about what her grandma and grandpa were doing and about the children at the daycare. When she first started coming, Mandy couldn't do anything but cry. Then, for years, she sat only in silence, unsure of what to say. Once, she just started to talk. It felt cathartic to share the inconsequential details of her life with her daughter, even if her daughter would never talk back to. I hope you know I'm not trying to replace you. Adelaide is, she paused, trying to find the word. Special. Even if Garrett and I end up together, Adelaide isn't you. Sometimes I have to remind myself. She would be your sister, though. She doesn't know about you yet. She's too young. But I told Garrett about you. You would be proud of me. I made it through the whole story without crying. She was crying now, though. Her knees began to ache where they pressed into the grass. It was dusk, and the crickets and cicadas were beginning to sing their nightly chorus in the trees around the small cemetery outside of Minden. The granite of the gravestone felt cool and smooth below her fingertips as they rested on the top. It took Mandy months to decide she wanted a gravestone. Longer to decide what should be on it. In the end, she kept it simple. Now, she traced the words lightly with her fingers. Rebecca Marie Elliott April 26, 2007 Beloved Daughter Psalm 139 verses 13-14 It was the same verse Garrett quoted to her when she asked him whether she had done the right thing. At Garrett's words, it felt like God was wrapping a warm blanket around her heart, saying, Relax, child. She always wondered if she had done the right thing, made the right decision. After seeing Rebecca when she was born, she was even more torn. On one hand, she wouldn't trade the moments she held Rebecca in her arms. On the other hand, if she somehow survived and had to live with some of the afflictions Mandy had seen? Mandy wasn't sure she would have been strong enough to raise a child with those kinds of concerns. Still, she placed her faith in God then, whatever the result would be. She knew that kind of strength couldn't come from her anyway. Raising a disabled child or losing a child before you had a chance to know them both took a supernatural strength, but each different in their own right. Mandy kissed her fingers and touched them to Rebecca's name. I'll see you soon, baby girl. It was the farewell she always gave when leaving, knowing in the scope of eternity, they would be together again in the blink of an eye. It only felt like a thousand years from her position here. Everything that happened between now and then, Mandy wanted to make count. She also wanted it to involve a partner and a family, one she didn't have to visit at a graveyard. Garrett told Mandy about the job offer the next day. It had been weighing on him ever since dinner with her family. 
He hadn't decided yet, but he felt like he needed to tell Mandy, just in case. He watched as she processed. She dropped her face into her hands and rubbed her temples. You aren't going to take it, are you? What about your loans? What about Adelaide? As much as he reassured her his decision wasn't made yet, she was obviously upset. She even said she would go with him. But he knew that wasn't what she wanted. Her life was here and so was her family. At her family dinner, there was so much talk about him staying for four years and how much could change. That was true. Maybe if he stayed for four more years, he would never leave. And that was the problem, wasn't it? It would be far too easy to get comfortable here and to rely on Mandy. If he stayed, would he be sacrificing his dream? Was he willing to give up everything to stay here? Even worse, was he willing to ask her to give up everything and go with him? He'd never been selfless, but it seemed incredibly self-centered to ask her to make that sacrifice. With the decision in the back of his mind, Garrett was stressed out at work for another reason. Something wasn't adding up as he reviewed the invoices and account balances. He couldn't quite figure it out, but there was money missing. As far as he could tell, all the vendors were paid for what they invoiced, and nothing seemed off except the amount they were spending on supplies seemed high based on the number of patients they saw. He decided to do a bit more digging. He pulled last year's numbers, which looked similar on a dollars per patient basis. Something Trish said still burned in the back of his mind. Who would think we could spend so much on hand soap and disposable linens? It was during their one-on-one -on -one and Garrett was asking about how she enjoyed her job and if she had any concerns. She made the comment offhandedly, accompanied by the shrill laugh he heard echoing endlessly through the halls. He went back further, pulling five years of data from their accounting program. There. About five years ago, the amount of money spent per patient jumped significantly. There was an extra thousand dollars each month that didn't add up. He continued digging, pulling detailed reports of vendors and payments. He went down several trails leading nowhere. Apparently, the clinic made several radical changes in the vendors supplying consumables. Everything from toilet paper and urine sample cups to cotton swabs and vaccines were coming from new vendors. It didn't make sense, though. If you were going to go through the trouble of switching vendors, wouldn't it be to save the clinic money? He scanned invoices, trying to find something that looked out of place. Doc shop, medical waste bags, tongue depressors, cotton swabs, alcohol wipes, disposable linens. JPL cleaning services, nightly and weekly cleaning with medical sterilization added. Soapster commercial hygiene, toilet paper, sanitizer, hand soap, paper towels. Woods office solutions, files, paper, filing cabinet, printer toner. Evergreen medical, disposable linens, hand soap, toilet paper, vaccinations. Medi services, vaccinations, bandages, crutches, wrist splints. Hold up. He flipped back several pages. Then forward again. There it was. What the heck was going on? Evergreen Medical looked legitimate, but every item on their invoice was already invoiced by another company on a regular basis. If they didn't get an order for soap from Soapster in May, it showed up on the Evergreen invoice that month. Plus, the closer he looked, they invoiced for a hodgepodge of supplies and services that really made no sense. He needed to digest this a bit. Luckily, it was late and everyone else had already left for the day. He checked his watch, dismayed to see it was already after six, meaning he was late to Mandy's, again. He gathered up the invoices and placed them in his briefcase. He had some more work to do tonight. If the situation was what he thought it was, it had gone on under his nose for six months and he wasn't going to stand for it for another day. Talk about dropping the ball. At best, this was extreme negligence. At worst, he indirectly allowed someone to embezzle thousands of dollars from the clinic. All because he was too busy with Mandy and Adelaide to do his job. Again, he proved he couldn't do it all. In the last few months, he dropped the ball with Addie's birthday. He'd shown up late for her dozens of times, 
trying to give the clinic what it deserved of his attention. He'd spent the evenings with Mandy instead of getting this stupid paperwork done sooner. If he had been doing his job instead of making out like a teenager, he could have caught this sooner. The thought irked him. He wanted that job in Indianapolis. But if this recent failure at the clinic in Greencastle was any indication, he shouldn't get the job, anyway. If he couldn't effectively manage the small clinic, how would he do at the much more important role of assistant director of medicine? Even if Mandy came with him to Indianapolis, he would have the same problem. Splitting time between Addie, Mandy, and work was never going to work. The answer was obvious. Unless he gave up something and was able to give more to work, he couldn't. He went over every scenario on the drive to Minden and came to the only solution he could. He arrived at Mandy's house and prepared to do something he knew would only hurt someone he cared for very much. Mandy rolled her eyes when she saw Garrett pull in the driveway at 20 minutes after 6. She turned to Adelaide. See, I told you he would be here soon. Adelaide cheered and ran to the door, where she stood bouncing on the balls of her feet until Garrett walked in. Immediately, Mandy could see something was wrong. His smile didn't reach his eyes and he shifted his gaze from Mandy's quickly, instead focusing on his niece. She hoped it was just something at work. He mentioned some things at the office, expenses that didn't seem to make sense. She pasted on a smile and headed toward the kitchen, where she had dinner waiting for them in the slow cooker. It was a routine she fell into happily. Taking care of Garrett and Adelaide filled a place in her soul. These past few months, she was all too happy to say yes to all of Garrett's needs, spoken and unspoken. After dinner, when Adelaide fell asleep on the floor as they watched a movie together, Garrett stood up and went to the kitchen. After disappearing from view for a moment, he came back around the corner and gestured for her to join him. She stepped quietly over the sleeping child, taking one last adoring glance at the little girl she had come to love so much. She whispered to Garrett as he took a drink from a glass of water. What's up? We need to talk. I figure this is our best chance to find time. Mandy felt the familiar lump begin to form in her throat. Okay? What do we need to talk about? You've been a godsend these past few months. I honestly couldn't have done it without your help. She swallowed heavily. The words were right, but the solemn tone was all wrong. What was he really trying to say? She choked out one word. But. He sighed. But, I've decided to take the job in Indianapolis. I can't be a good father and doctor and still have time for a relationship. I've screwed up things at the clinic. I haven't been there like I should for Addie. I've been relying too much on you. Mandy jumped in. I want you to rely on me, Garrett. I'm here to help you. She could go with him to Indianapolis. She never saw herself leaving Minden, but she could do it. For them. He shook his head. I can't give you what you want, Amanda. You deserve more than I can offer. Addie and I are going to go to Indianapolis, so I can focus on being a good father and the best assistant director of medicine I can. There won't be time for anything else. Anyone else. The finality with which he spoke absolutely crushed her. She shook her head in refusal. She refused to believe it. She had done everything, been everything for him. How could he just leave her behind? What more did he want? Hadn't she said yes to everything? She helped him in every way she knew how. She thought he saw her as a partner. As a potential mother for Adelaide. He continued, you are an amazing person, Amanda. You will find someone who can love you and make you a priority. I'm sorry, I couldn't be that person for you. Not without sacrificing my career or giving Adelaide less than she deserves. He looked around uncomfortably. I do need one last thing, though. She barked out a laugh. Of course you do. Don't you ever get tired of taking things from other people? Garrett winced but ignored the bite in her words. 
he knew he was selfish, no surprise there. He was surprised at her ability to deliver such a painful jab with just a few words. I just need you to let Adelaide continue coming to daycare here for the next couple of weeks. Until we officially get moved. Mandy didn't have the energy to fight. She was drained from the sudden loss of the family she thought she finally found. After years of loneliness, she was finally happy. And after years of saying yes to nearly every request for help from someone, she wasn't sure she even knew how to say no. Sure, whatever. Now, that happiness would be gone forever. Adelaide, who she'd come to think of like a daughter, would be just a memory like Rebecca. Thank you, Amanda. I promise I will make the move happen as quickly as I can. She just sat in a table at the kitchen and waved a hand. She didn't speak or look at him as he gathered Adelaide from her place on the living room floor and carried her easily to the door. As he walked out the door, he paused. Before he could say anything, she held up a hand to stop him, rubbing her temple with the other hand. Just go. She couldn't bring herself to watch him leave. Chapter 21 Breaking the news to Adelaide was worse than he imagined. He knew it wasn't fair to ask her to move again. She'd just gotten settled and made friends here. He sat her down on the small couch in their tiny apartment. She kicked her legs, too short to reach the ground and waited impatiently. He took a deep breath and spit it out. You and me, Ladybug, we are a team. You know that right? Addie nodded and then tilted her head in confusion. Right, get to the important part, Uncle Garrett. Well, you and I are moving. To a big city with a big hospital for Uncle Garrett to work at. When Addie didn't respond, he elaborated. You'll find a new school and new friends. Okay. Addie shrugged and then started to get off the couch. Okay. Wait, wait. He moved to interrupt her scooting. You're okay with this? Well sure. Mandy's coming, too, right? Ah, that explained it. Actually, sweetie. No, Mandy isn't coming with us. You said yes or no. I said no. Garrett confirmed his answer for her dot. It was no surprise to him and she whined at him, but I want Mandy to come with us to the big city and the big hospital. I know, sweetie, but Miss Mandy has to stay here. He spoke in soft, understanding tones. Trying to keep the tantrum he could see brewing from boiling over. Then I want to stay here with her. He closed his eyes and his shoulders slumped dot. The now five-year-old knew how to hit him ere it hurts and threw out the most damaging jab of all. Why do I have to go with you? You're not my daddy. Ouch. Was that a skill all women were born with? She stomped her feet and ran to her bed, burying her face in the pink princess pillow. He whispered to himself over the sound of loud, racking sobs, I know, ladybug. I'm not. But I'm going to try my best. Asterisk 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 Garrett brought in a forensic accountant to confirm his conclusions about Evergreen. Records showed Trish set up the fake company five years ago and had been conveniently writing checks to her fake company based on false invoices ever since. According to the accountant's report, she managed to siphon nearly $60,000 in five years. Based on his short conversation with the police, Trish would face six to eighteen months in prison and have to pay back the money plus a fine. He guessed the new boat she had been talking about would have to be sold. He had a plan for the money, even though he wouldn't be around. The Family Blessing Fund could use a good infusion of cash to help more families like the barbers. He remembered the warm feeling of getting their bills covered in full and tried not to linger on the fact it would be a one-time experience. Not willing to miss the satisfaction of seeing Trish arrested, he stood in the front office that afternoon, sipping water from his stainless steel travel mug everyone assumed held coffee. He was talking with Connie, under the guise of insurance questions. Garrett watched the police officers walk through the patient entrance. The waiting room went silent and the small child playing with the toys in the corner watched in awe as the uniformed men made their way toward the window. 
They bypassed the check-in window and walked through the doors to the hallway, disappearing briefly before reappearing in the entry to the office from the hallway. Trish crossed her legs and rubbed her fingernail. Well, hello boys. To what do we owe the pleasure? Trisha Lamb. Only if it is you who is asking, sugar. Ugh, Garrett was glad he'd never have to deal with another morning of the flirty receptionist. Trisha Lamb, you are under arrest for embezzlement and money laundering. You have the right to remain silent. Ha, like that would happen. Six months here, and he wasn't sure he'd ever seen Trish remain silent. The officers put her in handcuffs and escorted her back out the waiting room. The patients waiting had wide eyes and Garrett saw several immediately reach for cell phones and begin typing furiously. There was definitely a downside to small-town living. Connie. He said, and saw her shake out of a shocked stupor dot. She turned to him with wide eyes. What just happened? Why don't you see if you can gather the staff for a minute? He waited for everyone to finish up with their current patients and gathered them in the front office, making sure the window to the waiting room was closed. Trish was just arrested for embezzlement. She has been stealing from this clinic for about five years, as far as I can tell. The nurses turned to each other and began to whisper. Garrett held up his hand. I'm sure this is unexpected and inconvenient, but to do what is best for the clinic, we need the best team possible. I feel like I've failed you guys. It took me far longer to find this theft than it should have. I wasn't, he tried to find the words. I wasn't focused on this job like I should have been. Becky, the nurse practitioner, spoke up. Dr. Pike, it's not your fault. The others nodded and vocalized their agreement. I appreciate that, Becky. Some of my distractions were unavoidable. Others should have been. Avoided, that is. Mandy's face came to mind. Either way, there is another piece of big news. I've accepted a job as the assistant director of medicine at University Hospital in Indianapolis. I'm working on getting arrangements made for housing and childcare and then, I'll be out of your hair. Things will go back to normal here. Minus one front desk clerk. Dr. Miller has already agreed to take over as interim director again after I leave. For now, let's get back to work and take great care of the rest of our patients for the day. I don't have any appointments, so I'll work the front desk. They all filed out and Connie grabbed his arm gently. I don't understand why you are leaving. This clinic needs you, Dr. Pike. Can't you see that? Thanks, Connie. But I should have done better here. I've got a chance to do better in Indianapolis. With fewer distractions and more patients. More interesting patients, you mean? He hadn't realized he'd let his desire for more interesting cases show, but here she was calling him out on it. You've done more for this clinic in six months than anyone expected. Except you. And you leaving doesn't do anyone any good. Except you. He couldn't help but defend himself. Look, I'm tired of treating preventable conditions in people who should quit smoking and eat a flipping salad every once in a while. I'm tired of telling people to lose weight and exercise and swap their soda with water. I can do real good at the hospital in Indianapolis. I can help people treat diseases and conditions that are true medical mysteries. I'm sure you could. But you could also do more here. She wouldn't let it drop. Instead of bemoaning the obesity and the lack of exercise, why don't you take this little clinic and make it a beacon of healthy living in Greencastle? Host a 5K, sponsor smoking cessation, and teach people how to eat healthy foods. Quit complaining about it and make a difference. Right here in Greencastle. Now, Connie was really fired up and she poked an unmanicured finger into the meaty flesh below his shoulder. That little girl of yours deserves the kind of life you can give her, right here. The work hours should be shorter, regardless of what you've been trying to tell yourself while working until midnight. There is more to life than climbing ladders and traffic jams. She leaned back and smoothed her scrubs. Considering it took us a year to fill your position the last time, 
I'm pretty sure this job will still be waiting for you when you figure it out. But don't wait too long. Chapter 22 Mandy was a wreck. She let herself fall back into her lonely, depressing ways, individual frozen dinners, filling her schedule with events and friends, despite zero interest or excitement about them. She knew she was impatient with the kids at daycare, no longer finding the joy and amusement at their antics. Instead, she found herself issuing far too many timeouts and counting down the minutes to the end of the day. The hardest thing was Adelaide. As though desperate to spend as much time as possible with Mandy, Addie started skipping naps. Instead, she spent nap time cuddled against Mandy on the couch. Any other kid, any other time and Mandy would have put her foot down. But she couldn't, knowing her time with Addie was limited. She went to the bistro and tried to talk with Chrissy. Her friend of so many years didn't even pick up on the fact that Mandy was in a bad mood. She rattled on about the restaurant and the wedding plans. It just irritated Mandy further. How had she gotten to the point where her friends only confided in her and never expected the reverse? When had she become the person that helped, listened, and supported without ever receiving the same in return? She loved Chrissy and normally, her bubbly positive energy would brighten Mandy's day considerably. Instead, she was just filled with an ugly envy of all the things Chrissy now had. It took 15 years for Chrissy and Todd to go from friends to engaged, and Mandy tried her hardest not to be bitter that her friend was blessed with a perfect match. Todd came to the bistro for dinner while Mandy was there, sawdust sticking to the denim of his jeans and a tool belt still hung around his hips. He embraced Chrissy and Mandy had to look away. Chrissy looked at him with unrestrained joy and adoration. Was that how she looked at Garrett? She kept trying to understand what went wrong, why he couldn't stay with her. She didn't feel lonely when he was around. She didn't feel like every moment of every day needed to be scheduled in 15-minute increments. Instead, she had grown to just let them be together. She even found she could spend time alone, knowing he was only a text message away. In some ways, it reminded her of how she felt with Ryan. Without Ryan, she felt incomplete, unworthy, and unloved. Now, without Garrett, she felt abandoned, hopeless, and discouraged. She allowed herself to make the exact same mistake. Only this time, instead of being wrapped up in the wrong kind of guy, she was wrapped up in the right one. But it still wasn't healthy. Since Garrett called things off, she was starting to realize that. Ruth told her as much. As much as Mandy dreaded it, she had her monthly mentoring meeting with Ruth. It was something they agreed never to cancel unless there was an emergency, as in, someone was dying. Mandy was tempted to cancel it anyway, but she knew it would only bring Ruth to her door within the hour. Upon hearing about the breakup, Ruth told her a story, one she hadn't heard before. When I was married to Peter, we weren't great Christians. Sure, we went to church since that was what people did. But while Peter was off at work, and I was home with Rachel, I ended up at the women's Bible study. Ruth closed her eyes and gave a slight smile. I met Lavon and I started to read my Bible. Really read it. And something amazing started to happen, something I never thought would. She talked more quickly now, leaning forward and grasping Mandy's hands. I started to fall in love with another man. Peter could see it. Sometimes it drove him crazy. She laughed. He could never live up to the standards of the other man in my life. Ruth paused and shook her head. She placed a hand on her heart. I fell in love with Jesus, Mandy. I loved him more than the father of my child. I still do. Even though I am falling in love with Norman more every day, and even though someday I hope to have grandkids I can dote on, I'll love Jesus more. Ruth leaned back and Mandy didn't know what to say. Until that happens for you, until you love Jesus more than the idea of a husband or a child, you will still feel lonely. That's the truth, coming from someone who knows. I felt alone at times with Peter. I loved him and he gave me Rachel. Her eyes filled with tears. 
I will always hold him close in my heart. But he was just a man. And friends, men, and even family will disappoint you, leave you, or break your heart. The only one who never will is Jesus, honey. Like he says in Corinthians, his grace is sufficient for you. As it often was, Ruth's conversation was sprinkled with the scripture she memorized over the years. Talking with Ruth was like talking to Jesus. The older woman was so close to her Savior it made Mandy ache for that kind of relationship. She had such a peace about her. She seemed unshakable in her faith. Mandy envied the certainty with which Ruth spoke about her salvation and how she came to fall in love with Jesus. At the same time, it sounded crazy. In love with Jesus? More than with your husband? Mandy relied on Jesus after Rebecca died. She studied the Bible, knew all the right answers. She journaled and listened to sermons and podcasts. But in the back of her head, she knew she never really trusted she would be happy without something more. If Rebecca was the only child she ever gave birth to, could she find joy? She didn't want to be the beacon of godly singleness Ruth encouraged her to be. If it was her call to be single, wouldn't God give her a peace about it? Instead, why had he given her this longing for connection? It just seemed almost cruel. Ruth, I don't have the gift of singleness like you did. Mandy often prayed she could be content in her singleness like Ruth was. But she was afraid it would take 30 years to get there. 30 long years of being alone. Ah, child. Being single wasn't easy for me. I wasn't magically okay with being alone. But while you are single, it is a gift from God. Just like if you marry someday, that will be a gift too. Mandy resisted the idea that this season of life was a gift. She'd tried. She filled it with volunteering and Bible study and deep friendships, trying to take advantage of the things Paul talked about. She'd read that portion of Corinthians more times than she could count. If this was a gift, she wanted the receipt so she could send it back. If only Rebecca was still alive. If only she was born the perfect tiny pink bundle Mandy dreamt about, instead of a sleeping angel with a broken body. It still hurt, after all this time. She had been so close. Even though it wouldn't have been a perfect family, single mother, fractured relationship with the father, it would have been something. Something more than this, nothingness. Chapter 23 Mandy drove out to Bloom's farm, hoping to catch Daisy. She hadn't called or texted, afraid her friend would tell her not to come. She pulled up to the main house and noticed new shutters on the windows and the front door was now a shade of cheery yellow. Daisy had been busy. She knocked on the front door and listened but heard nothing from inside. Disappointed, she began walking. She headed back up the road toward Bloom Barn, the old wooden barn that was restored and polished to a perfect rustic chic wedding venue. She found the door unlocked and wandered in. Last time Mandy talked to Chrissy, she'd gushed about the barn and this fall. Chrissy and Todd would dance as husband and wife under these huge wooden timbers and iron chandeliers. Gauzy white fabric hung from ceiling to floor, wrapped around the columns supporting the structure. Classic white tables and white wooden folding chairs were already set up in half of the space, leaving the other half open for what Mandy assumed would be a dance floor. Mandy? Is that you? The voice came from above her, and Mandy craned her neck to find it. She finally located it in what appeared to be the old hayloft. Lily? Yeah, it's me. Lily's voice was flat. Sad somehow. Maybe they could be sad together. Dot. What are you doing up there? Just thinking. Want to join me? Mandy couldn't even figure out how she was supposed to get up there. There were no stairs in sight. Do. Um, sure. How? Along the back wall, about four feet from the west corner. Mandy finally spotted the narrow ladder in the dim light. When she made it to the top of the ladder and flopped onto the wooden boards acting as a floor, she panted. I have got to start working out. 
Lily laughed and held out a hand to help her up. They picked their way around boxes. Mandy spotted a painted trellis and several large barrels. Come on. Have a seat. I've got a bottle of Poppy's newest creation. She held up an unlabeled bottle of wine and a Dixie cup. Lily sat on an overturned wooden crate with flowy script on the side. Mandy couldn't quite make out the saying. Probably something wedding why a true love, or forever. She sighed. Wine sounds good. But Poppy made it. Yep. She planted a bunch of grape vines on 30 acres a couple years ago. Guess this was her first experiment. Mandy sniffed it. It smelled like wine, so that was a good sign. Sipped it. Hmm. It's terrible. I know. But it's all I brought up here, and I needed a drink. What's got you needing a drink? Maybe Mandy could distract herself from her own problems by focusing on someone else's. What else, it's Joe Dash, she interrupted herself and quickly restarted. It's nothing. Just work stuff. What brings you out here? Daisy went to Chicago for the weekend. Something about tile being out of stock except in some specialty store up there. Mandy sighed, disappointed Lily wouldn't share more to give her the reprieve she needed. Men are stupid. Lily barked a laugh. Ha! <laughs> well, yeah, but which one in particular? I've been seeing this doctor, Mandy watched Lily's eyebrows raise with surprise and approval. He's great. He's the guardian for his niece, and she's been coming to the daycare. It seemed like everything was going great. We make a good team. But he's being completely stubborn and taking this job in Indianapolis. Lily considered the new information. So, go with him. Mandy hung her head. That's the thing. I totally would, even though I haven't considered leaving Minden for good since I came back from college. But he doesn't want me to. Why doesn't he want me, Lily? What is it about me that makes having a relationship impossible? Why doesn't God want me to be happy? Lily laughed and Mandy stiffened. Mandy, you know that's not true. It's not that God doesn't want you to be happy. They sat in the silence of the large barn for a moment and then Lily spoke, the biting tone of her voice conflicting with the words she spoke. Maybe he just wants you to be content with him and nothing else. Mandy watched as Lily closed her eyes. We're quite a pair, aren't we? I'm 35 years old and God is teaching me the same lesson. Mandy, I've been chasing the dream of running this event center for 10 years. When we started, we couldn't book more than two events each summer. Now, we've got a waiting list a year and a half long for weddings, and more events through the week than I can keep track of. I'd do anything for this place. If God takes it away. She trailed off, the implication was obvious. I thought I had everything I ever wanted when I found out I was pregnant with Rebecca. Then pieces of that dream started to chip away. First, Ryan wasn't the Prince Charming I'd always imagined. Then, Rebecca's diagnosis. It was like I saw a glimpse of my perfect life and then it was ripped out of my hands. Mandy fought the burning in the back of her throat. It took me years to recover from that, and I never even experienced it. How long will it take for me to let go of Garrett and Adelaide, after I know exactly what it feels like to be their family? Lily just shook her head. I don't know, Mandy. But I do know you'll get over it. Mandy tried to believe her, but she closed her eyes and the tears she was holding back spilled over. I'm so angry with God. I'm so angry with Garrett. Lily sighed. I don't blame you. And neither does God. He can handle you being angry with him, you know. Have you told him? Who? Garrett. No. God. I'm kind of not on speaking terms with him right now, Mandy admitted. Dot. Been there. It never works out for me. I think he's better at the silent treatment. Lily tipped up her Dixie cup and took another drink of the wine. Dot. 
Mandy laughed despite the tears. Probably. The conversation faded and the pair continued to sit and sip, Mandy's sniffles periodically interrupting the peaceful silence, until those, too, ceased. After a few moments, Mandy spoke up. Do you think you'll ever get married? She was curious. Lily was four years older than Mandy, and the thought of being single in another four years terrified her. I thought I would, once upon a time. But now? I doubt it. I was close once, you know. Mandy didn't bother to hide her shock. Really? With who? Mandy was always closer to Daisy and Andy, but her memories of Lily never included a boyfriend. It doesn't really matter now. It didn't work out and I think that was it for me. She took another drink. My one chance at true love. Well that's a little melodramatic, don't you think? You're one to talk. Haven't you been crying because Dr. Dreamboat is leaving and you'll never be happy? Touché. Mandy winced. Yeah, I guess you're right. It's just harder to believe when it is your own life, I guess. Honestly, I'll be okay if I never get married. I've got my job and my friends. My sisters. Jesus. Lily looked at her and raised an eyebrow. Can you be happy, Mandy? Mandy studied the design on the Dixie cup. She spent the years since Rebecca died trying to find her match. She'd tried online dating. Blind dates with friends of friends. She even drove to singles groups at bigger churches in Terre Haute. Everyone kept telling her it was because she was shy and quiet and that once someone got to know her, they wouldn't be able to resist. That was a lie, though, wasn't it? Garrett knew her. And he left. And then, just like after Rebecca died, she was alone. Honestly? I'm not sure, yet. Chapter 24 Mandy went home that night and took Lily's advice. She gave up her stubborn refusal to talk with God and instead, she closed the closet door and sat in the dark and cried. She had cried since Garrett left while watching Food Network reruns and eating ice cream from the container with an extra big spoon. This was different. In the darkness, it was only her and God. For a while, she couldn't talk or even think because she was crying too hard and the only thought that came to mind were short bursts of desperation. Why did you make him leave, God? Why do I have to be alone? I'll never be happy, God. Dot. God, you took Rebecca. I wish I could hate you. Lily's words reassured her. He can handle you being angry with him. Well, that was good. Because she was angry and hurt and worse, she was sad. She hated being sad. She hated that she became this self-pitying pile of tissues huddled in the closet. I don't understand, God. I was happy. Garrett was happy, wasn't he? Why do you always take the things away from me that bring me joy? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Dot. Screw that. I've been strong. I lost a child, for crying out loud. Why do I have to lose another one? She thought of sweet Adelaide, who lost so much and could still see the silver lining and find joy in the smallest things. Was she okay, in Indianapolis? You were strong. Mandy recalled the months after Rebecca's diagnosis and after her death. Mandy hadn't been strong. She relied fully and totally on God's strength to see her through that time. Okay, maybe I wasn't that strong. But how am I supposed to go through this again? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Dot. Stop saying that. Dot. My grace is sufficient for you. Dot. No, it's not. I need more. I need a husband. Dot. My grace is sufficient. Dot. No, it's not. Mandy jumped at the sound of her own voice. I am jealous for you. Dot. Mandy laughed cynically at the response she felt more than heard. What do you mean you are jealous for me? You have me. 
I do nothing but serve and volunteer and go to Bible study. What more do you want from me? I want your heart. Why would you want my heart? It's broken. No one else wants it. Garrett doesn't want it. Give me your heart, child. And I will heal it. Dot. What if it can't be healed? Exhausted, she pulled an old sweater off the hanger and wrapped it around herself, several other pieces of clothing falling off on top of her, burying her in the scent of her laundry detergent. She tucked a stray shirt under her head and laid in the quiet, afraid to say more. Could God honestly be enough? Could he heal the hurting heart Garrett left behind? That Rebecca's death left behind all those years ago, if she was being truly honest. The truth was she relied on God, filled her schedule with activities devoted to him, and yet, she'd held back her heart. She was tired of hurting, tired of longing for something to make her life complete. I have come that you might have life more abundantly. She considered the verse. She wasn't living as though she had an abundant life. She'd been constantly focused on what was missing. Kids. A husband but she thought about her life before Christ. Even in the months where she had all those things, Ryan was ready to propose and she his child was growing inside her. But she wasn't happy. She was anxious something would set Ryan off. She was afraid to be alone because she was so afraid of the ashamed thoughts haunting the silence. She continued to search for something deep down in the pit of her soul. Parties, sex, even a relationship and a baby hadn't filled it. Why had she thought it would fill it this time? She thought about her time with Garrett. She'd been busy, happy even when they were together. But when she was alone, she was analyzing her words, her behavior. She was terrified she would do something to upset Garrett and make him leave. She'd been diligent in making sure she was doing everything she could to make him and Addie dependent on her, spending her spare time making sure the birthday party was perfect and dinner was ready for the evening so she could invite him to stay as often as possible. There was no rest in that. She couldn't remember the last time she felt truly at rest. She'd gone from filling every moment with volunteering and activities to keep herself busy to filling every moment either spending time with Garrett and Addie or making sure she was the perfect woman to keep him around. And even that hadn't worked in the end. She fell asleep huddled on the closet floor and woke a few hours later with bleary eyes and a headache. Blinking the haze away, she studied the bulletin board she'd hung in here years ago. She'd been determined to make this closet her secret prayer room after watching a popular Christian movie about prayer. Everything was ready for her, little note cards and pushpins, a few Bible verses already printed out and hung near the floor. She grabbed a note card and the pen and wrote neatly, Help me fall in love with you. She pushed a red pushpin firmly through the top of the note card and into the bulletin board. Then, she prayed. Mandy spent more time in her closet that month than she had since she was an insecure teenager overanalyzing every outfit she put on. When Jessica stopped by to ask Mandy about taking on regular role as a volunteer coordinator, Mandy looked her in the eye and turned down the position. It was the first time Mandy said no for the simple reason of not feeling like it. It was too big of a commitment and Mandy didn't feel like it was where she was supposed to spend her Sunday mornings. Before, she would only turn down a commitment if it specifically conflicted with something else and with much apologizing and attempts to make it up to the person by helping at another time. Despite the temptation to tell Jessica she would do something else instead, she resisted the urge and just left it at, I'm not interested, but thanks for thinking of me. Her bulletin board became filled with note cards. The mission and community of little steps. Todd and Chrissy's engagement and marriage. A contentedness with her singleness. She even added Ryan to the list when God was leading her to scriptures about loving those who wronged you. Something amazing happened as she spent more time on her knees in that closet and more time, with her nose in her Bible instead of turning on the TV. She began to understand what Ruth said. It was possible to want something more and still be 100% content with what God had given her. 
It seemed backwards to admit that she was okay with being single but still wanted a husband. There was a peace about praying to God with expectation and yet, with an open hand of surrender. For one whole week, she cleared every commitment from her calendar. She didn't go to Bible study, she didn't help Chrissy at the bistro. She didn't prepare the supplies for Sunday school or fill a shift at the food pantry. She didn't attend the middle school youth group or take a meal to the family who experienced the death of a grandparent. It was like she was fasting from a schedule. Other than daycare, she had nothing. The strangest part was she didn't feel lonely. When she returned to Bible study, she discovered more magic in the words. This closeness with God was like when she'd been broken after Rebecca's death. But it was also deeper, it was more. It was a slow burn, like she'd been growing roots wide and deep for years but was finally bearing fruit. There was a maturity to her healing that was absent ten years ago. When she lost Rebecca, she prayed for God to help her survive. This time, she was asking him to help her thrive. Mother's Day was always hard for Mandy. She'd learned to avoid church on that Sunday. There was nothing worse than sitting in the pew and hearing the pastor go on and on about the wonderful traits and sacrifices of mothers, or the funny video of kids answering questions about their mom. What do you love about your mommy? She makes the best cookies. She reads me stories. Um, I love her phone. Cue laughter from the seats. She hated Mother's Day. Especially this year. Despite her recent contentedness, it was just one giant reminder of what she'd lost. What she would never have. It was okay, it truly was. But she still didn't appreciate being hit upside the head with it. Why did churches celebrate Mother's Day anyway? Wasn't it just a commercial holiday, manufactured by the greeting card companies trying to make a buck off the guilty conscience of kids who lived far away and husbands, who didn't appreciate their wife enough the rest of the year? Instead, she spent the morning at home, in what was quickly becoming her favorite place in the house, the closet. She listened to an old sermon of a pastor she respected and journaled about how it felt to be a mother without a child. She knew she'd been given the gift of a maternal nature. She was still struggling with the reality that she was intended to use it to bless the families and children of her daycare instead of for kids of her own. It was her least favorite holiday, but like every good kid, she sent her mom flowers. She was also going to be at family dinner that night. Her mom loved Mother's Day. She basked in the glory of a day where she was meant to be the center of attention. She felt the same way about her birthday, often turning it into a week-long celebration. Sometimes Mandy wondered if her mother ever considered how hard Mother's Day would be for Mandy, having lost a baby. She never mentioned it. It would take the focus off her mom and bring a somber note to a day her mom found such joy in. So, she pasted on a smile and sat at dinner, preparing her list for when they would go around the table and say all the things about their mother they were thankful for. That was a little tradition her mom created about five years ago, received each year by many eye rolls and groans from Josh and Mandy. Her mom clapped her hands, much like the toddlers did at daycare when they were excited. Okay, my dears. It's time for our favorite part of the evening. You mean, your favorite part of the evening, Josh said. Yes, well. That may be true, but don't tell me you don't like it, too. Josh can go first. Her dad had a mischievous grin on his face and Mandy wondered what he had up his sleeve. Josh sighed. Okay, okay. I love that mom always has time to talk with me when I need her. Her mom tipped her head and her face softened. Of course I do, sweetheart. Okay, you next, Amanda. Mandy flipped through her mental list. Um. I'm love that you are so positive and optimistic. And I'm thankful that you are a good cook. Most of the time. And we solemnly swear never to mention the recipes that don't work out. Her dad raised his hand as though taking an oath of office. Her mom ignored him and said thank you, Amanda. James. 
I am extremely thankful that my wife is, my wife. They all groaned. Josh spoke up, that totally doesn't count, dad. Okay, I love that you don't look like a monster without your makeup on. Wow, dad. Super romantic. Mandy let the sarcasm drip from her words. He finally gave a serious answer and dinner continued. After they finished, Mandy was washing dishes, by hand, because her parents apparently lived in the 50s and didn't have a dishwasher. Her dad joined her in the kitchen and laid a hand on her shoulder. You doing okay, banana? She rubbed his hand with her cheek, nuzzling it like a cat against the leg of an armchair. She soaked in the contact for a moment. She lifted her head and let out a sigh. I'm okay. It's just... Mother's Day and all. Is that all it is? Her dad was too discerning. No. I miss them, dad. I'm trying to trust God in this, but it's hard. I know. Come here. Then, he wrapped her in a hug. Ignoring her wet and soapy hands, she hugged him back and let out a sob into his shoulder. After a moment, he released her and she turned to grab a dish towel to dry her hands and cheeks. It's going to be okay, banana. She turned back to the dishes and took another shuddering breath. She said a quick prayer for peace. A sensation of coolness swept through her body, replacing the heat of the quick crying session. She looked toward the sky out the kitchen window and gave a smile. It really was going to be okay. Chapter 25 It had been two weeks since he moved to Indianapolis. Adelaide cried inconsolably the day they left. He wrestled her into the car seat as she tried to escape. He knew it wouldn't be easy, but he kept telling himself it was for the better. Without the distraction of Mandy, he could focus on his career and on Adelaide. He was unpacking boxes, and lightly sorting through the pile of boxes that were delivered. Most of the furniture from his brother's house was still in a storage unit in Fort Wayne, but personal belongings and paperwork were packed up and sent to their apartment in the city. The box caught his eye first, labeled, Important Documents. He opened it and on top there was a plain white envelope with his name scrawled across it in familiar writing. He sank onto a nearby box and opened the letter in disbelief. Garrett, I don't even know why I'm writing this. I guess Elizabeth has been getting in my head. We updated our will the other day, wrote your name in the blank saying we want you to take care of Adelaide. I hope you never read this letter, because that would mean I'm not around, and neither is Elizabeth. It should come as no surprise to you that I love Elizabeth and Addie more than anything in the world. It might surprise you though, that I almost wrote a different name on that paperwork. I've watched you devote your life to your studies and your job. Since elementary school, you've been the smart one. The driven one but you've also been the lonely one. You might think you have everything you need, now that the letters MD rest firmly behind your name. Trust me when I say it isn't true. To build a real life, you need family. You might not believe that, I know you never have before. Maybe me being gone taught you something. But we almost didn't leave Adelaide with you, because we don't want her to grow up with just you, ambitious Dr. Garrett who would sacrifice nearly everything for his career, for family. She needs more than that. She needs a real family. Believe it or not, so do you. Do me a favor, brother. Don't give up the important things, family, faith, friends, for the things that aren't. Work. Accolades. Money. In fifty years, you won't look back and wish you'd spent more time at the office. Just trust me. I never told you Elizabeth almost left me a few years ago. When Addie was just a baby. Man, I felt so far out of my league at home. So, I threw myself into work. I booked out of town trips, I worked long hours. And Liz? She rightfully didn't want to take it. But the threat of losing her and Addie forever was something I hadn't considered. That wake up call was the best thing that ever happened to me. I took a step back at work and it is a decision I will never regret. 
Make decisions you won't regret, Garrett. Especially now that you have Adelaide. This is your wake-up call. Don't miss it. I love you, brother. Take care of my ladybug. Michael P.S. If you ever manage to find a wife, make sure you make time to take her on dates. Liz is constantly reminding me I am a husband first and a father second. It will be the same for you. Even if you technically become a father first. Dot. Garrett tried to rub away the burning sensation behind his eyes as he reread the letter again. And a third time. As he did, he kept seeing Adelaide's face. And Mandy's. Asterisk 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 Garrett spent the next two weeks in Indianapolis, still determined to make it work. He dragged Addie to a new church each Sunday, trying to find one that felt right. But all he felt was the absence of Mandy beside him in the pew, wishing he could reach across the space and grab her fingers with his, or wrap his arm around her. God, what do I do? He got no answer, though. He knew he hadn't been as close to God as he should have been in the past few years, but he thought now was not the best time for silence from his Creator. Every day, in between emails and meetings with the doctors now under his administration. Have a made a huge mistake, Father. Where your treasure is, so your heart is also. Dot. Garrett struggled with the verse God brought to him. He wanted his heart to be on God. He wanted his heart to be with Addy. With Mandy. But his treasure. That was his career. He realized he couldn't be a good father, his treasure was his work instead of his faith and his family. Michael figured that out. It just took Garrett a little longer, apparently. Thank you, God. Help me do better. Show me how to undo this dot. Garrett knew he'd messed up. What he didn't know was how he would fix it. He wasn't sure Mandy would forgive him. She'd lost so much, had so much taken from her. Could he really blame her if she was upset he'd left? So far, he had exactly zero ideas. He went to pick Adelaide up from the daycare he'd placed her in close to the hospital in Indianapolis. Hey, Ladybug. What did you do today? We talked about Father's Day. We made presents. Can we give it to my daddy? His heart broke, like it always did when Adelaide talked about her parents. We can sure send it to him, okay? He would figure something out. What happened if the post office got mail addressed to heaven? They managed to sort through mail for Santa, so he figured it wouldn't bring down the post office or anything. They could send something to heaven for Father's Day. Apparently, Mother's Day had gotten lost in the shuffle of moving. Dot. Mother's Day. In his mind, Mandy was a mother and should have been celebrated on Mother's Day. Anyone who carried a child, whether it was for 12 weeks or 40 weeks, was a mother. Regardless if the baby lived to be 50 or never saw the outside of the womb. It was still a child, and Mandy was still a mother. Plus, he was now hoping she would take on that role for Adelaide with him beside her. Mother's Day would have been the perfect chance to show Mandy he was serious about making changes. He missed it, though. Then, he remembered with a grin, her birthday was this week. Maybe he could redeem himself on her birthday. Now he felt like he truly had his priorities in order, he never wanted her to feel like she was second to his career or to Addie. He wanted to take her on a real date. Just the two of them. He couldn't believe they were together for three months and had never gone on a date. Every time they were together involved an animated movie or Adelaide sleeping on the couch across the room. Mandy deserved better. If he tried hard, every day for the rest of his life, he was pretty sure he could give it to her. He wanted to be the one to give it to her. Now, he needed to get Adelaide on board. He was sure that wouldn't be a problem. Mandy told him once she didn't date daycare dads. He hoped that was still true. Technically, she hadn't even dated him. But he was desperately praying she would marry him. By mid-June, Mandy was convinced she would never see Garrett and Adelaide again. They'd been gone over a month and she hadn't heard anything. 
she prayed Adelaide found a good teacher and friends. Tonight was family dinner at her parents' house. This time, they were celebrating her birthday and Father's Day. Her mom insisted they would do the thankful game for her dad as well, which he hated and loved at the same time. After they all expressed their appreciation of his humor and support, her mom excitedly announced it was time to do one for Mandy, since it was her birthday. Josh piped up, we don't do it for birthdays, mom. Hush. Now, what are you thankful for? Josh rolled his eyes and grumbled. Didn't do this for my birthday in February. But, no, Mandy is special. It's fine, mom. We really don't have to do this. Her mom put on her mom face and gave Josh a glare. We are doing this. Now, Josh, tell us what you love about Amanda. Josh sighed. Fine. Okay. Mandy, you are the most genuine person I know. I never have to wonder if you really care, because it is completely obvious you love with your whole heart. Mandy smiled and leaned over in her seat to give him a side hug. I do love you, Bubba. Josh grunted and waved a hand toward her dad. Your turn. Amanda Banana, you are the strongest person I know. I'm so proud of the woman you've become. It hasn't been an easy road, but the best ones never are. Mandy was fighting tears. Her dad was never this sappy. Thanks, dad. Her mom looked over Mandy's shoulder to something behind her and then said, Garrett, how about you? Mandy whipped around, sure she was imagining things. But there he was, standing in the entrance to the dining room, holding a bouquet of daffodils. Adelaide was tucked behind one leg. Amanda, I'm so thankful I caught you lurking around my clinic. I'm grateful you have a servant's heart and are willing to help a poor guy who is in way over his head. I'm thankful having a baby so young turned you into the person you are today. Experiencing that heartbreak meant you were able to connect with me and Addie after we lost my brother and his wife. I'm so thankful I can call you my friend. There was that stupid word again. She didn't want to be anyone's friend. Though. Adelaide, how about you? What do you love about Miss Mandy? Adelaide stepped out and spoke in a sweet, quiet voice. I love that you play with me and that you cook for me. Mandy felt the tears come at the little girl's profession. She held open her arms and Addie ran and jumped onto her lap. Mandy held her tight and tucked her face into Adelaide's hair. I missed you so much, she whispered, almost to herself. Dot. Can we talk for a minute? Sharon jumped into action. Adelaide, would you like some dessert? I think I've got some ice cream to go with the pie. Easily distracted, Adelaide slid down out of Mandy's lap and bounded over to Sharon, who led her into the kitchen. Mandy stood slowly, still unsure. She led him into the living room and turned to him with her arms crossed, hugging herself. What are you doing here? Garrett crossed the room toward her and she stepped back. I deserve that. I know I hurt you, and I'm so sorry. Michael talked some sense into me. Mandy raised an eyebrow. I'll tell you about it later, but the important thing is I know I made a mistake. I never should have left. You and Adelaide? You are the most important thing. The job in Indianapolis is just a job. I should have known I would still work way too many hours. I took it when I had the chance because I was so afraid I wasn't good enough and I needed to prove I was. I felt like I failed the clinic because I wasn't working enough. But now, I don't even have someone to give me disapproving looks and remind me to put my phone down. And I miss you, Amanda. Even without the fact that I don't think I can raise Adelaide without you, I don't think I can be me without you. I don't think I want to be. Mandy shook her head. This was too much. She just stopped yelling at God and started falling in love with Jesus during her quiet times. She finally came to terms with the reality of a life of singleness. And now Garrett shows up. She wanted to run into his arms, to forgive him and start their life together. 
She was worried that she would lose herself in him again, like she did with Ryan. She took a step toward him. There's someone else. Garrett stepped toward her, a smile on his face. It fell and he faltered. Standing motionless, his voice broke when he asked, What? There is someone else. Of course there is. He rubbed a hand down his face. You're amazing and some other guy wasn't a complete idiot like I am. But still, a month? Never mind, it doesn't matter. I'll just grab Adelaide and we'll get out of here. Garrett, wait. I don't want you to leave. I just want you to know that since you said you were leaving, I've been spending a lot of time with someone else. And he is my number one priority. Whether I'm in a relationship or not. Garrett stared at her. It's fine. I'm too late. I understand. He turned to go. Garrett, stop. His footsteps stopped, his back still toward her. Mandy took a deep breath. She had to do this. She wanted Garrett back in her life, but she wanted God more. As long as Garrett knew Jesus came first, this could work. This needed to work. I'm talking about God, Garrett. You have to know that no matter what happens, I need God way more than I thought I needed you and Addie. She was only a step away from him now, studying the space between his shoulder blades as he turned. What are you saying? I'm saying I want it all. I want you. As long as you know you don't come first. He reached out and crushed her in a hug, kissing the top of her head. I can definitely live with that. As long as I don't have to live without you. Then, he dropped his arms and dropped to a knee. Amanda Elliot. You were a mystery when I saw you lurking around my clinic late at night. You were a friend when I needed one most. You became a mother the moment Rebecca started to grow inside you. You've taught me more about the unconditional love of Christ than I could learn in a thousand Sunday school classes. Will you let me spend the rest of my life trying to unravel the mystery of you? Being the friend you've been to me? Will you be Adelaide's mother, in addition to Rebecca's? Will you let me love you like Christ loves the church? I can't imagine not loving you. Will you be my wife? Mandy dropped to her knees on the carpet in front of him, her hands clasped over her mouth. She thought her heart might burst it was so full. This time, she had everything she ever wanted, and for the first time, she felt like God had written the story. Unable to speak, she nodded furiously and then lunged into his arms, knocking him backward. As they lay there laughing, she felt Adelaide's small frame jump on top of her dot. You said yes? She said yes, Unca Garrett. I said yes, Ladybug. Epilogue When Lily called and told Mandy there was a cancellation at Bloom Barn for August, Mandy leapt at the chance to be married so quickly. There was no way she wanted to wait an entire year to be married after waiting for so many years to find love. It was a warm, sunny August Saturday when she and Garrett stood in the front of the small Minden church. Adelaide wore a soft white dress and a lace headband woven with real flowers. Mandy was sure she was the most adorable flower girl Minden had ever seen. Mandy peeked through the door as Addie scattered rose petals down the aisle and joined her uncle at the front of the church. The door opened, revealing Mandy to the crowd in the dress she always dreamed of. It had a full gown, reminiscent of the princesses in the fairy tales she loved so much, and a sweetheart neckline. She held a bouquet of white oriental lilies, roses, and hydrangeas. Tucked into the bouquet was a small, white Bible from her mother Dot. Mandy's eyes locked on Garrett's from across the church. It never ceased to amaze her that he was going to be her husband. His hands were clasped in front of him and she saw the wide smile spread across his face as she came into view. She saw Adelaide look up at Garrett and tug on his pant leg for attention. Then she heard the small voice echo across the room, Unca Garrett. She's a real-life princess. The crowd murmured their laughter at the young girl and Mandy let out a laugh as the first tear slipped out. 
Mandy's dad walked her slowly down the aisle, he kissed her cheek and said, I'm happy for you, banana. She nodded and choked out, thanks, daddy. I love you. After a short message by Pastor Justin, Mandy heard the words she dreamed about for so many years. Do you, Amanda Louise Elliott, take this man to be your husband? They exchanged vows and Adelaide cheered loudly when they kissed, causing the rest of the church to laugh and cheer as well. Mandy asked Daisy to be her maid of honor and she gave a short humorous speech, bemoaning the fact she hadn't even met Garrett before he'd proposed to her best friend. When it was Josh's turn to give a speech, he stood at the front of the dance floor. Her brother couldn't take the pictures for this wedding, since he had to be in them as groomsman, but she knew he brought his camera with him anyway. It would seem he couldn't resist the chance to record the memories, the champagne glass looked impossibly tiny in his large hand. My baby sister is the best person I've ever met. If you hurt her, Doc, you'll have to deal with me. The crowd laughed and Garrett raised a glass in acknowledgement of the good-natured threat. Mandy, we've always been a team. We gave our parents more than a few gray hairs. Okay, okay. I know most of them came from me, not you. I'm so glad you found your happily ever after, sis. I remember you making me dress up and play wedding with you when we were kids. Mandy covered her face in embarrassment and the crowd laughed as a picture of them playing dress up flashed up on the screen. You deserve a fairy tale ending. Not all of us do. He trailed off and looked into his glass. After a beat, he started again. But you and Doc? You definitely deserve all the happiness in the world. Congratulations. To Garrett and Amanda. He raised his glass in a toast and took a big gulp before handing the microphone off to the DJ and making a beeline for the doors. Mandy watched him leave, but was soon distracted by the tinkling of silverware against glass. Garrett leaned over and whispered to her. I think they'll stop if we give them what they want. Negotiating with terrorists, Garrett? It sets a bad precedent. She loved teasing him. Over the summer, they only grew closer and more in sync. She thought she should probably be nervous about what would happen after the wedding tonight. Addie was staying with Mandy's parents and she and Garrett booked a room in Indianapolis near the airport. She wasn't nervous, though. Garrett was her missing half. It may have taken ten years longer than she thought it would, but she finally had it all, a husband, a daughter. She thanked God again for his perfect timing. Nah, I'll give in to these demands anytime, anywhere. He proceeded to stand and pull her up so everyone could see them. Then, he pulled her close and gave the crowded room exactly what it was waiting for. Lost in his kiss, Mandy felt the entire world disappear. It was just her and her prince. Finally. And firmly rooted at the foundation of it was her king. This has been Spring Fever by Tara Grace Erickson. Audio copyright 2022 Silver Fountain Press.